and as its junior warden in the region, upset Wellington. Said one editorialist in 1908, as the champion of the white ascendancy in the Pacific, America, therefore, represents the ideals of Australia and New Zealand far better than Britain has hitherto been able to do in this respect for. But the challenge presented by the comparatively tiny Asian population paled when compared to that presented by the Maoris, whose numbers in New Zealand not to mention their martial traditions were considerably more substantial. Moreover, the Maoris were not grateful immigrants escaping the endemic war and famine of China for the bounty of New Zealand. No, some Maoris felt their land had been invaded and wondered whether they would be worse off if they were invaded again this time by fellow non-Europeans from the north. The triumphant British invaders who created New Zealand tried to establish white supremacy in their new homeland. They placed barriers in the path of those not of pure European descent who wished to move there, the 1921 census revealed that there were 671 Indians mostly from the Punjab and a mere 3,266 Chinese, mostly from Canton. Poll taxes were used to keep Asians from voting, such measures were abolished in 1944 under the threat of Japanese-inspired pressure and subversion. Point five. This biased policy was dictated not only by the requisites of empire but also by the interests of local organizers. Point six. These interests help explain why the Chinese were the only racial immigrant minority that suffered the indignities of thumbprinting even when departing the nation. Point seven. Anti-Semitism was also strong and persistent in New Zealand over the years. Point eight. Bias against the indigenous Maoris gave rise to the Ratna movement, said to have begun in New Zealand in 1918. As of 1934, of 74,000 Maoris in the Dominion, 40,000 were adherents. It engaged in faith healing and was grounded in Christianity. Point nine. As early as 1925 a key leader of this movement visited Japan and quickly became a close ally of Tokyo. He had met a Japanese lad who wanted to learn the Maori language, and this had helped spark his interest in Japan. I was invested with a Japanese costume, he said proudly after his return, and also the entire members of my delegation. Ten while there, Ratna, as he was called, was said to have stated that he was officially received in Japan, that he laid the grievances of the Maori race before the government of Japan that the country had agreed to take the Maori race under its protection and would redress these grievances. He claimed to have made a compact on behalf of the Maori race with Japan and dramatically flourished a dagger, which he said was given him by a representative of the Japanese government in token that the pact so made would be carried out even if blood must flow in its enforcement. Some in the empire deemed these words to be grave disloyalty, but the question remained, why should the Maoris owe allegiance to a regime that had been so lacking in loyalty to so many of its subjects? 11. Gradually the New Zealand authorities began to see Ratna's ties to Tokyo as potentially dangerous, though it was hard to disentangle these suspicions from a pre-existing racial bias. In 1926, J.G. Coates, the native minister, referred dismissively to the so-called Ratna Bank, which some thought might have been a conduit for Tokyo Gold. The native minister sniffed offhandedly, personally I do not think that any of the followers of the Ratna movement are capable of successfully running any banking institution 12 others were not so sure. One New Zealander felt that Ratna's ties to Tokyo were sowing the seeds of unrest under cover of spiritual uplift, and sowing the seeds of belief that unlimited marvels of material benefit will accrue through the Japanese connection just as the pro-Japan and all-black U.S. based nation of Islam would be accused of doing subsequently. Point 13. In the same vein Sir James Parr, the Minister of Justice, was informed that Ratna had stated that he had wedded the Maori race to the Japanese. An Auckland solicitor confided that a native client said that Ratna had just brought back with him a young Japanese, and that Ratna had, at his meetings at his settlement, informed the people that as the King of England had refused to assist the Maoris in their claims to their lands under the Treaty of Wait Angi, the Japanese were going to help them to secure their rights by force. To do so, it was said, the Japanese were eventually going to send warships here. Ratna is endeavoring to transfer the allegiance of the Maori race to the Japanese, was the nervous conclusion delivered to the Minister of Native Affairs. Point 14. 
This conclusion was based in part on a growing militancy in the Ratna movement, emboldened by its ties to Tokyo. While traveling aboard a Japanese steamer, Peter Moko of the Ratna movement confessed boldly, I had to slap the face of the American and the New Zealander too after they insulted our girls and our whole party 15 other insults to Maoris, this time by Rhodesians who had extended toward them the treatment they were used to giving the Kafirs indigenous people of South Africa were met with a similar brusqueness, unusual for that time and place. Point 16 just as some US Negroes claim to be Asiatic and related to the Japanese, Ratna suggested that Maoris and Japanese belong to the lost tribes of Israel. Many of the Maori words have a similar pronunciation to those of the Japanese and have the same meaning. Professor Whiteman of Tokyo Sick University informed that he had spent 15 years of research in these matters and had come to the conclusion that the Japanese, Maoris, Filipino Sikh, Hawaiians, Malays and many other races were related. 17 When the Ratna movement refused to share the benefits of faith healing with Pakihas Europeans no benefits for Pakihas was their forceful assertion it was apparent that New Zealand, a far-flung outpost of the empire, would have to make severe adjustments. Point 18. New Zealand's neighbors in the South Pacific also had troubled racial relations. While the US South was in the midst of severe racial violence, Fiji in the 1870s was undergoing similar troubles at the hands of an organization that bore many similarities to the Ku Klux Klan, this almost led to a racist war 19 Fiji's population was a mix of indigenous people, Indians, and Europeans with the latter, of course, at the top of the heap. Point 20 The Indian population, the bulwark of the empire but also the prime source of its weakness, were reluctant to serve during the war not least due to unequal pay compared to those of pure European descent. According to a leading scholar of Fiji, this reluctance angered the Europeans, who deliberately stirred among the indigenous people the fear of Indian domination which has continued to cause instability in Fiji to this day. Point 21. Thus, as the Pacific War approached, London had good reason to think the empire would be threatened, with the aid of those who had been subjected to white supremacy. Nevertheless, the empire proceeded as if the prospect of disloyalty among subjects of the Pacific was unimportant. In the spring of 1941, the War Cabinet stated firmly that Cook Islanders and Samoans could serve with the military provided they were full-blooded whites and up to but not including persons of half-European blood. With typical understatement, it noted that in Western Samoa considerable discontent has been caused by the blood limitation and local-born men of British nationality and European status, but who are of half, or more than half, Polynesian blood, strongly resent their exclusion from the privileges of serving the empire. The war cabinet wondered whether they should be placed in Maori units or would resent it, or whether they should be formed into a separate unit 22. The Japanese Navy was well aware of British fears. They apparently based their plans for war at first quite seriously on gaining the support of the Maoris and agitating them against Great Britain. This was to be achieved with submarine or parachute landings in areas where Maoris were concentrated. 23 Fortunately for New Zealand it did not come to this. But after the war, Wellington quickly moved to ease some of the heavier racial burdens upon the aggrieved, in order to do away with this internal threat to national security. Australia is as large in territory as the United States, but its current population is approximately the size of Southern California's. Large in size and relatively small in population, with a murderous record against the indigenous people, it was a perfect target for Japan. Racism was written into the Defense Act which governed the composition of Australia's forces it specifically excluded full-blooded aborigines from enlistment, while descriptions of the Japanese as baboons, apes and monkeys. Recall white descriptions of aborigines as monkeys in the early days of Australian settlement, said one scholar tellingly. Point 24. The Australian mining magnate W.S. Robinson put his finger on the problem when he declared that Australia and New Zealand have a total population of 9 million whites. Their neighbours are 1 billion of the coloured races only a few hours away by air. Australia and New Zealand are in the uncomfortable position of having most to lose and the greatest chance of losing it. 25. How true. 
but Canberra like Wellington and London and Washington proceeded blithely, as if white supremacy would reign eternally. 26 Canberra was not unaware of the sense of outrage that its policies were creating, particularly in Japan. In the spring of 1919, as world concern was mounting about the victorious Allies' unwillingness to accept racial equality as a principle of the post-war settlement, a British diplomat in Tokyo forwarded a lengthy missive detailing the anger in Nippon. It is difficult to understand what is at the bottom of the sudden ebullition of feeling on this subject, he said, seeming perplexed, how far it is real, how far artificial. Still, he continued, it is practically the one topic of discussion and great dissatisfaction is expressed on all sides at the failure so far of the Japanese delegates at Versailles to obtain the insertion in the covenant of a clause abolishing this discrimination. Warily he observed that in his speech before the Japan Society at New York Viscount E.C.E., the Japanese ambassador is reported to have said that nothing would contribute more to universal peace than the rectification at the peace conference of racial discrimination and that a League of Nations with racial discrimination would be a miserable contradiction, a danger rather than a safeguard. Signaling the importance of what he had noted, he sent a copy of this dispatch to the Governor-General of Australia and to Washington. The British emissary included reflections on a February 1919 meeting of the Japanese Association for the Equality of the Races, that he had attended, a meeting also attended by several hundred delegation of statesmen, scholars, newspaper men, ronin, and other Japanese. A fair representation of intelligent Japanese, in other words. There were 27 Japanese societies and organizations at this lengthy meeting at the Seiyokan Hotel. One speaker spoke for many when he proclaimed, the world does not belong to the European alone. In point of population, Japan and China have more people than all the other nations and until race discrimination is abolished there can be no League of Nations. Lt. General Kojiro Sato noted that unless one goes abroad, one cannot realize how the colored races are treated in America and other foreign countries. He said that he would remind his audience of the history of Hawaii. He told of the intolerance in America toward the colored races. Who has seen Negro men eating in a respectable restaurant in America, he asked. The same thing may be said of the lot of the Hindus. He said that the Japanese are not treated so badly but as elder brothers to those oppressed colored races, Japan cannot keep silence. That was not all. Dr. Soijima, a scholar, said, abolition of race discrimination should be made a condition of Japan in joining the League of Nations. Especially this point should be emphatically impressed upon the minds of Americans. But the United States was not the only target. Mr. Shimada of the Kenseikai noted Germany's attempt at the time of the Sino-Japanese War to oppress Japan, which failed, for Russia and France which were Germany's partners realized their mistake in joining hands with Germany against Japan that broke down the race barrier. Similar forcefulness, it was said, would be needed to tear down other racial barriers. This was a militant meeting, with those assembled criticizing the diplomats for not being sufficiently forceful on these pressing matters of concern. This suggests that Tokyo's decision to make opposition to white supremacy a major element of its policy toward Europe and Euro-America a policy that eventuated in war was not solely generated at the Imperial Palace or the Foreign Ministry. Despite these storm signals in its vicinity, indicating growing cyclonic distress with white supremacy, Australia sailed blindly on its racial course. High-level Australian operatives were well aware of the Black Dragon Society, which began shortly after the Meiji Restoration to work for Japanese world conquest. J. L. Hehir of the Australian military reported that members had taken an oath to sleep only four hours each night as a sign of their vigilance. To eat sparingly. To commit harikiri if commanded. Race was their trump card and they were said to have members in Australia itself. 27. The Empire was aware that Japan was playing the race card in its attempt to undermine London. In late 1937 Reginald Clary informed My Dear Eden, referring to the once and future foreign minister, Anthony Eden of poisonous anti-British documents that Tokyo was circulating. These were not being furtively circulated. On the contrary, 
there were full-page advertisements in one English and five leading vernacular newspapers in Japan, the text of which was also submitted to the U.S. Congress. In forceful words Tokyo assailed Britain for cruelly massacring the indigenes of Australia and New Zealand and selling slaves from Africa. Recall history of British Empire before accusing Japan in current crisis another at advised point 28. Yet, like a hopeless alcoholic who cannot turn down a stiff martini, Canberra could not resist pursuing a policy of white supremacy, which to its mind had served it well over the decades. In 1928 a furor erupted in Australia in the wake of the persecution of visiting American Negro musicians. Five Euro-Australian women were on trial for cavorting naked with these men, 1,000 male voyeurs showed up at court to watch and listen, illustrating the apparently perverse sexual fascination that visiting American Negroes held for Australian women and men. Like night following day, the local press regularly insulted the Negroes during their stay. Point 29 This was followed by a run of attacks on Dagos sick, Greeks, Jews, Chin Amen and Asiatics. In other words, some Australians considered that discrimination against the reviled coloured races was not enough and had to be extended, even to some Europeans. But how could Canberra confront Japan if it were to cut itself off from a good deal of Europe? Such was the logic of racial chauvinism, an illogical policy which found it difficult to know where to draw the line of exclusion. Thus, the leading Australian politician, Billy Hughes, who had been unyielding in his opposition to racial equality at Versailles, snorted, Are we to be subservient to the Dago Italian? We believe in the white Australia policy, and a British white Australia policy at that. 30 With this Hughes dropped the veil, and exposed the reality that white supremacy was a disguise shrouding the supremacy of the British Empire and, like one Russian doll within another, the supremacy of an English elite. But this was a reality not often revealed and those who were not part of the enchanted circle of elites preferred to soak up whatever residual racial privilege they could garner. For example, Winston Churchill asserted baldly that the Australians came of bad stock. After all, it was a country established originally as a convict colony and subsequently settled by large numbers of working-class Irishmen. His feelings were shared widely within Britain's ruling class, if only subconsciously, and they acted to exacerbate the enmity between the two countries. 31. This perception evidently did not prevent W. E. Prentice from enjoying racial privilege. For when this Australian arrived at Port Moresby in Papua New Guinea in the pre-war period, he recalled lovingly that all troops had Papuan native houseboys, one per ten other ranks, one per sergeant and one per officer, who did the troops washing and ironing plus messboys and cooks assistants. Furthermore, almost all troops had a compulsory siesta from 12.30 p.m. to 12.30 p.m. This was an extension of the British Raj, for troops on tropical service. 32 How could such military luxury prepare the empire for combat with the battle-hardened Japanese? White supremacy thus carried the seeds of its destruction and spontaneously generated its grave diggers. As the whale of war approached, the colonial authorities in Hong Kong took preventive steps. But they were trapped within a paradigm of race that undermined their attempt to soften the punishing blows of war, thereby demoralizing the Chinese on whom they would have to depend if Japan invaded. In the months leading up to the Japanese invasion, the authorities began to evacuate women and children, getting them out of harm's way. The evacuation of a small percentage of British subjects not of European descent, however, was of lower priority than that of their white counterparts. As the evacuation began in 1940 it was limited sharply by ethnic and racial considerations. Emily Hahn, the U.S. writer residing in Hong Kong at the time, observed that this proviso implied that thousands of Eurasians and Portuguese who held British passports were not considered worth saving from danger, though the non-Asiatic women and children were. These Asiatics, always sensitive and considering themselves badly treated, which they were, blew up. 33. This was not solely the fault of the colonial authorities. Australia was the logical site of decampment for these evacuees in that it was far from the presumed theatre of war, yet close enough for them to return if the threat of war diminished. 
but in November 1940 Australian officials dashed plans for a non-racial evacuation, for they agreed to accept white British subjects who might be evacuated but persons not of pure European descent were not eligible for admission. An exception was made for coloured or partly coloured wives of white British evacuees 34. Residents of Hong Kong were well aware of the white Australia policy. They also may have been aware that the tiny Chinese population of Australia, sited particularly in Darwin on the northern coast, had been repatriated to Hong Kong in recent years, thereby relieving Canberra of expense. Most of the Chinese were brought to the territory many years ago for railway construction work on the line running south from Darwin 35 thus Canberra was sending the Chinese into zones of conflict just as they were welcoming Europeans into safer climes. Strikingly, it was the Chinese legation in Canberra that spoke up on behalf of their brethren in Australia, suggesting that white supremacy inexorably generated Chinese nationalism. In December 1941 this mission complained that Chinese residents in Darwin were not receiving equal treatment with the Australians in the matter of evacuation. All expectant mothers, women, and children, and all aged and invalid persons are being evacuated from Darwin, but no Chinese were included. The official reply from Canberra was that no discrimination is to be shown between Chinese and other residents 36 but official replies meant for Chinese eyes were one thing, the reality was often quite another. This also underscores another aspect of the defense of the lie that was white supremacy mendacity. The Australians argued fiercely that there were other issues at play. In a most secret report on the Japanese intelligence service, it was noted that the detection of enemy agents among Chinese in Australia presents an extremely difficult problem. There were nearly 7,000 male Chinese in this country including some who have escaped from Hong Kong, and a thoroughly reliable source alleged that a group of Chinese, after having been trained in Hong Kong were to be sent via New Guinea to Australia presumably by submarine, as espionage agents 37 how could Canberra root out these spies if even more Chinese were flooding in as evacuees from Hong Kong, they asked. How could Canberra tell the difference between Chinese and Japanese? Yet, like the United States, Australia did not seem as concerned with the possibility of infiltration by, say, German agents. Canberra could argue in damaging mitigation that there were some presumably of pure European descent who also may have been subjected to discriminatory practices, the Consul General of Holland in Sydney reassured Canberra that some Dutch citizens wanted to come to Australia from Singapore, all these people are well-to-do, and included no Jews or undesirables 38. Jean Gittens of Hong Kong was Eurasian and belonged to one of the leading families of the city. Yet on reaching Manila after the 1940 evacuation order, she found that passengers were divided into two categories, those of pure European descent were sent on to Australia, the Eurasian families were returned to Hong Kong. It mattered not to the Anglo-American authorities who collaborated to enforce the scheme that these people returned to Hong Kong were British nationals, nor did it matter that they were families of deceased members of the British Fighting Forces 39. Canberra seemed obsessed by the prospect of an influx of Chinese, even those who were servants to Europeans. A newspaper clipping indicating that about 3,000 women and children taken from Hong Kong for safety will come to Australia 40 ignited a flurry of cables and memos. As a result the minister decided that women evacuated from Hong Kong should not be allowed to bring coloured amas to Australia 41 The Interior Department in Canberra followed up by instructing the colonial secretary in Singapore to kindly refrain from granting passport facilities for Australia in favour of coloured amas whom European employers proposed to bring to Australia for the duration of war or indefinitely 42 The Interior Department had no choice, given the debate in Australia over the propriety of bringing in more Asiatics as servants. Ruby Board of the National Council of Women in New South Wales argued that this would introduce a system which Australia, with its white Australia policy, has always opposed. The president of the feminist club, Mrs P. A. Cameron also opposed the plan since it was at odds with the white Australia policy 43. Even after the war had begun, the Department of Interior ruled that as it is desirable that these colored servants be returned to their own countries as soon as possible, 
it is suggested that their exemptions should not be extended for more than one year. 44 Many European employers from Hong Kong and elsewhere had fallen on hard times and had begun to dismiss their servants. Canberra was worried that they would stay on, thus disrupting the white Australia policy. Though these servants might be put in harm's way in raging war zones, for Canberra yielding to the sentiments of its Asian allies was not a priority. In addition to Chinese servants, Canberra was also trying to deport Chinese wives of army personnel in Australia. It has always been a problem, wrote one official, to find suitable accommodation for them, the fact that the population of Australia is 98% British stock and that there is no admixture of colour makes it difficult both for the Chinese wives and the white people with whom they come in contact. Furthermore, they are unwanted by the white wives of military evacuees. It seems a great pity that these Chinese wives should ever have been evacuated from Hong Kong. 45. But this official was not the only one to be upset. Mrs. Alice Standard of Hong Kong had been evacuated to Brisbane, and found to her dismay that she like others had plummeted precipitously on the class ladder. This was causing her no small amount of anxiety. Aussies, she groaned, have caused us nothing but heartache. Why? she cried, did they have to pick this country to send us to, these Aussies don't like the English people, they show it in a lot of ways, even the school kids fling it in our faces, that we are living on charity 46. Mrs. Trinder seemed to agree with Mrs. Standard, or so thought one Australian official, who complained that she has occupied a great deal of the time of the staff in this office and I can say, without hesitation, that she has been one of the most difficult evacuees with whom we have had to deal. He was inclined to think that Mrs. Trinder, when in Hong Kong, enjoyed unrestricted recreation by reason of the fact that she then had servants to care for her children, but conditions here are different. 47 Europeans in Hong Kong had had even more servants at their beck and call than Euro-Australians, and were in a panic without them. This Australian bias created a gaping opening for Japanese propaganda. A stinging editorial in the Tokyo administered Hong Kong News charged in April 1942 that Britain consciously was seeking to fight on the homeland of a coloured people rather than, for example, in New Zealand or Australia. It charged that white women and children were evacuated and the inevitable war suffering was the lot not of the privileged whites but of the downtrodden coloureds. And the white race intends to have it so until the end if they can. Why was London so worried about Australia? but not about, say, Burma or Malaya, it was asked. Because the latter were not the homelands of precious white folk and London wanted to conserve equipment for the defense of white lands 48. This set the stage for what was to come. The Australian, Desmond Brennan, recalled that on the eve of the Japanese offensive in December 1941, he was on duty in Malaya and had lunched with the officers, three of whom were British, and I remember LT. Collins warning us about our current perception of the Japanese. We all thought they were little short-sighted sick men with buck teeth, whose rifles were old scrap iron and whose bullets would not fire. Bathing in the warm aura of racial privilege, that night Brennan and his comrades were allocated an Indian soldier as a servant. He wanted to take my shoes and socks off and so I agreed to do that at most, but when he commenced to massage my feet, I thought perhaps the servant idea wasn't too bad after all. As Japanese bombers approached, preparing to blast racial privilege, Brennan's Indian servant lay across the door of my hut after tucking my mosquito net in securely and assuring that his large knife was able to be drawn readily. 49 Brennan was lucky that his Indian servant did not wield his weapon against him, his erstwhile master as so many former servants did. The Japanese assault on Asia sent shockwaves through Australia and New Zealand. Kevin Ireland grew up in New Zealand during the war. Years later he still could recall vividly that most terrible time of national fear, impotence. The year of the Japanese. New Zealand had explored many taboo issues over the years, including sex and incest, but the possibility of a Japanese invasion had been neglected, he thought, because of the mass anxiety it ignited. The curious thing, said Ireland, was how our cockiness reasserted itself immediately after Midway, though our arrogance was proportionate to the depth of fear from which we had just been released. 
One factor remained constant, however, like the soldiers of the Allies, in our school sick boy games we preferred to shoot imaginary Germans, the Japanese were too far beneath our contempt. They were subhuman, malevolent freaks. Still, Ireland conceded, there was no doubt that we had all been in shock during the war as the prospect of a Japanese invasion nightmare still casts a shadow on our character 50. The lurking fear in New Zealand was that the Japanese invasion nightmare would combine with an internal uprising of the Maoris seeking revenge against British colonization during the past century. Wellington closely watched the activities of the Japanese in the region for this reason. In February 1939 Wellington worried about whether a Japanese firm should be allowed into the country. They noted carefully that the part Samoan employee of the firm would manage the business, a fact that no doubt seemed strange to a New Zealand accustomed to keeping such a person in a subordinate position. Up to the present, it was said, we have successfully avoided accepting Indian immigrants, British subjects, from Fiji. It is felt that once a Japanese business gets a footing it will be difficult to curtail any extension of trade which is certain to follow. 51 By including those not of pure European descent in matters of high commerce, the Japanese perhaps intentionally upset the pre-existing system of racial preference, thereby worsening relations between the indigenous people of the Pacific and the Empire. Months after the Japanese had declared war, a. E. Mulgan of the National Broadcasting Service asked the Prime Minister to authorize broadcasting sessions for Maoris. Why? A key informant had reported that he was very definitely worried about the attitude of the Maoris. They are not wholly loyal and apt to panic very easily. Also, disloyal ideas and views have been deliberately put into their heads. Mulgan was no less concerned, we have been aware of a certain apathy among the Maoris ourselves and were startled to hear, from the manager of one of these native settlements in a wild part of the Raglan district, that every one of the Maoris on his settlement said frankly they would welcome the coming of the Japanese. The Home Guard tried to get volunteers among these natives and were blandly told that they wanted the Japanese to come, because they would get back their land from the Pakihas. 52 Earlier there was a report that an alarming revolt has broken out in New Zealand and the Maoris have protested against military service on religious grounds 53. T. E. Pia, one of the most influential women in New Zealand's history, was among those suspected of disloyalty during the war and thought to be anti-British and pro-Japanese. Like many of the indigenous people, the bigotry to which she had been subjected had left her unclear in her own mind as to how much allegiance she owed to Wellington. Many Maoris declared that they would defend New Zealand against an invasion but would not fight abroad. Point 54 in April 1942, as war escalated, Wellington also worried about a Fijian named Apolozi, of dangerous subversive tendencies, who it is feared might be contacted by the Japanese and used as a focus of discontent. Apolozi, it was reported, is a full-blooded Fijian with a dangerous influence over sections of the Fijian people. 55. From fears of Maori and Fijian subversion, Wellington's attention turned to the prospect of Asian unrest. The presence of Chinese New Zealanders gave strength to the idea of possible employment of Chinese nationals by the Japanese for espionage purposes. In the early stages of the Sino-Japanese War, a Japanese captain in the intelligence service who posed as a Chinese officer under the name of Wang Abu was responsible for a lot of successful fifth column among Chinese. This enemy agent speaks Cantonese and four or five other Chinese dialects and in addition is described as somewhat Chinese in appearance. It is also reported that he was used successfully by the Japanese at Hong Kong and later in Malaya and Singapore. He was last heard of at Hong Kong where it is reported the Japanese have established an espionage organization. Japan, the Consul General was warned, will make every effort to affect the entry of this agent in the guise of a Chinese for espionage purposes. 56. If suspicions of the Chinese were rife, those of New Zealanders of Japanese ancestry were apocalyptic. Point 57. Even Japanese American seamen even those born in the United States were classed as enemy aliens for the purpose of alien control in New Zealand. 58. Thus, Wellington began to worry that any Asian might be a spy. In the early stages of the war, as Tokyo easily vanquished Hong Kong and Singapore, many Chinese New Zealanders were viewed suspiciously. 
the discovery of Japanese documents stamped most secret that suggested that Indians might be deployed as a fifth column, gave rise to fresh trepidation. Point 59. Many Maoris did indeed enlist to fight abroad. But their experiences often caused them to resent racial privilege in New Zealand even more than before. In 1944 one returned Maori soldier, Major Harewira complained that the colour bar is more obvious in New Zealand than in England. Worse, he had observed more alarming signs of the colour bar in New Zealand today than after the last war. He himself had the door slammed in his face at one boarding house. Much was made by Wellington of turning the martial traditions of the Maoris against Tokyo, but how could this be done effectively while they were being subjected to bigotry at home? 60. Certainly the dynamics created by the war especially the prospect that the racial status quo imperiled national security fomented a severe crisis for white supremacy. In fact, New Zealand and Australia had created the worst of all worlds for the kind of war they were forced to fight. They had alienated the indigenous population both at home and throughout the region and had created a right-wing ethos that fostered the growth of pro-Tokyo sentiments among the emigre population from Europe. Many of them had been maltreated as a result of prevailing chauvinistic British attitudes. In 1943 Canberra developed a lengthy list of potential quislings in the event of an invasion, a list replete with white Russians anti-communists who had fled the Bolshevik Revolution who had been welcomed to the lucky country on account of the white Australia policy 61 Italians in the pre-war era would have been more welcome in Australia than the Chinese, yet now as the flames of war were leaping, leading officials in Canberra were warning their counterparts in Wellington that Italians constitute the largest alien group in Australia and the most difficult to handle in light of their decided lack of sympathy for the Allies. 62. But both New Zealand and Australia worried during the war about the reliability of their indigenous populations. And because Australia had a larger land mass to defend and a worse record on race relations, Canberra may have worried more than its neighbour. One official pinpointed the deeply ingrained public fear widespread during and after the war that Aborigines, because of the ill treatment they had received would link up with a potential Asian invader to Australia. It's time white people in the South realized the danger of their attitude towards natives. They despise them and refer to them as niggers. This sort of thing made the native very bitter. The attitude of the white people, has turned the natives into a fifth column. 63. A few months after Pearl Harbor a secret report detailed the hysteria felt by Canberra at that tense moment. Rev. E. C. H. Gutenkunst of Adelaide asserted that these aboriginals have openly stated the Japs sick told them that the country belonged to the blacks, had been stolen from them by the whites and that by and by they, the Japs sick, would give it back to them, the blacks, dot. The Director General of Security in Canberra added that the Aborigines in Cape York Peninsula have for years been fed and given tobacco by Japanese luggers, which suggested there was an alliance between them. Yet another informant reported that the indigenous people are not to be trusted and are more likely to assist the Jap sick than the whites. The reason being that the Jap sick have consistently made presents, etc., to them over a period of years in return for the favors of their women, etc. 64. Given the fear that the indigenous people would rally en masse to Tokyo's banner, it might be imagined that Canberra would be enlisting Aborigines enthusiastically. But it was not. Like Hong Kong, it feared placing weapons in the hands of the oppressed lest they be turned on it. Professor A. P. Elkin of the University of Sydney questioned the refusal of the military authorities to accept for military service various Aborigines of mixed blood in New South Wales. He acknowledged that there has been some discussion in the press of late that the Aborigines might help the Japanese if they were to attempt a landing. He confessed, this is quite possible since during the past 10 years or so they have seen the Japanese as a very kind folk. Besides, they hold many grudges against Canberra. Disaster could have been avoided in Burma and Java if a hand had been extended to the natives. But some thought that arming the indigenous people would lead to an even greater disaster. 65. A few months after this initial warning a high-level administrator in Brisbane was informed that the aboriginals living in Cape York Peninsula cannot be trusted to help the Allies in the event of a Japanese landing. Reassuringly, 
he added the now dated but telling comment that he did not subscribe to the theory of communistic sympathies with which they are reported to be imbued. Previously, the Japanese, during their fishing excursions, became very friendly with the indigenous people. Signaling how the press of war enkindled race changes, he recommended that to build up a better feeling toward the white man in order to counter Japan, the indigenous people should be given flour, sugar, native tobacco 66. Apparently Japan had made a long-term effort to cultivate the indigenous people of Australia. In Japan Wakayama was tucked away in the southeast corner of Honshu. The people from this region have by tradition followed Nakaimani Fudo, the god of the sea. They became pearl diverse off the coast of Australia early on. They maintained their preeminent position right up to 1941 when over 500 of them were providing Broom with the wherewithal to develop its wealth and livelihood. 67 Broom was strategically situated in underpopulated Western Australia, only 900 kilometers from the Portuguese colony of East Timor to the north. The Japanese effort appears to have been successful, as an intelligence report complained of the doubtful loyalty of blacks. The matter is worthy of the closest attention it said, particularly since the indigenous people had an invaluable knowledge of Queensland topography that would be of inestimable value to the enemy in an overland drive. That the enemy would have little difficulty in soliciting many of these people's services is borne out. By the writer's own experience, these half-educated half-castes and aboriginals have been largely influenced by communist and anti-capitalist propaganda for many years and can almost invariably be swayed by the agitator. They are extremely class conscious and consider that they have had a raw deal from the white man. These sentiments are not displayed to the white man's face but are most evident when the colored group are together in groups. There is little doubt that the Jap sick would find many of them willing helpers. 68. Yet another official warned that the aboriginals in northern Australia might retaliate because of the indignities they had suffered over the years. Further, the Japanese have treated the Torres Strait Island native as a friend, visiting in their houses and treating them as equals 69 a policy seen as downright seditious. The leading Australian jurist, Charles Lowe, declared that evidence was given before me that the natives of Melville Island were in all probability more favorably disposed towards the Japanese than towards us 70. Just as even paranoids sometimes have real enemies, so Canberra may have had real reason to suspect sedition. As one Aborigine put it years later, during the war, some whites regarded Aborigines as security risks. They were too. When you've got a decision to make whether you would back the Australian people or the Japanese who would be kinder to us, I would have backed the Japanese if they had been kinder to me. Why not? We are still a security risk. Until Australia can accept the fact that we are not second-class citizens in this country, we will remain a security risk. I'll sell out to someone who will be kinder to me, thank you very much. Why not? 71 Why not, indeed, was a hard question for Canberra to answer. In response, Australia and its allies, such as the United States, began to recognize that steps toward racial justice, no matter how halting, were the only way to keep this question from being posed, let alone answered. Like Wellington, Canberra also feared that its Chinese population either might join with the invading Japanese or that the Japanese would masquerade as Chinese, providing an effective cover for internal subversion. In a secret report on tactics of Japanese troops, Canberra belatedly admitted with chagrin that we underestimated the enemy. An analysis of Japanese methods showed that when Tokyo's troops successfully invaded Hong Kong, they entered many Chinese homes and confiscated all available Chinese civilian clothing. They used this disguise to infiltrate unobserved through the streets. In Shanghai clean-shaven Sikhs were known to have come down to this area with the Japanese, claiming to act under the authority of Subhas Chandra Bose, the pro-Tokyo Indian patriot, and rallying the Indian community. This was another worry for Canberra, given the proximity of Indians from Fiji, New Zealand, and Australia itself. 72. Then and now, some of the best intelligence on the region was produced by Canberra's emissaries, 
though perhaps knowledge of the hostility to its white Australia policy in the region often led Canberra to exaggerate the dangers of internal and external Asian subversion. The well-connected Australian legation in Chongqing reported weeks after Japan's astounding victory in Singapore, that British prestige was never lower than it is today. Chinese hostility to Britain was sometimes quite open, laced with expressions of contempt. The legation acknowledged belatedly that the British have not been popular in China for some generations and there was an ineradicable preference for the Americans among the Chinese. The ground beneath the feet of the empire was eroding, things had become exceedingly difficult, because there was also a strong pro-German party in Chongqing, especially in the army and China might want to cut a separate deal. Did the putrid policy of pure European descent have anything to do with this? Well, no, the legation felt that the evil lies deep in the Chinese character, which with its lack of civic consciousness and sense of social responsibility tolerates corruption. Still, with rare candor F.W. Eggleston Canberra's representative in China conceded that it is difficult for European military empires to defend successfully possessions which are fully populated by native races whose interest in the contest is small 73. Fears about the Chinese were conjoined with apprehensions about their presence in Australia itself. Though Canberra had discriminated against its Chinese population systematically and had sought to bar the Chinese from evacuating from Hong Kong to Australia both policies had helped to place the nation in dire peril it could not seem to avoid bias. Thus, Canberra monitored carefully during the war an unlikely site of sedition, Chinese restaurants. The deputy director of security in Brisbane asserted that by paying fantastically high prices for businesses Chinese groups are taking over a large part of Brisbane's cafe and catering trade. Shockingly, every Greek restaurateur in Brisbane has received an offer for his business. Though China was officially an ally of Canberra, while fascist elements dominated in Greece, Australia was little concerned about the latter. It was more concerned about the impact of the Chinese on its hallowed white Australia policy. It wanted to know where the Chinese were obtaining the funds for their purchases and thought the purpose was Japanese espionage, since the eating places would be a likely place for pro-Japanese to learn much of the movement of ships, etc., and an avenue likely to be exploited 74 Although Canberra well knew that many Chinese resented Tokyo because of the latter's plunder of Nanking and other outrages, it concluded that its own policies were despised more than those of Japan. Sadly, there was a basis for this perception. As the Malay Peninsula was about to be overrun by Japanese troops early in 1942, the governor of the Straits Settlement sent a hurried message to Canberra. I am afraid that I must let you know that the decision to admit only 50 Chinese and 50 Eurasians in the first instance has caused acute bitterness and uneasiness here. The population of the Straits was 600,000 and 85% were Chinese. It is absolutely essential, the governor continued, that we should have this assistance but we cannot expect much if we are unable to obtain even temporary asylum for wives and children of those who wish to send them away. He wanted to send 5,000, which Canberra thought might be 5,000 too many. But the governor would not relent. A few weeks later the peninsula was under perilous siege and he wrote to venture most earnestly that the Commonwealth government will reconsider. China, he felt driven to remind, is fighting on our side. The Chinese in Malaya have contributed much in money and kind to amenities for Australian troops here. Canberra remained reluctant. In secret deliberations, the war cabinet in Canberra dealt with complaints of Chinese that special arrangements were made for the evacuation of white British residents and not the Chinese from Malaya. When hundreds of Chinese from Hong Kong wanted to depart for Australia, the majority belonging to the educated classes and possessing ample means. The admission of these Hong Kong Chinese was not approved. Although entry was desired for a limited period only. Why? Well, if Hong Kong were to remain indefinitely in enemy hands, there would be no alternative but to permit the Chinese to remain in Australia notwithstanding the white Australia policy. This was unacceptable. For difficulties in securing accommodation amongst the ordinary Australian community would be very real. The same considerations apply in regard to the question of the admission of Chinese and Eurasians from Malaya. 
but because it was highly important that those barred take no offense, and Canberra wanted to forestall such an eventuality, it would admit a small number of Chinese women, no male person should be admitted 75. Although China and the Chinese were allies of Australia and although China was far away from Canberra, throughout the war the Australians feared a mass influx of refugees. The arrival of Chinese and other colored persons on Australia shores, they feared, would disrupt prevailing racial patterns. Point 76 In the midst of the war, a war in which Tokyo was able to gain traction by purporting to be opposed to white supremacy, the Australian authorities seemed to agree with a headline from a local newspaper that proclaimed, Australia must remain white. 77. The other colored persons that worried Canberra included dark skinned Melanesians from the north, in the land that came to be known as Papua New Guinea. The evacuation from PNG in 1942 was racially marked as well. The Sydney Morning Herald claimed Papuans protected the Japanese by guiding them in jungles. This was a double-edged sword for, in a pattern to be replicated throughout the region, the evacuation of the Euro-Australians led directly to the successful propulsion of Papuans into all leadership positions, again signalling how the war fomented race changes. 78. Slowly Canberra was awakening to the consequences of being an island of whiteness in a sea of colour, as it sought to keep up with events it could not entirely control. Thus, in a secret communication an Australian diplomat expressed his anxiety about developments in the neighbouring New Hebrides, a French U.K. condominium. The United States favoured the United Kingdom in this marriage and Australia was worried about the social consequences of this, as the natives would now be exposed to the alleged open-handedness of the American 79. In the language of the empire, all those who were not European were deemed to be coloured. Being coloured they were deemed to be unfit to settle in Australia, no matter how desperate their situation. Why? Canberra's view of the Chinese was similar to the attitude of some right-wing regimes to those who were Jewish, in that the Chinese principle of dual nationality, their tendency to form enclaves and their reluctance to assimilate made them unsuitable as immigrants. The authorities knew that Australia ran the risk of isolation on the racial question because of its policies, and devised cunning means to avoid indictment. The slogan White Australia should be avoided, they said as the war plotted on, as it would range opinion against us. Instead, the question should be reframed, Ceylon excludes Indians, Thailand excludes Chinese, Japan restricts the Koreans. They also sought comfort in the thought that fellow feeling is not sufficiently highly developed among Oriental races to make really dangerous the prospect of a combined challenge to Australia. Canberra should continue to make a vague affirmation of equality, since Australia is no longer strong enough nor sufficiently protected by the United Kingdom to be able to ignore world opinion. The policy should remain the same but the packaging, as in an adept advertising agency, should change, the name White Australia policy should be dropped with advantage and without any change in policy 80. The war also accelerated Australia's long-term shift from a historic reliance on London to closer ties with Washington. But this shift brought further complications, for unlike the United Kingdom, the United States had a huge Negro population that was not predisposed favorably toward white supremacy. The United States too had to make changes on this front in order to placate the African American minority and prevent them from tilting toward Japan. This was particularly so since Washington had to rely heavily on black troops. These considerations presented a major problem for Canberra. In January 1942 Japan was on the march, having seized Hong Kong and given clear indications that Singapore would fall soon. Australia seemed tantalizingly within Japan's reach. But instead of responding eagerly to any offers of aid from Washington, Canberra balked, appearing to value white supremacy more than simple survival. Or perhaps it found it difficult to adjust to the new reality that, far from guaranteeing its survival, white supremacy jeopardized it. Repeatedly the United States was said to be pressing for a percentage of black troops which would mean a number so great as to create serious problems here. A secret memorandum stated unequivocally that by decision of the war cabinet no colored troops from the United States will be stationed in Australia, though graciously they would be allowed to pass through on their way to another assignment. 
This was no off-the-cuff remark but the product of deliberation. It was preceded by a confidential report from the Department of Labor and National Service in Canberra, which stated unequivocally that deploying African Americans even as waterfront laborers in Brisbane would have the most disastrous consequences. 81 In early February 1942 a secret report was filed concerning a convoy of American troops which had arrived at Melbourne and encountered customs officials who refused permission to a number of colored troops to land. After much argument back and forth, it was directed that this restriction should be withdrawn. 82. In April 1944 Canberra was in the familiar position of declaring that any fresh American Negro troops to be sent to the Southwest Pacific will be sent directly to New Guinea. It was also likely that those already on the Australian mainland will be transferred to New Guinea as soon as they can be absorbed. One reason for this was that the Negroes had rebelled against the bias they had experienced, thus, it was said, the situation regarding Negro troops in the area is tense, the Negroes claiming that there is discrimination against them in courts martial 83 despite the fear of invasion, Canberra kept a tight lid on the total number of Negro troops. In August 1942, there were only 7,258 all told, most toiling on the docks, airports, doing road work, and the like. This number included 1,561 in Port Moresby, 242 in Sydney, and 116 in Brisbane. 84. Although Canberra was required to accept these Negroes, it had not agreed nor had its Euro-American counterparts for that matter to treat them fairly. In fact, those within the empire believed that they had a restraining influence on the more bigoted impulses of the Euro-Americans. Early in 1943 Britain's High Commissioner in Canberra forwarded a memo he had obtained from his colleagues stating that British soldiers and auxiliaries should try to understand the American attitude to the relationships of white and colored people and to appreciate why it is different from the attitude of most people in this country. The British should be aware of the differences of attitude among Americans themselves, according to whether they come from the southern states of the Union or the North. It is a matter of deep conviction in the South that the white men and women should not intimately associate with the Negroes. So Australians should be friendly and sympathetic towards colored American troops but remember that they are not accustomed in their own country to close and intimate relationships with white people. The memo also made disparaging comments about Negroes that vitiated the point about British liberalism, like children Negroes commonly inspire affection and admiration. Racial liberalism was not the dominant theme of Australia's policies toward Negroes. In a report coded most secret, sharp words were spoken about a colored American service men's club in Albion Street, Sydney that was causing consternation. Although American colored troops are barred by regulations from the greater part of the city, the report stated, there were odd disputes between colored women and white women who were obvious prostitutes. Reflecting the age-old fear of miscegenation, the authorities were instructed to prevent street women loitering in the vicinity of the Club 85. Interracial relations were charged. There were frequent and violent clashes between black and white U.S. troops down under. Though Australian communists and some unions crusade for racial equality, others were not as welcoming. One Negro soldier said that the first time he was called black this was not deemed a neutral or descriptive term then was in Australia. However, a positive outcome of this difficult situation was that the aggressive retaliation of the Negroes against perceived discrimination provided an effective education for Aborigines. These first contacts with Negroes laid a basis for learning and provided a model for later Aboriginal activists. 86. Such realities gave the Australian elites further reason to seek to curtail the admission into Australia of U.S. Negroes. Thus, in 1942, at a time when it was unclear whether Australia would be ruled in the future by a Japanese viceroy, Canberra gave an instruction that action be taken to discourage Australian troops from fraternizing or drinking with American colored troops. Though such activities were a sign qua non of forging cohesion among those who might be on the verge of making the ultimate sacrifice, Canberra objected. Like London, Canberra cited the precedent set by Washington, such fraternization is not permitted or thought of on the part of American white troops and it is undesirable that it should continue on the part of Australian troops. 
such an association was deleterious to discipline among the U.S. forces and the issue of this instruction was in conformity with the wishes of the U.S. Army. The working class was split. The Trades and Labor Council of Ipswich protested sternly to the Prime Minister against these racial superiority theories which are fascist in character, but its words were met with obstinate resistance. 87 When 2,000 Negro laborers arrived in Townsville, the trade unions objected in no uncertain terms. 88 In Queensland, black Americans were subject to highly formalized residential, occupational, and recreational segregation both within the U.S. armed forces as well as those constructed by their host community. 89 But all this harassment and suffering endured by Negro troops and Aborigines was not for naught. For it was evident, even before the war concluded, that the forces for change generated by the conflict gathered considerable momentum and induced an often reluctant government to liberalize immigration policy and related racial practices. 90 An integral part of this process was the disrupting presence of Negro troops. The international pressures they provided were a catalyst for the improvement of the lot of Aborigines, these pressures, not domestic policies, drove racial reform according to one scholar. As one indigenous Australian put it, the black American had a big effect in the coastal areas in Queensland where there were large numbers of them stationed. We met and talked to them. This laid a basis for learning. This change in outlook is terribly important revolutionary in a way. It has laid the basis for all the other changes that have occurred in the post-war years. 91. Something similar occurred in neighbouring Irianjaya, north of Australia, which shared a land mass with Papua New Guinea and where Canberra exercised its hegemony both before and after the war. During the war itself, one keen Papuan observer remarked, this US Army had men with dark skin who lived in the same way as the whites. We even saw black officers. Then we were sure that our people too could live differently than they had been living. 92. Japan spread the news of racial inequity far and wide. In the neighboring French colony of New Caledonia, reported the pro-Tokyo Hong Kong News, Governor Christian Legret had openly charged Negro American troops stationed in Numia of misbehaving hour and of being the terror of the white women in New Caledonia 93 The South Pacific, a model of white supremacy, was a major target of Japanese propaganda. Reality there, the paper said presented a scathing indictment of the empire. But with the rise of Tokyo, the white man in the South Seas is now in grave danger of being hoist by his own petard. 94 Japanese propaganda repeatedly threatened Australians and New Zealanders even when it may have intended otherwise. Thus, Tohiko Kanashi in September 1942 reassured them that after the Japanese invasion and conquest, a century would be required for Nippon to outnumber the white Australians, to Asianize this vast land would not be feasible, though part of the empire provided ideal places for Nipponese settlement. That the whites were promised that they would not be treated in the same category as Chinese and Indonesians was not exactly reassuring 95 particularly since it was acknowledged that for the development of Australia, the importation of Chinese labor seems to be the only solution 96. These observations reflect the impact of the war including the presence of Negro soldiers and the pervasive, often frightening, Tokyo propaganda on the empire in the South Pacific. The official war history drafted in New Zealand notes that the crucial widening of the native, now appropriately, Maori affairs, department occurred during the war years and the war affected and accelerated the change. The chief elements contributing to this effect included increasing racial consciousness of the Maori during the years of recruiting and fighting 97 it was in 1944 that there was a conference of representatives of all the Maori tribes. The first conference of its kind that had ever been held. The Prime Minister spoke, and the indigenous people made land claims that were to Royal Wellington for years to come. 98 the war experience itself propelled this consciousness and militancy. For people who had the greatest respect for the prestige of the white man saw him engaged in menial occupations 99. Make no mistake, race relations in the South Pacific were not magically transformed by dint of war. To the contrary. Peter Hall, a Eurasian, matriculated after the war at a school in Sydney. He observed, I was called Tojo probably because I came from China. 
In later years as the Australian sun tanned me, I was nicknamed Wog. You just had to grin and bear it, otherwise you would never get any peace. 100. Hall's experience was not unusual. Canberra had developed special rules for non-European students who wished to study there that were not free of discrimination. Point 101 Without a doubt this was part of a larger immigration scheme that sought by various means to extend the shelf life of the white Australia policy. Weeks after the Japanese surrender the cleric Dr. Wilson Macaulay felt compelled to remind Canberra that the phrase white Australia has a deadly sound in oriental ears it means the same type of racial superiority as Hitler's heron folk and is equally objectionable. 102 In its defense, Canberra could point to analogous policies of its chief ally, Washington. In the immediate post-war era an American army chaplain advised soldiers to think twice before marrying a Filipina because of the prejudice they might encounter in North America. 103. But the United States, which was reigniting a cold war against its most recent ally, the Soviet Union, was also revising its racial policies to better engage in this conflict. Australia, on the other hand, seemed more interested in presenting a happy face of racial concord while continuing the same old antebellum policies. Thus, the National Maritime Union of the United States, whose merchant seamen often sailed into Perth and other Australian ports, took issue with the continuing attempt to discriminate against Negro seamen. They had read an article in the local press about Australian women dating these visitors, we have tried to reason with the girls who have been frenziedly embracing their black lovers, said the periodical, begging them not to go. But they have no reasoning power. But why? By our standards, said the journal, the Negroes were sex-crazed and liable to go mad after drinking very little alcohol. They left in their wake many half-caste children running around. They came from the north with plenty of spending money and produced a degrading spectacle of Australian white girls rushing the wharf to be for the attentions of the Negro members of the crew. This generated a revolting sight of local girls hysterically mauling black men and begging them with tearful voices to stay. According to white Americans, in no other Pacific port do white women behave in such a depraved and abandoned fashion. And for this reason Sydney has become the favorite port of call for Negro seamen. Some of our bung malls, as we term them in the police force, reserve themselves exclusively for the black men. They watch the shipping news carefully for arrival dates of American ships. 104 Ferdinand Smith, the Negro leader of the seamen, was horrified and shocked beyond credulity at the monstrous libel of these words, but it just showed that the war had not changed everything. 105. 8. Asians versus White Supremacy White supremacy generated as sturdy and resolute a response in the region from the Malay Peninsula to India as it had in the South Pacific. Unlike the latter, for the most part the former did not involve settler states of the type and magnitude of New Zealand and Australia. Here colonialism was more in line with that found in Hong Kong. And here was a reaction that Hong Kongers would have found familiar. As in black America, Vietnamese patriots, chafing under French colonialism, were heartened by Japan's defeat of Russia in 1905.1 This was echoed in India, the heart of the empire. Subhas Chandra Bose, an Indian hero who fought side by side with Japanese troops against the British, speaking in Tokyo, proclaimed, Japan's victory over Russia in 1905 was the harbinger of Asia's resurgence. That victory was hailed with great joy not only by the Japanese but also by the Indians. Too likewise, Jawaharlal Nehru, a founding father of the world's largest democracy, also spoke warmly of Japan's momentous triumph. He invested in a large number of books on Japan and began to study their example for insight into what it might mean for his own country. The victory, he exclaimed, was a great pick-me-up for Asia. Like others in the region, he watched with rapt attention as the number of Chinese students going to Japan rose from 500 in 1902 to 13,000 in 1906. Yet another Indian leader, R.B. Bose, helped organize a conference of Pan-Asianists in Nagasaki in 1926, attended by Chinese, Vietnamese, and Indians, among others. 
This conference presaged the future role of India and the Indian diaspora as the headquarters of pro-Tokyo sentiment in Asia. Point three in the pre-war era, the empire had a barely concealed fear of the Japanese appeal in the region. Point four, this pro-Tokyo sentiment should not be overestimated. It was not universal, particularly among communists, who had some support in both India and China. But the empire appeared more fearful of the communists than of Tokyo. In the pre-war period they ruthlessly suppressed the former, while entering into an alliance with the latter. This had the predictable consequence of strengthening Japan-inspired nationalism, while weakening their predators, the communists. Point five. The empire could have strengthened anti-Japan feeling but often took actions that pointed in a different direction, for example, in the 1930s when they deported the Vietnamese communist, Ho Chi Minh, from Hong Kong where he had been residing for seven months to an uncertain fate. Point six. Indeed, a former colonial governor of Hong Kong and Singapore was quite blunt in his objection to any Chinese political organizations whatsoever functioning here, communist or non-communist. 7. The British repressed political expression among Asians, but in so doing weakened organizations such as the communists that were adamantly opposed to Japanese imperialism. Similar trends occurred in Malaya. Mustafa Hussain was an avid reader and a member of the British Left Book Club, a left-wing socialist, and a happy-go-lucky fellow, who would have remained that way if he had not been discriminated against in the civil service by white Europeans. This racial discrimination made him a bitter diehard Malay nationalist. Nationalist anger consumed his soul. Hence he moved closer to Japan and worked with the Japanese when they occupied his homeland. Point eight. Hussein's anger was generated by white supremacy. Even as the blaze of war was beginning to crackle in Southeast Asia, the empire reaffirmed that in Malaya. The color bar is strictly enforced by the colonial office both in the Malayan civil service and the professional departments. According to the eminent Sir George Maxwell, former chief secretary in the government of the Federated States of Malaya, the color bar had been introduced earlier in the century because fear arose that the civil service might be inundated by candidates from India, unconnected with Malaya, and the colonial office altered the regulations and required that all candidates should be of pure European descent. Sir George noted, in the medical department there is a large number of Asiatics domiciled and educated in Malaya, British subjects. They have diplomas. But for no other reason than their color, they can get no further than the subordinate grade. And in the agricultural department, Mr. Gun Latek, a Chinese graduate of Cambridge, has a better degree in agriculture than the European head of his branch in the department. He too because of his color has not been able to get beyond the rank and pay of a subordinate. 9. These policies created fertile soil for pro-Nippon sentiment on the Malay Peninsula. Throughout the pre-war era the British feared that not only Japan but also Russia were now working independently to reach the same goal the elimination of white influence in the East 10, it is unclear why Moscow would be interested in doing this unless its ideology automatically barred it from admission into the hallowed halls of whiteness. Only months after the Japanese takeover, even British writers were proclaiming a very practical revolution in race relationships 11 given the empire's practices, it did not take much to bring this on. Lee Kuan Yew, the founding father of Singapore, recalls that the best local graduates had much lower salaries than the British. This conservative politician years later remained contemptuous of the ledger domain necessary to maintain the illusion of white supremacy. Any British, European, or American who misbehaved or looked like a tramp, he later recalled, was immediately packed off because he would demean the whole white race, whose superiority, he added with a dash of sarcasm, must never be thrown in doubt. But whatever mystical faith there was in the alleged superiority of the whites was crushed by the Japanese invasion, as stories of their scramble to save their skins led the Asiatics to see them as selfish and cowardly. Lee, who collaborated with the Japanese, said the three and a half years of the occupation were the most important of my life. He was not alone in benefiting from the occupation, gaining power, that he never relinquished afterward, when the British and other Europeans were ousted from leading posts. Said Lee, 
the luckiest and most prosperous of all were those like the Shaw brothers who were given by Tokyo the license or franchise to run gambling firms in the amusements parks 12. Though present-day Malaysia, with a Malay majority, and Singapore, with a Chinese majority, often disagree on many things, it is striking that the preeminent figure in Malaysian history, Mahathir Mohamad, agrees with Lee Kuan Yew on the importance of the Japanese interregnum. It completely changed our world, he said. Not only did the Japanese forces physically oust the British, they also changed our view of the world. He studied Japanese and remains friendly with Tokyo. For those who went to Japanese schools and were willing to learn the language, the Japanese occupation was not too painful. Of course, he adds, people of Chinese origin suffered more and many were killed or held in captivity. But as for himself, he was not violently opposed to the Japanese. He even accepted some key arguments of the Japanese right. Even today some Japanese will argue that their occupation of Asia was not so much an act of aggression towards the Asian nations, as it was an attempt to free us from European colonial rule. There is at least some truth to that argument. The success of the Japanese invasion convinced us that there is nothing inherently superior in the Europeans. They could be defeated, they could be reduced to groveling before an Asian race, the Japanese. 13. The Japanese themselves were contemptuous of their British adversaries. Masanobu Tsuji was an architect of the Japanese campaign. Years later he marveled at the fact that the British army had blown up the bridges and abandoned several thousand Indian soldiers on the north bank of the river. The British army, he concluded, slightly bemused, excels in retreat. Perhaps worse was their utter disregard for their Indian comrades, in the Japanese army there would have been no blasting until it was certain that the last of our comrades in arms had crossed the river. Although Masanobu Tsuji did not say that this disregard may have been motivated by white supremacy, his contempt for the British army was clear, they looked like men who had finished their work by contract at a suitable salary, and were now taking rest free from the anxiety of the battlefield 14. Colonialism on the Malay Peninsula had prepared the ground for a Japanese advance. Lim Chok Fui was born in Singapore in 1936 in a neighborhood which had no such facilities as water closets or tap water. We had to get water from wells. Living conditions at the time could be regarded as similar to those in a rural area or those in a farming village in China. His home was a bungalow of 900 square feet. Divided into living spaces for four families with each family having one room. There were four in his family. A common toilet was shared by all the families. It was a hole dug in the ground with a roof which was actually a zinc sheet. Fifteen meanwhile, the British resided in regal splendor. The European colony was a mere handful of about 8,000 with Scotsmen predominating, and they lorded it over those not of pure European descent 16. This racial supremacy had an intra-European class bias, of course. Many British troops felt that London did precisely nothing to make life more tolerable for the airmen up in Kota Baru. There was even a dearth of good drinking water. Nonetheless, the troops lived in greater comfort than non-Europeans. Among some Navy men, even their boy had a boy or servant. As in Hong Kong, the Empire adopted color-coded evacuation policies. When war threatened, London was reluctant to evacuate about 7,000 Chinese workmen at the docks in Singapore though this group was to become the heart of the anti-Japanese movement since the reception areas would be either Australia, India, Ceylon, or South Africa. The first and last of these countries have hitherto held strong views on the subject of Asiatic labor. 17 as in Hong Kong, in Singapore Japan relied heavily on a unique crew of shrewd men, the barbers. They automatically gave all white customers an anti-hangover massage whether they wanted merely a shave or haircut, which relaxed them and made them more willing to engage in casual conversations that often yielded a mother load of intelligence. Point 18 Although there were only 3,500 souls in the pre-war Japanese community in the region, the white supremacist policies of the British enhanced their effectiveness. Point 19 In any event, the British, being outnumbered, could not have held off a credible invasion, particularly as London had alienated the Chinese, Indians, and Malays. 
Moreover, intra-European conflict weakened them further, as white supremacy was no more than a cover for British, than English supremacy. The case of David Marshall indicates that those who did not fit the proper national origin profile were also subject to exclusion. I applied to join the Singapore Volunteers Corps, he said, and it was with some difficulty that they finally accepted me as I was neither European, nor a Chinese, nor Eurasian, but they finally placed me with the odds and sods, East Europeans and some English volunteers 20. Harvey Reeves had typical colonialist attitudes. He complained of the general inefficiency of Asiatics, particularly Malays, when left to their own initiative. They have little idea of method or coordination among themselves. But somehow this inefficiency disappeared when the Japanese invaders arrived, as many of the Malays were established fifth columnists, especially schoolmasters. Perhaps recognizing that by maltreating the Malays the British may have helped to foment sedition, Reeves found that the colonizers had a fifth column mania. They suspected nearly every Asiatic who was unlucky enough to find himself near the fighting zone. In Kedah, an unfederated state with an anti-British tendency. Fifth columnists were notably active. Malays were caught signaling to Japanese aircraft. It is also true that a good deal of signaling was done on Singapore Island. Worse, of the European troops, very few could distinguish a Malay from a Tamil, a Chinese, or Japanese, since the vast majority of military units knew next to nothing about the country. Perhaps two out of every hundred British soldiers had a rudimentary knowledge of Malay, the lingua franca and possibly the easiest language in the world to learn. Ineluctably, racial bias marred relations between whites as well, as the phobia was so bad that not only Asiatics were distrusted but also responsible Europeans. There was some justification for this in fact, as the Australians earned themselves a deservedly bad reputation for looting on every possible occasion they took what they could lay their hands on. The decadence of the empire was so deep that even as the rising sun was seizing Hong Kong, life in supposedly impregnable Singapore continued unchanged. In January 1942 Reeves joined in the general hedonistic way of life. Dancing went on nightly at Raffles, the Seaview Hotel, the Adelphi, and Cyrano were full of diners day and night. Drunken Australian soldiers lurched their way around the streets. It was a bacchanalian feast. The gaiety was garish and spurious with a touch of the last days of Pompeii about it. Everyone was drunk in varying degrees. Twenty-one like the Australian government which could not see that its white supremacist rejection of Negro troops could jeopardize its own existence, the colonists in Singapore were out of touch with reality.22. But the revelry did not last long. The Australian, Raymond Burridge, was stationed on the Malay Peninsula. The Australians, he recalled years later, were not very popular with the British civilians in Singapore and Malaya as the British looked on the Australians as mere colonials. Our opinions of the general staff commanding Singapore was that they were centuries behind the times and no good as leaders, except at golf or cricket perhaps. Our opinions of the peoples of Malaya were quite negative, except for the Chinese and Gurkha troops and civilians. The Malays and Indian troops and civilians were pro-Japanese and after the fall of Singapore, they marched us into Changi jail. No, not the Jap Sikh but Sikh Indian troops who had been our allies the day before. During the inevitable march of humiliation when the Japanese forcibly marched the vanquished and beleaguered Europeans through the streets, many of the colonized were spitting on us as we marched into Changi jail and calling us. Dog Britishers. 23. When Malayans saw British and Australian POWs, who only several months before ruled Singapore and Malaya, doing menial work that only indigenous people had done, and begging for cigarettes, they could not help but be moved. The sight impressed Juan Cadet, reminding him of the dawn of a new era in Asia and of a new Malaya for which he had trained. This cadet was now being trained by the new occupiers, the Japanese, and he could not avoid comparing them favorably to the previous occupiers the British. The training included a 40-mile march. What was most impressive during the march was that the director and the instructors too, walked with the students every inch of the way. The British, they thought, 
would have driven in a car. Among other things, the authorities chose to ban the film Gone with the Wind. The film had been scorned by many African Americans and other colored people for its positive portrayal of plantation slavery in the United States while it was embraced by many whites, who helped make it one of the more lucrative films of the 20th century. With every maneuver, Tokyo signaled its hostility toward the European colonizers, and its apparent willingness to embrace the concerns of the oppressed. Point 24. Victor Cruz Mann was born in Malacca in 1918. He joined the Malacca Volunteer Force in the pre-war era but was not pleased with it. I never met any European before the war who treated you as an equal. They always behaved d like they were. Superior than you. You see thing s that made a lot of local people really angry and they were pleased that the Japanese fellows had come, because of the way they were treated. In the beginning, they thought the Japanese had come to liberate them. This sentiment was widely held throughout the region. Point 25. Joginder Singh concurred he was born in 1919 in Malacca and was part of the segregated defense force that was overrun. Point 26. Certainly few non Europeans. 27. Regretted the end of the empire initially. Point 28. I don't care who rules Singapore, said Tan Chengui. Unfortunately for Tokyo, its misrule quickly led to substantial hardship and eroded whatever goodwill it had had coming in. Point 29. K. M. Rigaraju was not Eurasian but Indian, but he shared Krusman's feelings. Born in 1915 in India, he migrated to Singapore in 1929. He was a founder of the Indian Youth League, which by 1941 had 10,000 members. Though he helped in 1937 with Chinese relief during the Japanese invasion, he was not a supporter of the empire. Why? The British had superior feelings toward Asiatics that's all. They show discrimination. India was a slave under the British people. That is the feeling of every Indian, he claimed. Point 30. Dr. Tan Ban Chen, born in Singapore in 1929, recalled all the toy stores owned by the Japanese, they sold a lot of cheap goods and they were very polite, which distinguished them from their British counterparts. 31 Hung Chang Ki, born in Singapore in 1923, did not recall the Japanese stores but did remember that there were a lot of prostitutes among them, which made them popular with many men. So, on the day they came in, he said, every house had a Japanese flag. Even my house, we had one made. The change in rulers did not bother him particularly, whoever was the boss makes no difference actually. It was still a colonialist country. Unlike those who have recounted Japanese brutality toward the Chinese, he felt differently, averring that the Chinese had an advantage over Malays and Indians since they could write kanji and could, thus, pick up Japanese faster. 32 Given the exploitative conditions of the empire, the new occupiers were understandably popular at first. 33 Kiplin Lee recalls the British denouncing the new occupiers as cruel, but in his view this was far from the truth. He was a Peranakan an important ethnic group on the peninsula, and was fifth or sixth generation in the region. His father, like many others, had been pro-British. But when the surrender came, he made one remark. Well, what's the difference, it's a change of masters. The Japanese walked in here practically. That's when the British prestige came down, I think for good. After that in Singapore, I think no one really respected the British at all. He felt that Malays had it easy. The Japanese did not bother them that much. The very fact that they did not have to go into concentration camps seemed to prove the point. The new occupiers also assumed that the Indians did not care for the English. And they were in a way quite right. The Chinese, of course, were different, he thought. 34. Ismail Zain, a Malay born in 1912, also recalled the sheer joy of the British defeat. Actually among the Malays, they welcomed the Japanese, since unlike the former colonizers, they were very friendly, they were nice to all the people. They always offer you a cigarette, that and that. They used to toxic all the jokes. By contrast, the British, they look down upon you if you are a junior staff. They don't give you cigarette, like that. 
They are not friendly, they won't talk to you in a friendly manner. But the Japanese do that. I appreciate that. The British, he thought, had a superiority complex. But the Japanese, no. They treat us all alike. They treat us like friends, whether they are high-ranking officers or not. But the British, no. They won't do that. The ground had been prepared for the invasion in the 1930s by the Kesichuan Malayamuta or Malay Youth Movement, whose duty was to help the Japanese intelligence. They formed the basis for the Hihas, the indigenous collaborators, of which there were quite a lot. In Singapore alone I think nearly 10,000. They were in uniform. Like those who had been impressed with Japanese stores, Ismail Zain felt that goods were cheaper as a result of the occupation. Thus, he was happy about the British surrender.35. Dr. F. A. C. Ohlers, who was Eurasian, felt likewise. Born in 1921, his brother was the first speaker of the parliament in Singapore. Eurasians who were first generation were given red badges and not interned, unlike those of pure European descent. But because of his Occidental heritage, he like others similarly situated was viewed with suspicion. He learned Japanese and, like others, had fond memories of these new colonizers, there were many decent ones among them. They used to come along to the house and the nucleus of a kind of camaraderie, a friendship. Developed. 36. Clearly, the Malays were subjected to systematic anti-British propaganda 37 which may account for their negative attitude toward London and their positive feelings about Tokyo. Moreover, many associated the end of colonialism which was seen as inseparable from white supremacy with the demise of the empire, which too was associated with Tokyo. Thus, Sho Chuan Lam, born in 1927, recalled that the new occupiers used to tell us how the British had exploited the Asians. At times they made us feel very proud that we were Asians, telling us that all this culture and civilization started with the Chinese and other Asians. I remember one Japanese even told me that although they did not like the Christians, he said Jesus Christ was also an Asian. 38 Patrick Hardy has a similar recollection. In every Singapore theatre during the occupation, before they start the film, this is the word, sick have to be shown on the screen. They said in Malay, Alhamdulillah, East Asia Sikarang Suda Di Kembalike Bangsa Asia. Marila Kita Bekarjia Bursama Sama Untak Asia Timor Raya So it says that Asia have gone back to the Asian people. So therefore we must work together for the sake of Southeast Asia. 39. This propaganda offensive by the new colonizers began from day 1.40 as in Hong Kong, they marched the Europeans, bedraggled and defeated, through town, providing a living symbol of the fall of white supremacy and the rise of a new order. 41 Gay Wu and Gay was struck by the long marches to Changi Jail, to Sime Road. It was a pitiful sight. They saw their former bosses marching haltingly, lamely, and some of them begging for water. Singaporeans were no longer cringing like before when they stammered. Yes, sir. And could hardly reply when they were addressed by a European or Englishman. But now they could look at a European straight in the eye. Somehow or other the psychological breakthrough happened. This was the beginning of a new spirit of independence among the young people. Even the older people, the leaders, felt that it was time, they realized that the white supremacy was a myth, that it was time that independence should be taken seriously. That was the beginning of this political awakening. We felt the British were not superhuman, supermen, as we used to think. 42. The Japanese methodically ingratiated themselves with the local population. 43. But then again, Anything they did in this sphere would have made them stand out, given the abysmal policies of their British predecessors. Zamraud Zaba was born in Malaya in 1921 and worked with the new occupiers as a clerk in the police department during the war. As she recalled it, the good thing about those Japanese there was that they could speak Malay rather well, unlike the British, in turn, she learned Japanese.44 Mary Lim, born in Malacca in 1922, had a grandmother who also learned Japanese, 
simply by hearing their conversation. They come quite often to my grandmother, at my grandmother's invitation. So that's how she picked up Japanese. They were very nice to my grandmother. 45 This friendliness coupled with opportunities for education and the advancement of locals was in dramatic contrast to the empire. As Robert Chong noted, in a way, working with them, they impart their full knowledge to you. That's why I give them full credit for that. They teach you sincerely and they will encourage you wholeheartedly. Definitely. 46 Tan Ban Cheng also compared them favorably over the British. 47. Lieutenant M. M. Pillai of India was part of the British military and served on the Malay Peninsula but even he observed that compared to their European counterparts, the Japanese could get to the heart of the Asiatics by sitting down and talking with them on terms of perfect equality. It would have been a miracle if any European had condescended to do that. This was the trump card of the Japanese. Furthermore, in all Japanese retail shops in Singapore the salesmen were Malays or Indians, while Eurasian girls were employed by the Japanese as stenotypists, telephone operators, and as sales girls. The Sultan of Johor had given concessions to the Japanese in his state to work the iron ore mines and the Japanese owned many rubber estates in the states. Many Japanese had become Mohammedans and this flattered the Malays a good deal. At one point at a meeting of the nine rulers of the states which was held at the Adelphi Hotel, the Sultan of Johor was reported to have stated that there was Japanese blood in the veins of some of the Malay Sultans 48. Conventional Wisdom 49 holds that the new colonizers favored the Indians and Malays and persecuted the Chinese 50 as an extension of the war taking place in China. 51 But Charlie Gan, born in Singapore in 1919, disagrees with this generalization. From the point of the Japanese being harsh or cruel to us, we didn't really experience that, especially after the initial occupation, say about a year later. I think we enjoyed quite a peaceful life in Singapore. No, he continued, the Malays and Indians were not favored. Not that I know of. Skin alone doesn't work if the fellow is useless to them. They must be useful to them. 52 FAC Oilers did not feel that the Japanese ignored skin. To the contrary, Europeans of every stripe were interned and wives too even if they were married to local people but their offspring were not, funnily, because they were considered to be Singaporeans. 53. Whatever the subsequent recollections, the fact is that the major anti-Japanese forces during the war were almost exclusively Chinese. The Chinese forces could not rely on either the Malays or the Indians, amongst whom no comparable movements existed. 54. Ironically, these same anti-Nippon forces often communist-led were later forced into a bitter conflict with the returning colonialists from London after the war ended. This conflict prefigured the longer and better known war in Vietnam. The friendly recollections of Japanese rule may not have been ex post facto fabrications. 55 As late as November 1943, a secret-slash-confidential report of the Allies acknowledged that the Malayans on the whole appeared to be indifferent as to whether the British returned or not 56 once more, this says more about the Empire than it does about Tokyo. Even after the Japanese were forced out of power in Singapore and the surrounding region, their presence was considerable. The methodical propaganda offensive they had conducted against white supremacy, the unforgettable sight of unkempt and subjugated Europeans marching off to an uncertain fate with Japanese soldiers pointing bayonets at their backs, the positions occupied by Malays in particular after the fall of the empire all this and more ensured that the status quo ante would no longer prevail. Although Arthur Alexander Thompson, a Eurasian born in Singapore in 1925, was quite critical of the new colonizers, even he admitted that with the Japanese coming to Singapore, they have taught the people one thing. That the people here should get independence. Moreover, after the war all the British had gone back to their homes and our own people took over all these top posts. Before that you'll never be able to take up major posts. We had few local people who were inspectors. There were British inspectors. The principal commissioner of police, all were Europeans. Even the general hospital too, the sisters nuns always British, no local person could be a sister. That's true, that was the case. 
and the same thing goes to the city council. Municipal commissioners, they were all Europeans, all English people on top and none of our people were able to run the department being right at the top. We always worked down below. 57 But after the invasion, this changed for good. Ismail Zine also detected some change among the British after the war. They changed a little bit. They are not so proud, not so arrogant as before. They were very arrogant before, you know. This war, he thought, was a blessing in disguise. If not for this war, I don't think Asian nations that are already now independent could get independence so soon. 58 After the war, Ng Senyong also had a very poor opinion of the British, very poor. Because they let us down badly. Through their propaganda we were mostly misled. Later on we found that in fact the British has got no quality. No quality as far as fighting spirits is concerned, they got nil. For me personally I have one thing to say that the Japanese invasion practically changes the destiny of Southeast Asian people. Had it not been for the Japanese war, we would still be calling the British our masters. Had it not been for the Japanese, I would probably still be working as a clerk. I won't be what I am today. 5910 Ban Cheng agreed. Previously, a lot of Asians had a sort of inferiority complex. Then the Japanese instilled in us. The fact that we could do a lot of things, also as good as any other people in the West. After the war, people did not look so much toward the West for their direction, for their dominance in our affairs 60. FAC Ollers recalled that previously there was an inborn feeling, this feeling was inculcated in us that the white man was lord, you know, and you were second class, though we had so many competent Singapore people, local people, who were teaching and getting half the salary that young recruits from England were getting. Things like that irked us. They were not permitted to enter Tangling Club. Not permitted to set foot in the swimming club. But the occupation made us see also, like it did everybody else, that the white skin, the white person, the white man, wasn't as all-powerful as he declared himself to be in the colonial era. And if anything good did come out of the Japanese occupation, it was independence. And I'm sure independence would have been a long time coming if not for the war. Not only in Singapore, all over in India, Ceylon. We got to know that the British Empire was not invincible. 61. Tan Wiang, born in Singapore in 1919, discovered that after the war, the British I noticed were a little bit more humbler sick, before that they were real colonialists. But after their defeat they were more civil. I noticed that in my own department. And they became more friendly everyone that I knew. I found I could make friends easily with all my British associates who had formerly thought themselves superior. Before they were ordering you about with no sort of warmness, no friendship, just work, and purely work and literally you were like slaves or laborers to them. There was not much friendship involved. They were snobbish, snooty as if they belonged to a different society or different class or different creed. Before the Chinese were left out of the sports competition for the naval dockyard in the Singapore Cup but afterward that changed. Before he had to go to the canteen for Asiatics, they called it through the back door. But afterward he could go where they were serving the officers. So I went there and I ate the British set lunch. Beautiful. I enjoyed it and paid like a duke of course. Beautiful steaks, pork chops, chicken, mashed potatoes. I enjoyed it very much. It was like heaven returned after the Japanese occupation. Thus, he found the arrival of the Japanese very good, personally I think. To me, it was a blessing in disguise. It was the sparkle, the dawn of awakening for Asian people. And not only that, I think the dawn of Afro-Asian people also. The Japanese taught us that Asians can fight, can stand up and do things for themselves and not to depend on foster fathers. It led to the fall of the British Empire. 62. Like the Ratna in New Zealand and some Negroes in the United States, 
the attempt to trace blood ties between the Japanese and Malays was symptomatic of an increasingly close relationship between Tokyo and those who were hostile toward white supremacy. Again, London was well aware of this gathering storm but found itself incapable of responding effectively, possibly because such action might have meant disrupting prevailing racial practices. Thus, in its annual report on Siam in 1937, London's emissary in a confidential report spoke of a typically stupid piece of Japanese propaganda, that is, a speech delivered by the military attaché at a cocktail party given by him to the Bangkok press. In this oration he made the egregious statement that the present situation in China might lead Japan to wage war with the white races. 63. This stupid propaganda fed on colonial practices. Mrs. U. M. Streetfield recalled that in Bangkok in 1931 there were about a thousand Europeans living and working there and perhaps 500 of these were British. The rest were Danes, Americans, Germans, French, Dutch, Swiss and many others but the communities mixed a good deal. At any party there might be six or seven nationalities present. It was an astonishing place for parties of every sort we went to a great many parties and played a great deal of bridge, she observed fondly. This ostentation hardly embraced the Siamese. Though Bangkok may not have been as bad as Bombay, where at night multitudes slept in the streets and the dainty had to step over sleeping bodies, it was not Valhalla either.64. Hence, it should have come as no surprise to the empire to learn from one of its agents in the summer of 1944 that the Siamese appeared to work in harmony with the Japanese and it is considered that an attempt to drive the Japanese from Thailand would not be welcomed. 65 The British seemed paralyzed by such threats. They had hoped that Tokyo would pulverize the communists throughout the region, and in the pre-war era were reluctant to do anything to interfere with this possibility. Tokyo often was given the run of the empire because of its sterling anti-communist credentials. Thus, another confidential report in 1938 from the British legation in Tokyo spoke of a Burmese engineer who noted that the Japanese are sending commercial travelers and other business and professional men to Burma with instructions to spread anti-British and pan-Asia propaganda. Their informant chose to pass as a Japanese, spoke Japanese fluently, had had a Japanese wife, and was in a unique position to uncover acts of subversion by Tokyo.66. Tokyo's Pan-Asia propaganda in Burma 67 seemed to be vindicated when the British evacuated Rangoon and other areas. When the war began, motor convoys were used mainly for Europeans, Anglo-Burmans, or Anglo-Indians employed by the Burma Oil Company, there was preferential treatment for Europeans and Anglo-Indians. 68 Ho Yongchi spoke sarcastically of Dorman Smith the British governor of Burma and his stroke of sheer genius. This bumbling colonial governor had segregated black and white refugees. The whites were either evacuated to India early, aboard ship, or were flown out on Indian Airways or China National Aviation Corporation planes. The natives were sent out on what became known as the Black Trail. An estimated 400,000 black refugees tried to escape by these trails. The forlorn fugitives died by the tens of thousands from starvation and disease. Not only were the Indians of Burma barred from white trails but so were the Chinese 69. Colonel the R.T. Han. Sir Reginald Dorman Smith in numerous secret dispatches from Burma agreed. As early as January 1942 he was reporting that a Thakin 5th column was extremely active there. They let Japs sick around our forces and created all necessary disturbances 70 after the biased evacuation process, morale has definitely deteriorated especially among Indian community. Servants are now wanting to leave. It is now being said that Europeans will look after themselves and leave others to their fate. But the feisty Sir Reginald had not given up all hope. Two of the main human instincts, he thought, are love and fear. It may well be that this part of the world do not love us. What we have to do is to make them fear the Jap sick. 71. But soon pessimism set in. By March 1942, Dorman Smith was admitting that the Japanese occupation has generally been accepted with a grace which must be gratifying to the Japanese. 
The Thakins have actively cooperated in every way with them and where necessary have applied persuasion to bring their fellow Burmans into line. It is definitely disappointing that after all our years of occupation of both lower and to a lesser degree Upper Burma we have not been able to create that loyalty which is generally associated with our subject nations. But I fear that we must accept the fact that we have not repeat not inducted that sort of loyalty which will withstand adversity. 72. Just as many U.S. Negroes had difficulty during the war accepting that London was the hero and Tokyo the villain, many in Burma did too. Some nationalists felt that Tokyo represented a resurgent Asia against European domination. As in the United States, those who were close to the communists vehemently disagreed. 73 But, as elsewhere, the communists had been so effectively destabilized that the path was smoothed nicely for the rise of Japanese oriented nationalists. London's reluctance to arm Africans on African soil or the Chinese on Chinese soil was matched by its hesitation to arm the Burmese in Burma. In 1939 the Burma Defense Forces contained only 472 Burmans as against 3,197 Karens, Chins and Kachins. It was deemed imprudent to enlist Burmans in a force which might have to be used against their fellow countrymen 74 on the other side, Japan was enlisting forces of all kinds. Even animals were included. For example, trained monkeys were taught to carry a length of string to the top of a tree, loop the string over a strong branch near the top and then drop the string to the ground. A strong rope was fastened to the string and the rope was easily pulled over the branch and back to the ground. A Japanese soldier would then climb up the rope whilst his companions anchored the other length. Reaching the top the Japanese used it as a visual signaling station. 75. Bolting the prison gate after the inmates had fled, London now recognized that the new regime in Rangoon was popular in Part 76 because it was opening some of the higher posts in government services to those who had not learned English in school, the friendly attitude towards the common people by their co-religionists the Japanese, whom they believe would raise their standard of living more so than the British had done or would do. Almost incredulously the British noted that there was no discrimination made by the Japanese between Indians and Burmans, Hindu-Muslim animosity was now not heard of in Burma 77. Izumaya Tatsuro, who was Japanese, was intimately involved with the struggle in Burma, including training the renowned 30 comrades, Aung San among them, in military warfare. As he reviewed the military situation before the war, he could only smile in anticipation. There were only 25,000 British troops. Moreover, of these, only 4,000 were truly British, there were 7,000 Indians and the rest was made up of Karens, Kachins, Gurkhas, etc. During the period of British rule, the Burmans who comprised 70% of the population, were kept at arm's length while the hill races like Karens and Kachins were used as mercenary soldiers. The empire's reliance on minorities handed the disaffected majority to Tokyo on a platter. When the war broke out, Tatsuro said with glee, the Burmese people welcomed the Japanese everywhere. The instances indeed were many. As they entered villages, there was the undisputed call of the blood that came from our being fellow Asians, and there was a feeling of intimacy. Subsequently, the Burma Independence Army like the Indian National Army fought shoulder to shoulder with Tokyo against the Empire. 78. Tokyo also had devoted considerable attention to Islam, the dominant faith in the nation that was to become Pakistan as also in Indonesia, the world's largest predominantly Muslim nation. 79 The 1943 celebration in Tokyo of the 77th birthday of Viscount Naganari Agazawara was typical. 80 A number of Muslims were present. Over the years, Agazawara had forged solid relations with Yemenis in particular whose territory was held dear by London, particularly the strategically located port of Aden. 81 The BBC acknowledged in 1942 that Tokyo's bulletins directed at Muslim audiences were good and well liked. Tokyo broadcasts in other languages draw fantastic pictures of rioting and revolution throughout the Arab countries and the Islamic world generally. 82 the colonialists' definition of subversion was peculiar. The Dutch complained that in Indonesia Japanese shopkeepers, 
under instructions from their officials, treated their native customers with a friendliness and civility. 83 Because this contrasted sharply with Dutch practices, it was viewed suspiciously. Indonesia, the world's largest predominantly Islamic nation and rich in oil and other resources, emulated the Malay Peninsula in welcoming the invaders. Patrick Hardy, in wartime service for the Japanese in Singapore, recalled driving the Indonesian national hero, Sukarno, to government house together with General Itagaki. He overheard him say he was on his way to Rangoon, no doubt to confer with pro-Tokyo forces there. 84. The Allies were aware of the close relationship between the Indonesians and Japanese. In Indonesia it was widely predicted that a government of yellow men would replace the whites in Java and would thereafter relinquish the government to the natives themselves. 85 The Australians had good reason to monitor this relationship. A most secret report in 1942 noted that there had been 10 years of Japanese penetration in the Dutch East Indies. The notorious Black Dragon Society of Japan, it said, had financed the education of some 14 students who were sent to Arabia and Egypt in 1935. This was all part of a crusade to have Tokyo proclaimed protector of Islam. The Australians could not believe that anyone would deign to treat the Indonesians courteously, scoffing at the fact that Japanese shopkeepers in Indonesia sought to treat their native clients with particular friendliness and tried to treat the native races as equal. The behavior of the Japanese was cynical, unfair, and dirty pool, the report suggested. 86. As the occupation of Indonesia continued, the empire became increasingly pessimistic about the return of their Dutch ally to power. Days before D-Day in Europe, a secret communication lamented that Japanese propaganda would appear to be effective on the Indonesians who now adopted a hostile attitude toward the Dutch. When asked why this should be, Source replied that the Indonesians considered the Dutch inefficient as they were unable to keep the Japanese out of Dutch East Indies. 87 This was a major legacy of the Japanese occupation, white supremacy or the notion of European superiority was the glue that had held colonial empires together, however, when Japan showed that this superiority was a chimera, the colonized felt cheated. They felt tricked. They were angry about what they had endured and were determined that it would not happen again even at the hands of fellow coloreds. Nevertheless, the unpopularity of the Dutch allowed the Japanese to integrate into the fabric of Indonesian society. Other than the Dutch Indonesian half-breeds, who were considered extremely anti-Japanese, much of the population, according to one study, including the overseas Chinese were relatively pro-Tokyo. The expulsion of the Eurasians and Europeans resulted in a tremendous upward rise in socio-economic status of the indigenous people. 88. The Dutch had repressed the nationalist movement in Indonesia while the Japanese worked with it and, to cite one example, considerably built up the archipelago's radio network. While the Dutch had sought to squash the Indonesian Reds, the Japanese established schools with instructors known to be close to the Communist Party that, in Ter Alia, taught classes in Marxism. Admiral Maeda of Japan and the naval intelligence officers who helped him run the school soon came to give principal emphasis to the study of communism. They stressed the need for nationalization of production but the chief emphasis of their teaching was negative, anti-imperialism and anti-capitalism being the dominant themes. Why? This may have been a way to split the PKI, the party of Indonesian communists, then allied, like communists globally, with the leading imperialists, including the Dutch, in an anti comintern alliance. 89. Decades after the war this alliance persisted. The leading Indonesianist, Benedict Anderson, found it unfathomable that in the 1960s, the Indonesian Communist Party, one of the largest in the world at the time, had rallies that feature de-anti-Western songs composed under the brutally repressive and anti-communist Japanese occupation regime of 1942-1945-90. Europeans faced similar problems in neighboring East Timor. In 1942, as the Japanese landed, a unit of about 600 troops, mostly natives, retreated to the mountains from the town without defending it and gradually disintegrated. 
Even the haughty Sir Henry Robert Moore Brooke Popham had to concede in a most secret telegram that the Portuguese young officials who were forced to flee were fascists 91 would the new colonizers from Japan be worse than them, 92. India was the heart of the empire. Indeed, there could be no empire without this massive, subcontinental nation, not only because of the wealth it generated but also because of its human capital that provided laborers, soldiers and the like throughout the empire. Not surprisingly, India was also targeted early on by Japan, though given the unpopularity of London in Delhi, Indians were courting as much as they were being courted. As early as 1912, London in a top-secret document suspected that Japanese spies were active in India. An Indian patriot, R.B. Bose, was suspected of conspiring to murder a leading British official, Bose fled to Japan. Point 93. Acknowledging that India was chafing under British Rule 94 censorship was tight. Thousands of miles away the Negro writer Lester Walton noted that London suppress ed in India all cinematic portrayals of whites thought to compromise white supremacy and colonial rule. In 99% of the films shown in India, he wrote, quoting an empire analyst in 1921, the characters are all white people. There is a white hero, a white heroine, a white evil woman and a white villain. Such scenes of the latter two shown to illiterate Indian audiences can have no other effect than to lower the prestige of the white woman and the white races in general. This moral whitewashing, wrote Walton, this attempt to hide the truth and cause East Indians to believe all Caucasians are angels robed in spotless white, is merely wasted energy 95 This cinematic distortion was not ignored by the Indians themselves. Just as war was about to explode in Europe, M.K. Gandhi dispatched a mission to Hollywood to urge American film companies to cease depicting the great Indian people as little better than savages 96. London disagreed. But a major problem for the empire was that Indians were to be found not only in South Asia but all the way from the South Pacific to Southern Africa not to mention Guyana, Trinidad and the United States itself. A wide net against subversion would have to be built as a result. Another problem was that India and Indians were the epicenter of pro-Tokyo sentiment in the empire. This was as true for the Malay Peninsula, where the Indian population was prominent in the working class, as it was for South Asia. 97. London was not dumb to this reality. In a secret transmission, that ultimately reached Delhi, the British Consul General in San Francisco reported a typical incident to Foreign Minister Anthony Eden before the onset of the war. Ram Mohan Bagai, an Indian, had arrived in San Francisco on board the Japanese ship in which he had embarked at Kobe, bringing a message from Nehru about independence 98 Bagai was an Indian in the diaspora who was close to the independence movement. 99 The reputation of these diasporans was so prominent that even Germany considered possibilities to make use of Indians residing in the United States for the Axis powers 100 Bagai, who graduated with honors from Stanford and the University of Southern California and had lived in the United States since the age of two, called British rule in India fascism. He also declared that we are Caucasians, correctly, not Asiatics 101 Bagai had to concede that Indians were colonized. Yet if people of such high status condemned British rule, what might others think? London responded by trying to stir up trouble between India and its presumed patron, Japan. When the Indian National Congress failed to make a statement condemning Japan after a Kobe mosque dispute in Tokyo, the British made an issue of it, apparently oblivious to its implications for Buddhist Muslim or Hindu Muslim relations. 102 In neighboring Afghanistan, the empire went further, cooking up propaganda material stressing the detestation of the ink for all things Japanese. This is because of rumors in this country that Congress are supporters of Japan and would welcome the Japanese in India. 103 Again, the impact on inter-ethnic relations was ignored. But even the most virulent anti-Japanese propaganda that was devised by Indians expressed its antipathy to white supremacy. 104. London had good reason to worry about Japan-India relations. 105 According to one conservative estimate, of the 60,000 Indian prisoners of war captured by Tokyo after the invasion of the Malay Peninsula, about 25,000 joined the Japanese-sponsored Indian National Army. 
many of these were Gurkhas, who had a reputation for fierce fighting. The Indian National Congress of Gandhi and Nehru exploited the INA for all it was worth in its effort to gain independence in the midst of War.106. Racial discrimination facilitated the mass defection of thousands of Indians formerly serving with the British military. Indian officers were not admitted as members of a large number of clubs in Malaya, wrote Shah Nawaz Khan, an officer of the 14th Punjab Regiment who later led an INA brigade against the British in Burma. There was an order by the railway authorities of the Federated Malay States that an Asiatic could not travel in the same compartment as a European, and the fact that both held the same rank and belonged to the same unit did not seem to matter in this respect. Lt. Col. Mahmud Khan Duraini, later decorated by the Viceroy of India with the George Cross for resisting Japanese torture, made the same point. Such resentment was nurtured by Tokyo.107. Tokyo made great strides in quickly winning over sizable portions of the Indian and Malay populations. 108 The anti Tokyo chiefs were disproportionately made up of communist leaders of Chinese origin who had been founded by the British before the war, and who were deserted by their former British allies soon after the war ended. Indians from other parts of the world also organized anti British activities. 109 In April 1943, there was a major conference of Indians in the Disipora in Tokyo with representatives from Thailand, Japan, Manchuria, Borneo, and Celebs, Sumatra, Philippines, China, Indochina and Andamans, along with Malaya. The conference denounced the empire's policies of jailing of leaders and repression. A leading Japanese military man in contrast stressed that through cultural relations and Buddhism, we, Nipponese have had traditional respect and affection for India for more than 2,000 years and it has indeed been unbearable to us to see the present slavery that India is undergoing under the rule of Great Britain 110 for their part, representatives of the India Independence League enumerated the sins committed by the empire, not least the fact that it had exterminated the entire aboriginal races of America and Australia to make room for themselves. 111 later they scoffed at the Atlantic Charter, since it leaves out of its scope countries like India. It was no more than a fresh lease for Asiatic slavery, they jibed. They contrasted it with the Tokyo-backed Greater East Asia Assembly with its insistence on the elimination of racial discrimination 112. The human touch, alien to white supremacy, helped to win over many Indians. Fujiwara Iwaichi of the Japanese forces was struck when he ate Indian dishes with an Indian officer after his surrender, and was told, I cannot think of an occasion when Indian officers have ever had dinner together with British officers with whom we have fought side by side. Despite our firm request that Indian dishes be put on the menu at the officers club, it was turned down by the British Army. This Japanese major, serving in intelligence, played a pivotal role in the founding of the INA and remained a hero in India years later. 113. But the greatest hero for defecting Indians was Subhas Chandra Bose. The Indian writer P. A. Narasimhamurthy is not alone in observing the only other leader who equaled, even surpassed him in impressing the younger minds was Jawaharlal Nehru even today despite his fighting shoulder to shoulder with Japanese forces in Burma against the British Empire and their allies. 114 Bose was not alone. After the seizure of Hong Kong, the Inc. was grappling with the question of whether it should ally with India's colonial oppressor, London. In a confidential draft the Inc. wrestled with the fact that the Empire was determined to maintain and intensify their imperialist hold and exploitation of the Indian people. How could Indians back London when the whole background in India is one of deep-rooted hostility and distrust of the British government? 115. Bose was extremely friendly with local communists despite their hostility toward Tokyo and support for the Allies during the war. It would be utterly wrong, says Gautam Chattopadhyay, to see him and by implication other victims of white supremacy as a kind of quizzling of the Axis powers. There was his refusal to fight the Soviet Union or the Burmans who turned against Japan in 1945. Chattopadhyay argues that Aung San in Burma, so E. Karno. In Indonesia, in fact all anti-imperialist leaders of Southeast Asia with the solitary exception of Ho Chi Minh followed Bose's strategy. 116. 
Bose's strategy included a powerful appeal to Indians scattered throughout Southeast Asia. The empire knew that the pro-Tokyo so-called Indian National Army had an estimated strength of force in Malaya of 16,000-20,000. Tamil civilians recruited in Malaya predominate. The Tamils, who played a key role in both South India and Ceylon, were often bitterly hostile to the empire. 117. Tamils and other Indians predominated in the army that was sworn to uphold the empire in Asia, which presented a problem that resonated even after the end of the war. Weeks after the bombing of Hiroshima a secret report from the Intelligence Bureau in India noted the proliferation of Indians taking exception to the Indian National Congress's repeated assertion that Subhas Bose and his followers were misguided in seeking Japanese aid. Bose was merely using the Japanese as his tools, said one Indian, just as the British employ coloured troops to fight their battles for them. In India, the almost universally expressed view has been that Bose and his Ina although misguided in hoping to obtain freedom through Japanese help acted with the highest motives of freedom. From this follows on an equally widespread demand, supported by almost all shades of Indian opinion, for extreme leniency toward the Ina, a sentiment that could hardly be ignored. 118. Damodran K. Kesvan of Malaya, born in Kerala, India, in 1918 was among the many who joined the Indian National Army, INA, early on. While interviewed in 1981, he still recalled the Japanese phrase Aji, Ajino, Asia. Asia for Asians that was their slogan. Kesvan, suitably impressed, collaborated closely with the Japanese during the occupation and even learned the language. The language construction, he said, was just like our Indian language construction of sentences and everything just like our Indian language. The Japanese-speaking Kesvan joined the big crowd that assembled in our streets when Tojo arrived. He was also part of the throngs that greeted Subhas Chandra Bose when he arrived in Singapore. It was raining and Bose was offered an umbrella. Brushing it aside, he inquired, can you provide an umbrella for all these people? The crowd was visibly moved by his altruism, as Bose switched effortlessly between English and Hindi. When asked if the Japanese had encouraged him to join the INA, he was forthright, no. 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 Never. Never. He was not alone, as INA ranks were flooded with engineers. And all professional groups. There was a full cross-section of the Indian population in the INA, the whole of India was represented. Nobody was concerned about the religious feelings of the others. There were more Sikhs than others but then they formed the bulk of the preoccupation army. All of his relatives joined, since, unlike the British, we felt a sense of dignity and freedom from the Japanese 119. K. M. Rengaraju, born in 1915, also recalled vividly that rainy rally with Bose in Singapore. Sheets of precipitation were falling but not a single soul moved. He too agreed that there were Indians from all walks of life, including a lot of wealthy Indians. The Indian Muslim was giving full support too, though they couldn't get the approval of the Japanese higher authority to form a separate organization. The residents of Bose when he visited Singapore, at Meyer Road No. 61 became a veritable shrine, despite or perhaps because of his fervent stand against the empire. 120. Narayana Karupia was born in India in 1925, he too joined the INA and studied Japanese and was a devotee of Subhas Chandra Bose, comparing him equally to Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew. Had he been alive, and had he reached India, Nehru would not have become the Prime Minister. Definitely. Nehru would have been the Foreign Minister. When he met with Bose one day in Singapore, Bose advised him to go to Tokyo for advanced training. He did so. But on the day he arrived a day on which Bose happened to be in town the United States bombed. We surrounded him, so that even if there were any bomb, the shrapnel wouldn't hit him. It did not and Bose went on to address a rally of thousands in Hibiya Park in Tokyo. Kurupia was quick to point out that the INA training in Japan was paid for by Indians themselves everything, he insisted. Contrary to London's claims, Japan did not do anything, not even a single cent for us. 
At the military academy in Tokyo, there were also students from Thailand, Burma, Manchuria, Machiko, Philippines, Singapore, and Indians 121. Despite the transparent reasons why Indians and others deserted the empire at its moment of need in Singapore, some Britishers had difficulty coming to grips with this reality. Sir Henry Robert Moore Brooke Popham, writing from the safety of Australia in 1942, pointed to the low morale of Indian troops as a prime cause of the failure in Malaya. This, he snorted, was due to the Eastern races being less able to withstand the strain of modern war. On the other hand, he thought that special mention is due to the white population for devotion to duty 122. The Indian diaspora presented complications for the empire beyond the Malay Peninsula. In 1943, a confidential message to the future Prime Minister, Clement Attlee, reported that although there were only 2547 souls among the Indians in S. Rhodesia, they still created an Indian problem. The set aside of a residential area for the Asiatic S in one capital neighborhood was rejected by Europeans in Belvedere, since the reserved area was too close for comfort. 123 As in southern Africa, a similar dilemma confronted the empire in the South Pacific. According to a New Zealand analyst, during the Pacific War when Europeans and indigenous Fijians supplied all possible manpower against the Japanese, the Fijian Indian community did absolutely nothing only a handful of Indians engaged in non-combatant units 124. London had to be concerned about this growing estrangement and disaffection within the broader Indian diaspora, particularly in Africa, which provided tens of thousands of troops for the empire. By early 1945 the colonial office was taking worried note of the known attitude on racial relations of the white communities of the Union of South Africa, Southern Rhodesia, and Kenya Colony. One clear reason was the fierce opposition to this attitude by Indians who often faced discrimination in all three nations. The Indians, the colonial office said, have now come to regard the European communities from the Cape to Ethiopia as a block endangering the Indians' political welfare and other interests 125. Then there was nagging fear about the Indians of British China. U.S. intelligence in a restricted report in 1944 anxiously noted that the Indians there largely belong to the Sikh community. A revolutionary movement, dating from the years of the last war, fed by resentment against the British and influenced by Chinese nationalist activities, flourished in Shanghai. In fact, Japan was the center of Indian nationalist activities in Eastern Asia. It is probable that few Indians would have been found to prefer British to Japanese domination. The report described Subhas Chandra Bose as a former Congress president with a large following in India, an able leader, widely considered to be a sincere patriot. Even before the war there were Gedru, revolution, societies, affiliated with similar organizations on the west coast of the United States and elsewhere, which conspired for the overthrow of the British government in India. Like other coloreds, Indians generally looked to Japan as the leader of Asia, the report said. The sympathy of this U.S. report for Indians languishing under British colonialism in Asia could only be of somber concern to London. 126. Of course, the empire had its own worries about Indians in China and the Chinese in India. In 1944 it was noted that no Indians were interned at Shanghai and they were not required to wear armbands. The Free India Movement frequently held parades at the racecourse which invariably degenerated into anti-British demonstrations. British political prisoners in Warm Road Jail were roughly treated by the Indian guards. The Indian population on the whole were anti-British and they assisted the Japanese to the best of their ability. 127 A high-level Japanese official confirmed that representatives from the Indian community in Hong Kong participated in many strategy sessions in Tokyo during the war. 128. Though nationalist China was supposedly an ally of the empire, London was also concerned about the migration of Chinese to what it deemed its turf. In 1944 Britain's Chungking legation observed that our information, such as it is, does not in general support the theory of Chinese colonization. That was something of a relief, given China's huge population, but they could not ignore that Chinese schools in India cater only for a small number of Chinese children. 
there was a troubling increase in restaurants under Chinese management, though it was evident that this was due to their popularity with the British and armed forces. But that was small beer compared to Chinese banking activities which may perhaps have more significance 129. Overall there was a marked increase in Chinese activity in India since the war had commenced. There were seamen and deserters and evacuees, consular activity and intelligence, remittances and trade. This secret report did believe that Chinese colonization in India has begun and was being encouraged by the nationalists, which was of even more concern given that their government had more than one pro-Tokyo sympathizer. 130 Yet how could the empire complain about supposed Chinese colonialism in India no matter how real or imaginary unless colonialism was only to be practiced by those of pure European descent? U.S. intelligence had different concerns. It was studying the notion that the growth of nationalism in the Far East was driven in different ways by London and Tokyo. As early as the 1920s, Washington observed the formation of the Asiatic Society in Japan, an organization constituted by the Japanese in their efforts to excite race hatred. By using the immigration exclusion law as an argument for the union of Asiatic races. Indians were essential to the formation of this grouping, according to a confidential report. Its purpose was the reawakening of all Asiatics against the white peoples of the world and the unity of Asiatic nations. The feared ultra-patriotic Black Dragon Society of Japan was integral to this organization, which was determined to move against white despotism and their arrogance toward Oriental nations 131 when in 1943 a large assemblage of Asian nationals including a sizable number of Indians met in Tokyo to work for the abolition of racial discrimination, U.S. intelligence's fears were confirmed. 132. Yet for all the upset caused by the Indians of Malaya, Singapore, Africa, and China, it was the Indians in India itself who posed the biggest headache for the empire. L. H. Landon of the empire's military discovered this to his dismay. As the war commenced, he was on holiday in eastern India. When we broached the subject of resistance to the Japs sick, their answer was always the same. Random Indians would remark generally, a hundred years ago we were a warlike nation. Causing you to send in an army to pacify us. But in the last hundred years we have learned the art of peace, you have allowed us no new weapons or warlike activity we are no longer a fighting race. Yet you ask us, with our spears and muzzle loaders, to resist the Japsic army, while you, with your tanks and aeroplanes and guns and modern equipment and training, are now fleeing before these same Japsic out of Burma. Landon found this to be a reasonable and unanswerable argument 133 It was hard to convince Indians after decades of warping colonialism that they should align with the devil they knew, rather than the one they didn't. Japanese propaganda stressed the obvious underdevelopment brought about by London, telling the Gurkhas whom the empire relied on heavily that they were merely a soldier slave to the British. 134 Apparently such appeals were effective. A secret report revealed that Gurkhas were working with Japanese forces in northern India. 135 A BBC directed private and confidential review of Japanese broadcast propaganda noted that in the pre war era, Japanese radio broadcasts in Hindi were one of the chief mouthpieces for the Indian independence movement. The reviewers were struck by the fact that most evils of the Far East are attributed to capitalism, and capitalism is suggested regularly to listeners as a purely British and American system. Just as some European CONF laded opposition to the status quo with communism, Tokyo a capitalist nation for sure often slyly CONF laded the status quo with capitalism. In this way, Tokyo added its voice to Moscow's, at a time when the Great Depression was in full swing. The old-time religion of anti-white supremacy rhetoric was not absent either. As late as September 1940, Japanese broadcasts in Hindi were reassuring Indian listeners that Japan has no intention to subjugate China but to free China from white domination. Looking to the future, Tokyo also sought to devote considerable attention to reaching child audiences overseas. 136 The effectiveness of this anti London propaganda became clear when the Quit India movement, consisting of huge strikes and the like, was launched against the British in the midst of the war. In a secret telegram, 
London feared that it was originally timed to coincide with the end of the rains and the moment most favorable for a Japanese attack on India 137. The rhetoric emanating from the All India Congress Committee routinely referred to the colonizers as the usurper government. What about the real prospect of Japanese invaders, the Indians were repeatedly asked. Should not the Quit India movement be postponed until this threat had passed? This was in October 1942 when a Japanese invasion appeared imminent. But the AICC would not retreat. Some mealy-mouthed and chicken-hearted people, it replied, will, of course, suggest that the fight for freedom in such a situation be given up. This is a council sick of despair and slavery. To the contrary, there is greater reason for us to further intensify our fight for freedom in the event of a new invasion 138. The fall of Rangoon, specifically the way in which it was evacuated, may have given Indian patriots added encouragement during the Quit India movement. The British evacuated all their men using all available modes of transportation and had literally abandoned the Indians there. Many Indians escaped to India and complained bitterly about their sense of betrayal, thereby inflaming public opinion. 139. As the empire braced for an invasion of India, Washington bound in an alliance with the tottering London grew ever more concerned. A small but well-placed Indian-American community was also sending troubling signals to the White House. Rev. Swami Prabhavananda of Los Angeles wrote that his nephew, a British Indian subject, had come to the United States for higher education. Now he was being drafted. The Swami wanted to know the cause for which he has been asked to go to war. He cannot say to fight for the cause of freedom, for the people of India have not even the right to wish for freedom. 140 The White House had difficulty in responding. M.K. Gandhi told President Franklin D. Roosevelt in early July 1942, the Allied declaration that the Allies are fighting to make the world safe for freedom of the individual and for democracy sounds hollow so long as India and, for that matter, Africa are exploited by Great Britain and America has the Negro problem in her own home 141 These words, which echoed the line coming from Tokyo, said more about London's anomalous position of fighting a war ostensibly for democracy and freedom while denying hundreds of millions of Indians the same. India was of great strategic importance during the war. Vice President Henry A. Wallace stated correctly as the Quit India movement was unfolding that India was the key to the Allies' strategy of defeating Japan. For only via India alone could the Allies supply or spark the recovery of Burma. It was the Allies' only industrial plant between Great Britain and Australia 142. Among the many reasons for the developing rift between London and Washington, the question of India was certainly one. The rising power also naturally wished to replace the waning one. Washington questioned London's stranglehold over huge markets in the empire through the device of preference. And many in the United States wondered whether their ultimate sacrifice was simply designed to preserve the empire. These strains and tensions came to a head in India where FDR's personal representative, William Phillips, criticized Winston Churchill, who he said, gives the impression that personally he would prefer not to transfer any power to an Indian government either before or after the war and that the status quo should be maintained. But this was incompatible with the Atlantic Charter, which has given the Indian movement great impetus, a new idea was afoot and sweeping the world, namely, freedom for oppressed peoples 143 How could the Allies confront Japan effectively while allowing tiny, white, Britain to rule over huge, colored, India? Phillips, the U.S. emissary, grew increasingly critical of the empire with every passing day. He found increasing anti-British sentiment in India and with good reason. Mysore had rubber but was not permitted to produce automobile tires, as it was turned over to the Dunlop Tire Company, British owned. Indians thought justifiably that the British did not welcome full development of their nation due to competition. Everywhere he went in India, he found a feeling of frustration, discouragement and helplessness 144 India appeared about to fall into the hands of Tokyo. In April 1943, as the whole world seemed riveted on a battle to the death between the Axis and the Allies, Phillips found very little thought given to the war among Indians. 
they felt they have nothing to fight for. Churchill's exclusion of India from the principles of the Atlantic Charter is always referred to in this connection. 20,000 Indian National Congress leaders remain in jail without trial and the influence, therefore, of the Congress party is diminishing while that of the Muslim League is growing. This set the stage for the internecine conflict that gripped the subcontinent and ultimately led to the birth of the predominantly Muslim state of Pakistan. Worse, as other diplomats had found in Malaya and Thailand, Phillips concluded that it is hard to discover, either in Delhi or in other parts of India, any pronounced war spirit against Japan, even on the part of the British. Indians were ignoring the high-flown rhetoric of the Allies and coming more and more to disbelieve in the American gospel of freedom of oppressed peoples. They had found a friend across the border in China, as Chinese apathy and lack of leadership and, moreover, Chinese dislike of the British, meet a wholly responsive court in India. Phillips reported that color consciousness is growing more and more, along with a vast block of Oriental peoples who have many things in common, including a growing dislike and distrust of the Occidental 145. Privately, the US president was being told that there was ample reason for Indian alienation. They had been drawn into the war without the formality of consulting Indian leaders or even the Indian legislature. Quite naturally, he thought, they felt the Allies were fighting only for the benefit of the white races, as Tokyo had long said. The Indians fighting for the empire were doing so for purely mercenary reasons. They suffered from poor morale, that was only exceeded by the attitude of the general public. By May 1943 lassitude and indifference and bitterness had increased. Yet when Washington raised these issues with London, it replied, this is none of your business. But the United States was carrying the major burden of the war and saw little reason not to question the empire's policies. Though the empire may have been oblivious, Roosevelt's man detected growing anti-white sentiments of hundreds of millions. The mighty peoples of Asia and he was supported in this opinion by other diplomatic and military observers had begun to cynically regard this war as one between fascist and imperialist powers 146. Phillips's words were reflected in increasing disillusionment in the United States with the idea of empire, stemming from the prospect of losing India to a Japanese antagonist whose racial appeals were resonating loudly throughout Asia. One of the major tragedies no, crimes of the war took place in this pivotal year, 1943, the famine in Bengal, which claimed the lives of tens of thousands. Anti-empire sentiment was strong in Bengal. It was always a site of unrest and the famine had led to much increased evidence of pro-Japanese sympathy among the peasants who are said to be hopeful of a Japanese invasion in the belief that the Japanese would bring them rice from Burma 147 The famine did not quell pro-Tokyo sentiment in Bengal. Phillips's blistering condemnation of the empire did not go down well in London. It is unclear if this UK anger might have had anything to do with the fact that one of his confidential letters to FDR was leaked and disseminated in the press, along with the equally mysterious publication of a cable from Delhi alleging that he was a persona non grata 148 however that may be, Phillips's views reflected a growing consensus in the United States that the empire, as constituted, was unsustainable, and certainly should not be supported at the cost of US lives and resources. The respected writer, Pearl Buck, was typical of this trend. India, she told Eleanor Roosevelt, was so filled with bitterness against the English that we must look for revengeful massacres against all white people on a scale much greater than have taken place in Malaya and Burma. This I know. US troops in India, she predicted, must be prepared for a revenge which may fall upon them, too only because they are helping white men whom the Indians hate. She considered her letter so explosive that she went to extraordinary lengths to ensure that only the Roosevelts read it. I am typing it myself so that I have no copy. Please destroy it when you are finished with it. The president told his spouse, you can tell Pearl Buck that I have read her letter. With real interest. I am keeping her letter in my files. 149. Washington promptly embarked on a massive counter-offensive both to distinguish itself from London and to present its best face to Asians, particularly Indians. 
the president was told in the spring of 1942 that Japanese American troops should be sent to strategic ports of India for counter propaganda against Tokyo and its Indian allies. This would be more effective than an Anglo Saxon Appeal 150. Of course, U.S. criticism of the empire was not new, considering that it was born in revolt against London. A quarter of a century before the Pacific War, Secretary of State William Jennings Bryan had written, British rule in India is far worse, far more burdensome to the people, and far more unjust. Than I had supposed. 151 But the hothouse of war had exacerbated tensions. It was not only the empire's inflexibility on the color bar abroad that disappointed Washington. There was even greater concern about the effect of the sterling bloc on Anglo-American Indian relations, as a serious source of Anglo-American Indian friction 152 this was good for Britain, bad for the United States. Nor was this closed system of trade and currency good for the colonies either here the interests of these colonies and Washington and, ironically, Tokyo converged, for destroying preference was an aim shared by the United States, Japan and India. As it stood, the empire was in dire need of radical reform, particularly in the financial realm. Thus, through means subtle and blunt, the United States accelerated the delicate process of disentangling itself from its erstwhile ally, Britain. Early in 1944 an aide to FDR was preparing a statement for him on Japan. The words Japanese occupied should be substituted for the word colonial since the expression colonial territory would be offensive to the Burmese and play into the hands of the Japanese propaganda ministry suggesting that Japan be expelled from colonial territory, in other words, might imply the return of the much despised British, intimation of which would be a propaganda coup for Tokyo.153. Yet with all the concern about Japanese influence in traditionally British spheres of influence, those at 10 Downing Street appeared oblivious to the undercurrents of the situation. In August 1942, as the Quit India movement gathered speed in India, Churchill told Roosevelt that you could remind Chang that Gandhi was prepared to negotiate with Japan on the basis of free passage for Japanese troops through India 154 the Prime Minister appeared to overlook the fact that Chang himself was not estranged from Tokyo. So why would linking Gandhi to Japan cause alarm in Chungking? This was the dilemma for the empire, by inflicting the color bar on Asia it had alienated Asians. This did not bode well for the future of the empire. However, moving away from the system of racial preference would have been met with hostility by the legions of third raiders from Britain who sustained the empire in Asia. In addition, the Communist Party of India like its counterpart in the United States 155 was keen to back the Allies, particularly after the German attack on the USSR in June 1941. But most Indians were not keen to provide succor to the British. Thus, the party condemned the August 1942 rising in India as folly and had extreme difficulty explaining its opposition to Bose. The party, said one contemporary observer, was in an uncomfortable position of appearing to back the government against the patriots. When Congress leaders were arrested in 1942, the vociferous tendencies were worsened, leading to the splitting of India and the creation of Pakistan. In sum, the events set in motion by Japan's race crusade were of incalculable consequence. 156. Yet, as many Singaporeans acknowledged, the invasion of the empire by Japan with all its brutality and death spelled doom for British colonialism in Asia. Certainly it guaranteed that the post-war world would face substantially different racial realities than those that obtained before 1941. 9. Race at War of the nearly 500,000 men in the U.S. Army in 1940, only 4,700 were Negroes, all serving in segregated units. Black officers could be counted on one hand three chaplains, a colonel, and a captain. The Navy allowed Negroes to enlist only as messmen. The Marines and the Air Corps excluded Negroes completely. In the most notorious example of this system of racism, blood stored for the wounded was also segregated. Point one Negroes were largely excluded from the Naval Training Academy at Annapolis, Maryland. 
the Bureau of Naval Personnel believed that the Negroes' relative unfamiliarity with the sea gave them a consequent fear of water too conveniently this also fed into stereotypes about Negroes' alleged unfamiliarity with bathing and the resultant odors they were said to emit. This was not the optimal armed force with which the United States would be forced to engage Japan in a race war. If nothing else, it allowed Tokyo to make special appeals to those Negroes who would have to be conscripted and dragooned in order to meet this unique challenge. U.S. national security could be severely threatened. Closing the racial gap between black and white was, as a consequence, not a matter of benevolent and idealistic altruism but that of tough-minded and hard-headed calculation. Thus, the largest number of black POWs were located in the Philippines. There were 20 among the more than 2,000 POWs from the Los Banos camp. Freed black prisoners told how they were offered better treatment by the Japanese in exchange for cooperation in an anti-white campaign. Three even before their capture, Negro troops seemed to be favored. When a troop transport being fired upon by Japanese was found to contain Negroes. Thereupon the Japanese ceased their firing and took the Negroes aboard the ship. The FBI, known to pamper white supremacists, conceded angrily that the Japanese attempted to gain favor among the Negroes through fraternization and increased friendliness for. Yet what may have angered the FBI was the fact that the urgencies of war compelled a halting retreat from white supremacy. In the Philippines there was a fight between white and colored internees in one camp. During the normalcy of peacetime, this might have led to the lynching of the latter, though it was sparked by an anti-Negro racial slur. But now there was worry that the Japanese captors might hear of it and use it as yet another example of U.S. race prejudice. Thus, a trial was duly held and both men were given 60 days probation 5. Racial segregation repeatedly provided added ammunition figuratively, perhaps literally for Tokyo, but like a heroin addict who could not resist an injection, London and Washington found it difficult to dump age-old policies although their survival was at stake. Walter White of the NAACP was dumbfounded to discover that white American troops in the United Kingdom had told the townspeople that Negroes had tails, that they were illiterate, that their color was due to disease. Correspondingly, when Negro troops spoke of the enemy, they referred not to the Nazis across the channel but to their white fellow Americans. Tokyo responded with glee, see what the United States does to its own colored people, this is the way you colored people of the world will be treated if the Allied nations win the war, Six White confirmed Tokyo's belief when in June 1942 he pointed to disturbing rumors from the Orient of Southern soldiers treating Indians and Chinese as they are accustomed to treat with impunity Negroes in darkest Mississippi seven long-standing behavior patterns that mandated that those not of pure European descent should be accorded inferior treatment could not be reversed quickly just because a worldwide war was raging. Even efforts to reverse these patterns often seemed to confirm Tokyo's propaganda. In February 1945 many senior white staff officers in the 93rd Infantry Division received a pamphlet entitled You and the Native, prepared by the command of General Douglas MacArthur. Drawing upon a seductive pseudoscientific racism, the document suggested that Asians displayed the characteristics of children, the Native has always looked up to the white man. He admires him because of the marvelous things that white men at large can do make electric torches, fly airplanes, etc. He is also rather afraid of the white men, with all the power of their civilization behind them. Therefore he is afraid of you. The soldier is advised to meet with the native, but as an adult with a child. Don't forget to maintain your position or pose of superiority even if you sometimes have doubts about it. 8. Even the anti-fascist Asian could be excused for concluding that this pamphlet was no more than a recruiting broadside for Tokyo. Walter White could only confess to the bewilderment created throughout the Pacific by the prejudice of some American white soldiers and their attempt to spread race hatred 9 he recalled encountering a white soldier from Mississippi playing with a group of dark-skinned children in Guam. White asked him if he would do the same at home and was told, these kids are not niggers 10. Such episodes were not conducive to the military's morale or Negroes fighting spirit. In Dutch New Guinea there were complaints that Negro soldiers did not want to fight the Japanese, cutting and running when they appeared. 
White investigated and was hesitant to help those who were skeptical of Negroes' ability to hold their own on the battlefield. Still, he conceded reluctantly that some Negroes were breaking under fire, retreating to safety. 11 The alleged unreliability of Negro troops, a highly sensitive matter, was of great concern to Secretary of War Henry L. Stimson. 12 Reports trickling in from the South Pacific confirmed White's perception that Negro troops were not altogether enthusiastic about the war they were fighting. The commanding general of the 93RD Infantry Division was told that there was a marked resentment of various kinds among the men. Some resent being in the war at all. They say it is a white man's war and when things are over the Negroes at home will be worse off than before. 13 A Negro soldier in the dreary forests and mountains of Dutch New Guinea may have been the author of those encapsulating words of the black experience during the Pacific War, just carve on my tombstone, here lies a black man killed fighting a yellow man for the protection of the white man. To be fair, Negroes were not the only ones with grave doubts about the Pacific War. A Native American said of his people, they feel that this country was taken away from them by white men and for that reason they should not now be required to help in case of invasion or attack. A Native American soldier recounted that in Okinawa. I was almost shot by soldiers on my own side who mistook me for the enemy when I came out of a cave. One of my white buddies came out just in time to save me. One of his so-called comrades shouted at him, Get out of there, you damn Jap sick, 14. Goaded and prompted, the United States took extraordinary measures to combat a white supremacy that previously had been accepted as virtually God-given. Special anti-racist films were made, and pamphlets intended to indoctrinate soldiers in the new and developing anti-racist consensus were made obligatory by the press of War.15. The Japanese were not standing still as the United States moved to reform its centuries-long policies on race. A Japanese prisoner of war captured in the Philippines began to read material that would later be characterized as Afrocentric. He was taken by the points made about the racial superiority of blacks though he could not readily agree with this fanatical author, but belonging as I do to a race that the world regards as second class, I applaud his frontal attack on racial prejudice. No doubt it was because of the damage my own racial self-esteem had suffered that I was so drawn to pictures of blacks in the magazines I read. He became even more sympathetic toward Negroes when he saw how Negro prisoners were treated by the Euro-Americans they encountered. He asked a Euro-American guard what he thought of his compatriots, Negroes. Niggers are cowards in combat, the guard snarled and I'm betting we'll have all kinds of trouble with them once this war is over because we buttered them up so much in the services. He was struck by the stark contrasts between the two groups of U.S. citizens, for at the camp Negroes whatever their status, the manner in which they went mutely about their work with their eyes to the ground contrasted sharply with the free and easy manner of the white men I had seen. In essence, he concluded sadly, in a chilling reminder of the fate he thought he had eluded by waging war, they still acted like slaves 16. But it would take more than anti-racism on paper and celluloid to reverse centuries of white supremacy. In the spring of 1944 as the war dragged on, Brigadier General Leonard Russell Boyd who had oversight of Negro troops in the South Pacific, conceded that the very structure of racial segregation hampered unit cohesion and battlefield readiness. Our officer problems are multiplied by having mixed white and Negro officers in the same companies, however, we never place whites under colored officers in accordance with directed policy. But just as the irreligious often discovered the deity as bullets whizzed past their heads, General Boyd found that racial problems are no problem during actual combat. Here we have died in the wool southerners sleeping in the same two-man foxhole with colored officers and there is no friction. 17. General Boyd may have been over-optimistic, for throughout the war there were sharp interracial tensions in the military. At times those two-man foxholes were a picture of mortal combat though Japan was not the target. Not atypical was a riot that rocked a naval ammunitions depot in June 1943. The following month more than 700 Negroes of the 80th Construction Battalion staged a protest over segregation aboard the transport that was carrying them to their duty station in the Caribbean, where they would have encountered further antipathy toward the Empire. Guam, a frequent site of battles with Japan, 
was also a site of frequent conflict between white marines and black sailors. Over relations with local women. Sailors began to arm themselves illicitly with rifles and knives, 18 as the Japanese adversary sat back contentedly. But Japan knew that the racial segregation practiced so assiduously by its adversaries was like adding a fully armed battalion to Tokyo's already well-armed forces. It kept close tabs on the subject, methodically filing documentation on influential Negro leaders today, Dubois was listed as an intellectual leader, important Negro publications, 19 discrimination against colored seamen, and information on the double V campaign against fascism abroad and at home spearheaded by the black press. Details on black troops were collected as well, including the names and ranks of officers, along with the racial breakdown of various U.S. states information that might prove helpful in case the mainland had to be invaded. Tokyo also kept records about the sizable and growing black population of Liverpool. Tokyo had data on Negro illiteracy, death rates, occupational status, education, and population. Tokyo took note of an editorial underscoring that examples of race discrimination in the U.S. are being used by Axis radio propaganda to weaken the will of Negro troops. In the Southwest Pacific and Africa. No doubt Japanese leaders were happy to see their radio broadcasts being cited in the U.S. press, for example, when they told their listeners FDR stated recently that he was against race discrimination. One might ask the president why he was segregating Negroes. 20. Part of the problem was, again, that Negro soldiers like Negro civilians back home had doubts not only about their white fellow citizens but also about their Chinese allies. The well-respected black publisher and writer, Charlotta Base of Los Angeles, questioned Madame Chiang Kai-shek when the latter visited Los Angeles in the spring of 1943. When Base asked her about her country's attitude toward race prejudice as practiced in the United States, she was disconcerted by Madame Chiang Kai-shek's response, Base had no idea that such a question would rebound so unfavorably. But it brought the creamy little lady to her feet instantly and she beat a hasty retreat. On the way out she mumbled, that is a national question. 21. Base was particularly shocked as reports of the Chinese visitor being harassed during her tour of the South were well known. Moreover, unlike Japan in the aftermath of World War I, China lost considerable black support when it seemed less enthusiastic than Japan in pushing for a racial equality proviso in the post-war dispensation. This was consistent with other reports about Chinese attempts to keep Negro troops out of China. 22 There were frequent complaints about Jim Crow by the Chinese army and anti-racial attitudes against Negro soldiers. As a result these qualms were conflated with pre-existing questions about Chinese Americans creating a bog of suspicion. As one Negro put it, I've noticed some of the Chinese restaurant and laundry owners in Harlem. They play dumb when you mention community problems, pretend that they are white when the word race is mentioned, and yet they'll ask us to support such deserving drives as the Chinese relief, etc. 23 black San Franciscans had to contend with numerous derogatory references to themselves in local Chinese newspapers. 24. Many Chinese were reluctant to identify with Negroes, who waged a two-front campaign against racism abroad and at home. In so doing, they chose to ignore the clear parallels between their plight and that of their darker brethren, which was revealed appropriately enough by one Harry S. Truman, I think one man is as good as another so long as he's honest and decent and not a nigger or a Chinaman. Uncle Will says that the Lord made a white man out of dust, a nigger from mud, then threw up what was left and it came down a Chinaman. He does hate Chinese and Japs sick. So do I. It is race prejudice I guess. But I am strongly of the opinion that Negroes ought to be in Africa, yellow men in Asia, and white men in Europe and America. 25. At bottom, Negroes believed that the racial animus directed at Japanese soldiers and civilians alike was similar to their own experience and to what might await them once the war ended. This too was extremely demoralizing. To the black press, 
the tendency of U.S. troops to keep as trophies the teeth and bones of dead Japanese soldiers was a macabre replay of what had happened to the victims of lynching in the South Point 26 when the scalps of Japanese soldiers were taken and displayed as triumphant prizes, others recalled the recent decimation of Native Americans.27. In 1944 Adolf Newton of the U.S. Navy found himself on board a ship in the Philippines. This Negro saw the body of a Japanese pilot lying on the deck behind the cockpit, and was stupefied when he noticed that white fellows started to curse him, then someone pulled out a dirk and plunged the blade into the lifeless body, then more people began to stab the body. He was bothered by the way they treated the body. Not only did they stab it repeatedly, but someone pulled the teeth from the body, and they called him awful names. I stood there and wondered if they would do that to me. From somewhere came the answer, yes. It all reminded me of the pictures I had seen of the lynching of Negroes in the southern part of the United States. Newton had just sailed from San Diego where he saw signs in almost every window with the words no colored allowed. On board he had endured conflicts with his fellow sailors who continually played boring hillbilly records, while he liked jazz. The pummeling of a Japanese corpse was just one more reminder to him that fighting a race war alongside whites ineluctably led to tensions.28. Japan was aware of the cruelty with which its troops were treated, and like Negro soldiers, it too connected this to white supremacy. Symbolizing the zenith of 20th century American barbarism, it reported, is the grim picture of President Roosevelt at his huge desk in the White House fondling a letter opener made from the forearm of a Japanese soldier. This was akin to the American brutality and atrocity as shown in their lynchings and other discriminations committed against innocent Negroes. This meant that the peoples living in East Asiatic countries will not be exempted from falling prey to American mob psychology and sacrificed upon the altar of American barbarism if the enemy should win the war. 29 This barbaric conduct of the American fighting forces is not so very surprising when one realizes that the personnel is selected from people who are characteristically capable of such shocking cruelty as lynching a fellow citizen for no other reason than being of a different color. 30. Japanese propaganda made much of racial prejudice in the United States. When in 1942 thousands of Negroes protested in Manhattan against job discrimination, the pro-Tokyo Hong Kong News asserted sarcastically, it would be a good thing if President Roosevelt, before proclaiming his beliefs concerning nations outside the United States, would first put his principles into practice at home. 31 This was part of a barrage of propaganda in Japanese news media during the war, roaring about the ugly reality of U.S. racism. Naturally they focused on the sorry situation of the Negro soldier. An editorial found something tragic about the plight of the Negro soldiers in the American army who are being forced to fight on the side of injustice, gross discrimination, and tyranny against the very forces which are working to wipe these things out of the world. To be born black or brown or any other color but white, it said has always been considered an unpardonable sin by the American people. 32 When U.S. Negro soldiers were involved in race riots that spread to Britain, it made front-page headlines. 33 With thinly concealed ridicule. 34 The Hong Kong News observed that it has been customary for the American politicians to mistreat and exploit the Negroes during peacetime and draft them as soldiers in case of war by offering them empty promises in order to fill up the dearth of labor power and fighting force. 35. The lamentable lot of Negro civilians came in for censure. Negroes and whites clash in Detroit was one gripping headline in 1943.36 This clash was said to be a prelude to wholesale Negro-white wars in the United States.37 When the eminent Negro jurist, William Hasty, was barred from the National Press Club in Washington for racial reasons, the Hong Kong News seemed even more outraged than he was. 38 When the notorious Senator Theodore Bilbo of Mississippi advocated removal of Negroes from the U.S., he was said by Japan to have declared war on his colored fellow Americans. 39 When U.S. Negroes were barred from participating in presidential elections, this too captured the headlines. 40 Japanese propagandists even quoted Wabuno, 
chief of the Delaware tribe of Red Indians at length on the white man as an exterminator of other races 41 Japan's war was said to bolster the chief's efforts. Point 42 This was more than a war of emancipation, it was also a war of ideology 43. Such news stories were accompanied by coverage of Negro activities within the newly minted Japanese Empire. In 1943 it was reported that Roy Brooks, clever Negro boxer, was yesterday crowned welterweight champion of the New Philippines by virtue of a clear-cut win over Jimmy V and Wavo before 9,000 fans at Rizal Stadium. In the semi-finals Jeffries where, two-fisted Negro slugger also triumphed. Point 44 The Japanese press prominently reported the tax problems of the heavyweight champion, Joe Lewis the Brown Bomber at the hands of the U.S. government he had supported so assiduously. Point 45 the United Kingdom faced a racial dilemma no less daunting than that of the United States. It may even have been more so, for it had to defend territory such as India and Burma with tens of thousands of African and Afro-Caribbean troops, not to mention indigenous people often hostile to John Bull. Moreover, it faced the unique challenge presented by Marcus Garvey's Pan-Africanism, which sought to organize the colonized against London. Even before Garvey's rise, London had been monitoring trans-African threats. Hence, in 1913 London kept a close eye on Alfred C. Sams who then was in Oklahoma but claimed to hail from the Gold Coast, a British colony. He was inducing Negroes there to emigrate to Africa, which London found disquieting. Point 46. But the bete noir in London's eyes was Garvey himself. He was under tight surveillance. In 1926 an experienced colonial hand reported in a confidential dispatch that from my experience in the political intelligence department and in Malaya, I do not feel easy in my mind as to the results of the arrival of this fanatical Negro agitator in Jamaica. 47 Both the British Consul General in New York and the Embassy in Washington were informed earlier of the large meeting of Negroes in Manhattan where the fanatical Negro agitator spoke at length on the Indian situation. That these cables were forwarded to the Prime Minister and the King himself shows how concerned London was. Point 48 The Empire, which had truly global responsibilities, had representatives who had served in Asia and Africa and drew upon their experiences in the one to shape their response in the other. In turn, their subjects often sought to join hands across the oceans. In 1928 after Garvey had been unceremoniously deported from the United States to Jamaica, British officials there continued to keep a watchful eye upon him. They considered their communications sensitive, this ought to be a secret dispatch, began one message, since I do not want it to be on permanent record there. Making the connection between those of African and Asian origin, R. E. Stubbs observed that the portly Jamaican reminds me curiously of Sun Yat-sen. There is the same devotion to an idea possibly spurious but, if so, wonderfully well counterfeited, in Sun's case the unification and independence of China, in Garvey's the improvement of the status of the black races. The same childish vanity, incessant talk of my organization, my party, my ideals. Stubbs talked at length about anti-white disturbances, suggesting at one point that Garvey's vanity has led the man into absurdities 49. But the term absurdities might be more appropriately applied to the racial policies of the empire, heavily dependent on those not of pure European descent to defend its white supremacist policies. As early as 1921 the Foreign Office stated that the United Kingdom and its putative ally the United States were all equally interested in avoiding a discussion of the subject of racial discrimination which only happened to be a matter in the forefront of the minds of the troops it ultimately had to rely on. But while acknowledging that there was no subject more fundamental for the ultimate settlement of tensions in the Pacific, the Foreign Office affirmed that the question of racial discrimination had no solution since the white and colored races cannot and will not amalgamate. One or the other must be the ruling caste, it said. As late as March 1941, the Foreign Office continued to unambiguously oppose the principle of racial equality, as one brave Briton had proposed issuing a statement that made it clear that the white races and the dark races are not unequal. Making such a statement, he said, would undercut Tokyo's increasingly open appeals. Many greeted this idea as if they had been asked to relocate to Jupiter. More diplomatically, 
Sir Horace Seymour dismissed the proposal on the grounds that the Australians would never accept it. Yet by 1944 under the gun of war the principle was accepted, suggesting once again that there is nothing like the prospect of being overrun to advance racial reform. A close student of these events maintains that the old fear of racial revenge on the part of those once dismissed as mere coloreds that is, the bulk of the empire was salient in prompting a change of heart. Point 50. Jamaicans and U.S. Negroes, in league with Tokyo, had been protesting British rule in Africa at least since 1905. The empire feared that Japanese businesses would undercut their British counterparts on the African continent, thereby strengthening Tokyo's hand in Asia. Thus, in 1936, Thomas Stanway, writing from Durban, complained to the Undersecretary for the Colonies about the wholesale dumping of cheap Japanese cotton and silk goods into our colonies. He had just visited Mombasa, Zanzibar and Dar es Salaam and found ports there flooded with Jap sick goods at the expense of our own. Lancashire and Yorkshire used to have the whole of this trade, he added with acidity, and now they have been robbed of it by a ruthless competitor with whom it is quite hopeless to compete 51. In 1939, as the empire was about to plunge into war, a Glasgow executive charged that in East Africa the UK position was, if anything, worse than it had been. The Japanese were cutting prices drastically to levels that could not be economic even for them and were ruining the whole market, particularly in the bedrock industry of sewing cotton. Thankfully, he said, in West Africa the position was not quite so bad. 52 but a few years earlier, even British executives in West Africa were singing the blues about the Japanese onslaught. Over a brief two-year period, from 1934 to 1936, the very valuable business for such enameled articles as wash basins, cash bowls, etc. has passed almost entirely to Japan at prices considerably below the cost of production in this country, that is, the United Kingdom.53. Although Berlin was professedly an ally of Japan, for reasons of geography and history German firms often allied with British ones in Africa which brought the two European giants into conflict with Tokyo. Thus, in the pivotal year of 1936 a German diplomat told London that his nation had a regular and considerable trade in cheap earthenware and enameled ware, exported mainly through British firms, to British West Africa, especially Nigeria. This trade is now in danger of being wiped out by the competition of cheap Japanese products. He inquired whether we might contemplate checking these Japanese imports by means of quota restrictions, as has been done in the case of textiles 54 London was rather inclined to welcome this approach. While the suggestion that discriminatory duties should be imposed against one foreign country expressly to safeguard export trade to another certainly opens up a rather terrifying prospect should it be adopted widely in trade negotiations, it reasoned, it has always seemed to us that as regards the empire's trade with Germany the best reply to the latter's claims for territorial adjustment is the institution of some system of trade regulations by which good customers are favored at the expense of bad ones. 55 In other words, London was quite willing to accommodate Berlin at Tokyo's expense, although Germany by dint of geography if nothing else was a clearer and greater danger to the British Isles. But just as the ardor of many US Negroes for all things Japanese collided with their hunger for the property to be seized from Japanese Americans as the war began, Tokyo itself faced a similar dilemma between supposed principal and larger goals when Italy invaded Ethiopia the Jerusalem and Mecca combined for blacks globally. Highly cognizant of Addis Ababa's significance, Tokyo had courted Ethiopia devotedly over the years a fact carefully monitored by US military intelligence, which was well aware of its importance. Point 56. Yet if the economic challenge provided by Tokyo was menacing, the social challenge was deemed greater. A U.S. official reported with amazement on plans for a merger through marriage of branches of the royal families in Tokyo and Addis Ababa respectively. In 1932 Prince Leyaleya Ababa, nephew or cousin, of the Emperor of Ethiopia, visited Japan and like many another sojourner in Japan, found the Japanese women pleasing and memorable. One thing followed another, 
and in June 1932 stories appeared in the press to the effect that Prince Lee had requested a Tokyo lawyer to find for him a suitable Japanese bride. In London such a request would have brought chuckles, while in the US South it might have led to the prince's bloody demise, but in Tokyo there were applications from approximately 60 Japanese girls. The skeptical U.S. analyst explained this amazing maneuver in the context of Tokyo endeavoring to organize a pan-Asiatic movement and get into working order a League of Colored Peoples with Japan at its head. While his analysis was probably accurate, the United States like the United Kingdom could only stare in bewilderment as the crafty plot unfolded, while U.S. Negroes were electrified by this gesture. Point 57. But many Negroes were dismayed by Tokyo's response to the Italian invasion of Ethiopia. Initially the influential and extremely race-conscious Black Dragon Society of Japan held a meeting in Tokyo to protest against Mussolini's invasion as yet another fresh example of white imperialism. The BDS was joined by like-minded ultra-right, patriotic, and allied factions within the military and government. Point 58 The Japanese embassy in Rome was placed under police guard, and all the leading Italian newspapers ran front page stories on Japanese policy toward Ethiopia. Tokyo was understandably concerned that important sections of the white race were upset about the implications of Japan's rise to power for the illogic of white supremacy, and suspected that these powers were itching for an opportunity to defeat it. Equally, if not more important, Tokyo hesitated to offend its anti-communist soulmate in Rome and therefore backed down from its brief defense of Ethiopian sovereignty, to the dismay of Pan-Africanists worldwide. 59. Tokyo's retreat did not dampen the enthusiasm of many blacks globally for Japan, a power that appeared to defy white supremacy. U.S. intelligence remained ever alert to this reality. Islam had established an important foothold in North America with the advent of the organization that became known as the Nation of Islam. Islam itself had been in existence for more than a millennium and in its orthodox form was dominant in large swathes of Africa and adjacent regions. Japan, said U.S. officials, is in an unequaled position to capture the goodwill of Muslims globally and had met with signal success in the pursuance of this program. Islam, it was said, is outspokenly democratic, untroubled by racial and social bias. A Negro from Nigeria, for example, has served as the chief of the general staff of IBN Saud, the most powerful personality of modern Arabia. The acute nationalism of the Islamic world was directed necessarily against Western imperialists, which has made all Westerners suspect if not invariably unpopular. Tokyo was persistent in broadcasting their anti-Western policy to the Muslims in proclaiming their pride as members of the Asiatic or Colored Front. Its anti-communist policy was also gratifying to Muslims, it was reported. Japan proclaimed that there were parallels between Shinto and Islam and promoted an ominous alliance between fanatical Japanese patriotism and Muslim ethno-religious fanaticism, that is, a dazzling promise of Japan Islam sick. In pursuit of its ambitions, Japan was distributing scholarships to students. Some prominent Japanese had even gone so far as to convert to Islam. In strategically situated Afghanistan a dagger pointed at the empire's heart in India Japan had deftly been able to capitalize on four fears, of Russia, Communism, England, and the Hindu Congress Party. The guileful Nipponese were said to preach an anti-Hindu message in Kabul and a pro-Hindu message in Delhi. Now, worried U.S. intelligence analysts, the same model that had worked so well for Japan in the Islamic world was being exported to Latin America, a heavily Catholic region with a modicum of blacks. In one propaganda broadcast Tokyo was said to have asserted that the Bible has now become the book of the Japanese, a new translation of the Old Testament by Japanese scholars was well underway. Is the Islamic venture to branch off into a Catholic policy, the U.S. authorities asked anxiously. What was to be done? Creative officials noted with satisfaction that in the Near East and the Balkans much can be made of Japanese hostility toward whites. In other places, such as Kabul and Delhi, Japan had tried to be all things to all people. Nothing was said about undermining white supremacy as a necessary condition to eroding Japan's appeal. 60. By the time Hong Kong was seized, 
Whitehall may have wished it had been less stubborn on the racial front. Frankie Zung would have been defined as a Negro in the United States. According to the writer Emily Hahn, his face was memorable because you don't see many Negroid faces in the Far East. Mr. Zung was only half Negro, or rather half West Indian, he insisted on the distinction, but it showed up in his features and coloring far more than did his Chinese half. Yet, there he was, in Japanese-occupied Hong Kong, collaborating energetically against his ostensible sovereign, London. Why? The Japanese, he told Han, liked any colored person in the world, anyone at all, as long as he wasn't white. They made big promises to all the colored races. Africa and everywhere else. Zung was married to a Euro-American but because the occupiers were so delighted over a white woman marrying a Negro a potential capital offense in North America they freed her without any argument. She was a blonde. Very blonde. As Han and Zung strolled through the battered streets of what had once been described as the Pearl of the Orient, people didn't look surprised at seeing us together, as they would have before the war. Han herself confessed that before the war if I had noticed Zung walking with his blonde wife, I would have been amazed. With grudging reluctance, Han who had escaped internment herself because of the occupier's pleasure at her own previous intimacies with the Chinese man argued that in Hong Kong the Japanese have certainly succeeded in wiping out the color bar. The peak, the neighborhood previously reserved for those of pure European descent, was now home to the likes of Frankie Zung. Turnabout was fair play, thought Han. The British were cruel with their color distinctions and now they are being treated in the same way, dosed with their own medicine. It is just. It is only fair that I, an American white woman, should be wearing wooden clogs while Mrs. Zung has new patent leather shoes. That's our weakness, I mused. That's the big drawback to our winning this war. We'll win but we'll still be up against the color bar and all the resentment it stirs up. The Jap sick had a chance, she reflected perceptively, with their Asia for the Asiatics line. It sounds well. They missed the boat, but they've got a head start with people like Zung. 61. It was to eliminate this head start that Britain belatedly gave up the more egregious aspects of white supremacy. But it was not easy it was wrenching and required old thought patterns to be changed. Fortunately for him Anthony Hewitt did not bump into Frankie Zung when he had his nerve-wracking escape from the clutches of the occupiers. Instead, as he surreptitiously crossed China he encountered Percy Davis, yet another Jamaican-Chinese half-Negro born in the West Indies. Exceptionally tall. With strong wide shoulders and features more Negroid than Asian. He had a head of full black and curly hair. Davis used to own the World Radio Company in Kowloon, in Hong Kong but was now leading the resistance against the Japanese just across the border. His brother, Lee, was a communist guerrilla. According to Ateng, another red fighter, Percy Davis was a top red leader himself, the chairman here, the big man. The big boss. 62. Percy Davis's fight against Japan was typical of many in the empire who overcame their doubts and threw in their lot with London in hope of a better day. Billy Strachan was in the same category. Born in 1921 in Kingston, Jamaica, when war clouds loomed he sought to be a pilot for the Royal Air Force. But he remembered his home, where there was an elite group of white men from Britain who headed all government organizations. This small group ran the country with a dictatorial rod. They lived in ultra-luxury in vast great houses with a number of servants dressed as if they had stepped out from the set of the television program upstairs, downstairs. There was no free education and at his school the whites were so rich and so arrogant they didn't care about the blacks. All in all, there was terrific racism. But even so, he wasn't prepared for his experience in the United Kingdom itself where he went to train as a pilot in order to save the empire that had been so unkind to him. There had been a mass recruitment of West Indians. In 1943 and the more that arrived, the more intense was the racism. He had never been called darky. Before this. He was terribly annoyed by the animosity and jealousy he faced, 
which was ironic thanks given the sacrifice he offered. Point 63. This mass recruitment was unenthusiastically received in certain quarters of Strachan's homeland. George Power recalled that in Kingston on every corner you went people would discuss and talk about the war and many people said that they would not fight for Britain because Britain had enslaved us for a number of years and so on. Still irate years after the war had ended, Pow added angrily, show me a black serviceman who claimed not to have encountered any prejudice in the UK during the war and I'll show you a liar, 64. Pow's anger was understandable. In June 1944, as the invasion of Normandy signalled a new phase in the conflict, Sir Frederick Leggett was instructed that the better dance halls in Liverpool are still closed to the West Indians and feelings of bitterness increase because nothing appears to be happening 65 thus, at Reese's Dance Hall in Liverpool, the manager has frankly explained that he imposed a ban of coloured persons because white American officers who used the hall objected to the presence of coloured people on the dance floor. 66 One angry Yank had bolted from one club muttering, I would not have a bloody drink under the same bloody roof as any bloody nigger. 67 Sir George Gator was instructed that the colour bar difficulties on Merseyside and at Manchester, which have been stirred up by the Americans are seriously affecting the well-being and social life of the West Indian technicians and trainees. 68 To be sure, Blacks and whites from the United States had exported their penchant for marathon brawling to the United Kingdom. Even as the war was winding down in 1945, there was yet another report on a disturbance between American personnel and colored members of a club. Just before midnight one summer's day, Lawrence Silver, a Negro, said that one of his colleagues, who was white, said, Look, there's a F King nigger there. The response to this call was predictable, let's go beat him up, several people said, referring to the now startled Silver. However, Silver collected himself, ignored and evaded the gathering mob, and continued on his way to the colored colonial social club. Here he gathered his own retinue of 30 or 40 comrades and returned to thrash his interlocutors soundly. 69. On the other hand, people like Billy Strachan who wanted to fight Japan were perversely lucky in that London was not opposed to refusing the aid of Jamaicans like him. This was the dilemma faced by Leo March. In September 1939, as war was erupting, he offered his services to the Empire, I am a fully qualified dental surgeon, trained at the Royal Dental Hospital of London, he began. He wished to join the RAF, Royal Air Force. Although I was a British subject and fully qualified for the position I could not be selected as I was not of pure European descent, he moaned. Thus, he found himself stranded in London and unemployed 70. Even as the empire seemed on the verge of being overrun by predatory Japanese troops, London was unwilling to accept offers of aid by people not of pure European descent particularly for posts beyond simple soldiering. This also applied to Dartmouth cadet ships and direct entry cadet ships, where the practice of the interview committee was to reject boys who evidently have a color strain 71 they hoped to secure the exclusion of any candidate whose appearance is so negroid that it will make it difficult for him to take charge 72 because the appearance of fair play and democracy had to be maintained, elaborate subterfuges were deployed to obscure the sordid reality. A confidential communication stated that it should still be the duty of the committee to look out for boys who may have a color strain, though it is undesirable, in view of the delicacy of the question, that written official instructions in regard to it should be incorporated in the Memorandum 73. The Empire also rejected on the grounds of race an American black pilot who had applied to serve as a ferry pilot guiding planes between Montreal and Great Britain. Qualified African Americans had also been denied employment with the British Purchasing Commission in Washington, a black doctor from New York, who had volunteered to come to Britain to help because of the widely publicized shortage of physicians in London during the Blitz was rejected by the Ministry of Health. Even when London moved to suspend such practices due to the demands of war, they made it clear that this was for the duration only and resisted making any statements about what would happen after the war 74. One reason African Americans were offering their skills to London was because their own country was often as hidebound as the empire in matters racial. 
the United States influenced by outright racists was often unable or unwilling to discard its white supremacist policies, despite the presence of a burgeoning Negro population which often compelled it to retreat from such principles. London which ruled uneasily over sullen colored peoples was obsessed about keeping them out of high-level posts so as to maintain the illusion of European superiority, and keeping them far away from their borders, and, as was often said, their women. Thus, the empire often had to go to greater lengths than the United States in order to enforce white supremacy. It also resorted to bizarre tests of racial purity, the likes of which generated global moral outrage when practiced by Berlin. In a typically confidential memorandum, the Civil Service Commission searched energetically for a touch of the tar brush in a potential employee. The evidence before the board was purely visual, the candidate had crinkly black hair, a café au lait complexion and protruding lower lip. For this reason the board felt some hesitation about reporting the case. 75. The color bar was being imposed even as the empire was in a desperate fight for survival with a minimal margin of error, particularly on the part of the Royal Air Force both a sturdy shield and a sharpened sword. Yet London continued to reject the applications of those not of pure European descent for vital posts such as aircraft apprentices. The son of Viola Smith of Cornwall was very slightly colored and she had noticed that your qualifications of entry mandated that the candidate must be of pure European descent. Her son was intelligent and good-looking. She could hardly believe that despite his excellent qualifications he would be barred from the RAF for a very slight touch of color 76 officials regretted it was not possible to make a departure from this racial requirement 77 after all there were cases of gentlemen who admit to be slightly colored who very often prove on inspection to be as black as one's boots. Of course, they said gallantly. The purpose of the color bar was nothing as crude as racial discrimination or narrow-mindedness. It was to spare the feelings of men of color whose British comrades might not appreciate their presence. The unforgiving compulsion of war ultimately compelled the British to relax their rigid color consciousness, though they freely admitted that whether we should continue to allow admission of non-Europeans after the war seems to be another matter. 78 Before the relaxation of the color bar, Tom Taylor, a very distinguished university boxer from Balliol College, was given the highest recommendation for a post with the RAF. But this native of the Gold Coast also bumped into the bar and came out second best point 79. As war erupted in Europe in 1939, the colonial office realized that adverse feeling is being aroused because of the exclusion of men in these regions from commissions in the royal force. It was warned that grievances felt on this score may constitute a serious handicap to British wartime propaganda. ADA farsighted official went so far as to say, I sometimes think that color prejudice, from which I do not claim to be free, may one day prove to be a crack on which the colonial empire may split 81. Yet, to hear London tell it, the empire was often dragged reluctantly into backing a color bar because of the protestations of its chief ally and subtle rival, the United States. This argument was disingenuous at best. The empire unilaterally rejected U.S. Negro pilots and doctors who offered assistance and tried to bar them from their bases in the Caribbean. A novel solution devised by London was to require black Britons to wear a badge to distinguish them from black Americans. Future Prime Minister Harold Macmillan thought it a splendid idea. Despite protests from various quarters racial segregation remained virtually intact in Britain throughout the war, which handed Tokyo a propaganda bonanza. Little wonder that conservative commentator George Schuyler declared that the empire was the foundation of racial prejudice and discrimination in the modern world. Point 82. In September 1942 the War Cabinet affirmed that we were justified in pressing the United States authorities to reduce as far as possible the number of colored troops sent to this country. London felt that it was simply trying to meld varying but united perspectives on white supremacy for the sake of the overall longevity of the racial project. The average white American soldier does not understand the normal British attitude to the color problem and his respect for this country may suffer if he sees British troops, British women's services and the population generally drawing no distinction between white and colored. Guidelines were proffered on how the British should respond to Negroes, 
with the strict proviso that it is most undesirable that there should be any unnecessary association between American colored troops and British women 83. London seemed to feel that U.S. blacks stirred up anti-racist sentiments among blacks from the empire, and therefore should be kept separate. This was not a new thought. As early as 1920 a confidential missive from colonial offices from the African nation that was to become Malawi reported that two American Negroes came there. One of them, a preacher, had married the niece of the notorious John Chilamwe, whose uprising shook the foundations of the empire in Africa. His familial connection to an American Negro was considered duly important. Point 84. The exigencies of war had heightened apprehensions about the strategically placed U.S. minority. In a most secret communication in the fall of 1943, an official granted that in an ideal world we should certainly wish to avoid having British African personnel serving alongside American colored troops. Why? Because if British African troops were to be placed in the position of receiving direct orders from American white personnel, there would be unending trouble. Parenthetically, the British authorities noted that the main points of difference between African and African American troops were the latter's higher standards of education, the presence of Negro officers, and American political ideals. The Empire was also concerned that blacks from the United States might impart seditious notions to their African brethren. Point 85 All this made the United States a headquarters of white supremacy more appealing to many Africans and Asians, thus contributing to its growing ability to challenge the United Kingdom, not least within the Empire itself. London was very worried about the deployment of U.S. Negro troops in British colonies in West Africa, where their presence was thought to be disruptive. London firmly recommended to Washington that no colored troops be sent to the Gambia or Freetown, Sierra Leone. 86 Such an idea, it said, clearly contains the seeds of trouble. 87 The proposal was strongly objected to by the American commander in Accra, as by London and local governments. 88 Soothingly and evasively the War Department in Washington in words deemed most secret assured London that there is no intention of using United States colored troops in West Africa. 89 it did not say how this decision would affect the worldwide deployment of troops in a global struggle for survival against wily and well-armed foes. The Negro troops supply a great part of the labor of the United States Army, Prime Minister Winston Churchill was told, and as we have been pressing the Americans to increase the proportion of construction troops in their build-up, it would be difficult for us to ask them to reduce the percentage now, just because London did not want Negroes in Britain itself. Point 90 So London would have to steal itself and accept a horde of colored men. But accepting them did not mean accommodating them, and soon the most secret fact was revealed that 35% of the total population of US soldiers imprisoned in the United Kingdom were colored. The alleged existence of the drug marijuana was said to be a major reason, this substance had to be monitored carefully since if given to women, it may excite their sexual desires either as a cigarette or ground up in food 91 for whatever reason, London maintained detailed lists of the crimes said to be committed by Negroes but none of crimes perpetrated by others. Point 92 In any case, according to the Duke of Melbourne, crime was not the only problem presented by these Negroes. There are up to the present moment 34,875 colored troops in this country, he announced in October 1943, and there is a serious subversive element about them which I do feel can do much to bring about a great deal of unpleasantness in the relationship between our two countries. 93 They had been influenced by the stated democratic aims of the war, the leveling rhetoric from the chief ally of the United States the Soviet Union and the cry for racial justice enunciated by Japan, and they were not inclined to accept cheerfully the commands of white supremacy. What else were these desk-bound bureaucrats so afraid of? Again, in most secret language, the Foreign Office recalled bitterly that the presence of U.S. Negroes in Trinidad has been the constant source of embarrassment and has given rise to actual disturbances in Port of Spain, Trinidad. 94 Just imagine what would happen in Africa, where the basis for complaint was even more substantial and the population substantially larger. This concern about U.S. Negroes infecting their counterparts in the empire was something of a turnabout for London 
in that in the 1920s the Foreign Office had felt that the West Indian native considers himself to be in every way so superior to the Negro of the southern states that there is no likelihood for the present of an undesirable reaction resulting from Negro movements in the U.S. on sick the Negro subjects of the British West Indies 95. Evidently times had changed, for something that had not been a particular problem for the Empire earlier was now seen as a threat to the health of the colonial project generally. Employment of a few colored drivers in Leopoldville led to representations by the Belgian authorities and Americans had to withdraw them. This group of colored soldiers were also employed in East Africa and difficulties were experienced as a result. 96. It was not as if London had an easy time controlling African troops, far from it. The Basuto of Southern Africa caused all kinds of headaches for colonial bureaucrats. A British report observed that Basuto troops in West Asia share the life of British soldiers and do the same work for less money, which naturally makes them dissatisfied. They cannot stand the strains of a long war. In early 1945 the report worried that there is no remedy except victory within the next few months. It did not consider extending equal pay for equal work. Point 97. Africans had also been sent to Palestine, where Jews and Arabs were jockeying intensely for position in an exceedingly tense environment in anticipation of a British withdrawal. The British decided that the Basuto troops cannot be relied upon in the present emergency, for any moment now they may go on strike. These troops are now a liability not an asset. Somehow the Basuto had got the idea that they were being exploited because they are Africans. This idea is becoming more and more deeply rooted and no arguments will change these ideas. They had become useless as a defense against any but casual individual thieves 98 thus, the crisis in the Middle East that was to bedevil the prospects for peace for generations to come was exacerbated in part by the increasingly discredited policy of white supremacy. The rebelliousness of the Basuto was not the only African problem that faced London. In a confidential report in early 1945 the military grappled with the difficulty presented by the growing claim to equality irrespective of race on the part of Africans. The situation is that when in contact with the enemy, British and Africans work together admirably and on equal terms. When such a unit is withdrawn for rest, the Africans expect to remain on equal terms with their British comrades, while the latter naturally prefer to exclude them from their billets, canteens, and entertainments. There results a feeling of unfair discrimination and color bar prejudice. 99. London was asking Africans to sacrifice their lives perhaps for the empire. Africans, in turn, demanded a modicum of respect. The British were warned that the Bechuana of southern Africa would take offense if they were sworn at, or if they were called blacks or niggers, but these old habits died hard. Thus, Africans were suspicious and distrustful of the British. Moreover, they had seen the British up close and now saw their frailties, which shattered the empire's image of total and awe-inspiring superiority. In two years, the Africans had seen a great deal of the white man at close range and they had lost much of their respect for him. Not only that, they saw that not all Europeans resided in majestic grandeur in Sicily and Italy they found white people living in poverty and filth which also reduced the prestige of an empire based not only on English, but British and white supremacy as well. Here also the Africans for the first time resorted to white prostitutes and this must have destroyed much of the white man's prestige in their eyes. Obviously they felt there is not much difference between us and the white man after all. 100. How true. But what did this mean for the long-term prospects for the empire, not to mention the immediate task of fighting a protracted war? Not surprisingly, by mid-1944 a top-secret report observed that generally among many of the African troops there has been a definite decline in morale. They are tired. This was the result of the tension between upholding white supremacy on the one hand and fighting a war ostensibly premised on democracy on the other. But London explained it as a result of the fact that the African has not the education nor the outlook on the war and its issues which helped the European to overcome this war weariness 101. 
both Africans and British had to grapple with the spectacle of Italian prisoners of war making artificial limbs in West Africa for wounded African soldiers. It was hard for Africans to continue to see whites as a cut above them while interned and subordinated Italians in Africa were being compelled to labor on behalf of Africans. 102. London was sensitive to the issue. In Nairobi, Kenya, there were separate facilities for colored prisoners and the German POW, who as a further reminder of their subordinate status were accommodated in the female section. Colonial officials were quick to point out that the Germans were entirely shut off from the other prisoners' quarters, thus preventing Africans from seeing subordinated whites in Africa. Moreover, London avoided placing Africans among Europeans even if the latter were a foe. Thus, the point was made forcefully that at no time were these men ever mixed up with colored criminals 103. Similarly, in Jamaica colonial officials were sensitive to the serious objections to use of colored troops for guarding German civilian internment camps. Reluctantly they conceded that it was not possible to provide other troops for the purpose. Though the Foreign Office strongly opposed the use of colored troops as guards, racial sensitivities had to be ignored. Why? As noted, it was a problem to secure other troops for this task, but there was also a sort of mutually assured destruction between prevailing racial biases and this was a line that London hesitated to cross. That is, the British feared that the Germans might have the presumed inferiors guard British POWs, which would be a humiliation piled on the insult of internment. 104 and it was not just blacks that London was concerned about either. In Trinidad, internees were housed in a number of hutments, which are divided into two sections, one for Jews, and for non-Jews, though the prisoners were mostly German. 105. If unlucky enough to be captured after risking their lives for the empire, men of African descent often had to endure the comments of insensitive fellow inmates. Richard Thorpe, a Jamaican, had the misfortune of being interned in Hong Kong with Wenzel Brown. One day while fantasizing most likely induced by hunger we, recalled Brown, talked to a great, Soft Negro mammy dressed in a red print dress who proudly showed us her piccaninny, naked save for the red kerchief she had tied about his head. 106 Brown did not reflect on why in this moment of peril his thoughts had wandered into the grossest of racial stereotypes. The Pacific War precipitated a massive crisis for white supremacy. The mighty empire was reduced to asserting that it has become abundantly clear that the Africans are exploding the myth established by the Japs sick during the original conquest of Burma that they are unsurpassed as jungle fighters. 107 The powerful proponents of white supremacy had sunk to the point where they were extolling the might of allegedly inferior Africans to undermine the idea of superiority of Japanese fighters over Europeans. The message to the Africans was clear, if they were so mighty, why were they languishing under colonial rule, supervised by Europeans apparently unable to fight their own battles? If British troops were taking flight in the jungles of Burma pursued by smaller Japanese, why should they react any differently if confronted by Africans? This thought had crossed the mind of white supremacists. One Rhodesian analyst worried that the war which forced Salisbury to train Africans as welders, drivers, and the like, who perforce saw the world along with the Rhodesian troops they accompanied was the biggest challenge to colonialism since the end of the slave trade. Still another Rhodesian worried that the prestige of white man depends, whatever the politicians may think, largely on the ability to do things better than the black man, and this prestige was shaken profoundly by the war. 108. It was easy to see why the racist regime of Rhodesia would be apprehensive about the war. The empire came perilously close to being vanquished in Asia and probably would have been but for the fact that up to 100,000 West Africans served in the SE Asia and India commands, this did not include the many thousands from East and Southern Africa who served similarly. West Africa had the largest colonial force in the world fighting overseas and by far the greatest portion of it was in the critical battlegrounds of Burma or Assam. In some instances their numbers and contributions outweigh those of the British. 109 all told, 167,000 soldiers 110 from Sierra Leone, Gold Coast, Nigeria and the Gambia alone fought for London. Despite their massive effort on behalf of the Empire and the Allies, as Lt. J. A. L. Hamilton pointed out, 
they received little publicity in official and memoir accounts. 111 After the war ended, London seemed to want to downplay their contribution for fear that it might provide a rationale for anti colonial activities. At the moment of the most intense combat, however, the empire did not stint in its praise for the Africans. One analyst, for example, complimented the West Africans for their medal at the crucial Battle of Imphal. 112 in a most secret report in 1942 Downing Street wrote that West African troops should be sent to the Far East for employment in jungle warfare. 113 British officials in India agreed, adding that the advantage of West African troops in Burma is that they are used to jungle, while East African troops are at present highly mechanized and not so used to jungle. Both East and West African troops had fought well in Africa operations and should be able to compete with Japanese. 114. Despite their contribution to the survival of the empire, these brave soldiers often had to contend with harassment and insult. The official publication of the East African Command included insulting, stereotypical drawings of Africans combined with racially insensitive attacks on the Japanese and the usual incongruous rhetoric about fighting for freedom and democracy. 115 Traveling from West Africa to India, a number of African soldiers escorted by a European officer stopped in Durban. As Captain P. B. Poor recalled it, the Africans could not read and therefore sat on white-only seats and totally ignored the segregation laws. However, the British chose to ignore this flagrant violation of racial norms, aware as they were of the ongoing war and the Africans' contribution. Captain Poor was also sensitive to the issue. I had a sergeant known as Sergeant Bent Down because he used to beat the Africans to punish them. This I had to stop. We were about to fight the Japanese and it would be useful to have 150 Africans to help us. That the war saved Africans from frequent canings was just one more example of how this conflict forced the empire to shed some of its harsh practices. Colonel F. K. Theobald dryly observed that in West Africa regulations permitted us to award up to 12 strokes of the cane for certain offenses. When we arrived in India this was frowned upon and we were told that this regulation would not operate there. 116. It was well that the empire opted for tactical kindness, for the Africans proved indispensable upon arrival in Burma. I always let them do the talking to the Burmese as they were so much better and obtained information I could never have got, observed Captain Poor. But although the Africans were essential to the mission, they received third-rate treatment. Captain Poor and his fellow British had been issued with Indian-made patrol boots that were light and felt great or gym shoes while the African went barefoot. One reason the empire was able to prevail against Japan is that it had an almost inexhaustible supply of Africans and Indians that could be thrown heedlessly into combat, without regard for common standards of humanity, Tokyo did not have a comparable advantage, even if their own deployment of Koreans and Formosans is taken into account. But the services provided by the Africans may have been a disadvantage for the empire, in that they softened the British in their confrontations with the battle-toughened Japanese. Colonel F. K. Theobald admitted that life under active service conditions in the jungle life was in some ways more comfortable for officers than it would be with British troops. My boy sick would try and wash my Airtex battle dress blouse and denim trousers every day. He carried a charcoal iron and there would be an immaculate crease in my denim trousers. That was not all. His boy also carried 40 pounds of equipment since his orderly and bodyguard did not carry a load. 117 The class-bound British military seemed to be preparing for a picnic or a photo shoot for a safari rather than fighting a war against a cunning opponent. The empire at times clumsily undermined its advantages. The Sierra Leone Battalion, for example, had many Polish officers. As they were unable to speak English they could not be put in charge of English troops, so they were shipped out to West Africa. It is unclear how African troops commanded by Polish-speaking officers performed in battle. Captain Poor could not understand why morale seemed to be dropping like a stone, and a great many people were becoming jittery, both European and African. He recalled an African sergeant who was very different from the others, he was well educated to university standard and an excellent map reader. He had a chip on his shoulder, 
perhaps because all British sergeants were senior to him, although they were not well educated and he could outperform them. Typically, Captain Poor compared Africans to children, but he made no connection with his condescending language, speaking instead of their rather disappointing performance in the Kalatan, which led to a rumor going around that they would not be used again 118. Some Africans may have been overjoyed not to be used again, for in an attempt to reduce the casualty rate among Europeans the commanding officer ordered that patrols were to be led by African sergeants. No matter how militarily well-intentioned, said one writer sympathetic to London, his order could have been interpreted in the battalion as a readiness to conserve Europeans' officers' and NCOs' lives at the expense of African ones. 119 Hence it was not unusual for African troops to flee from the Japanese without a single man private, corporal or sergeant doing his duty. On one occasion so quickly had the platoon fled that they had not fired a single shot and had suffered no casualties. 120. Not using African troops would prove to be a difficult promise to keep, because British soldiers in South Asia often were targeted by the Japanese and angry Africans too. In what might rank as the reigning metaphor of the racial transformation that accompanied the war, British personnel were ordered to paint their faces black and copy the gait, bearing, and mannerisms of their own troops. Why? By their account, British officers did not paint themselves black to avoid Japanese snipers but to protect themselves from being killed by African soldiers. 121 John Nunnally disagreed. In his opinion, a white man amongst black soldiers was always the prime target of Japanese fire. All Europeans now coated their faces and hands with black cream and removed rank badges. Characteristically, during the British retreat from Burma to India in 1942, the BIA or Burma Independence Army hunted down and killed a number of British soldiers, B.A. Ma, a leader with Aung San trumpeting, the boys were jubilant at the thought of having drawn white blood so cheaply, 122 white supremacy backfired in the jungles of Burma. The vaunted pale skin, once a symbol of preeminence had now become something of a liability. This was a harsh lesson, the retreat from Burma mirrored a retreat from the more egregious aspects of white supremacy. Maltreated, ill-paid, poorly clad, the tens of thousands of African troops were on the verge of mutinous rebellion. The highly charged atmosphere of war provided the catalyst for an experiment that often careened out of control. This caught the attention of Japanese propagandists. In 1944 Anglo-U.S. atrocities against their own colored troops were exposed. These shocking deeds were directed at West African troops. Corpses of West African troops, their heads and stomachs split open as if they were shot at close range. By the UK supervising troops to compel the West Africans to advance to the rescue of the trapped British forces. They were mercilessly driven at points of bayonets to advance blindly against the Japanese forces. One prisoner revealed that he was captured by British slave traders in Tanganyika from where he was sent to Ceylon and thence to India. Some of them were burned alive 123. The Empire might have countered that this account was inflated, but it accords with other recollections of the outrageous treatment accorded African troops. Such was the case in Ceylon now Sri Lanka the teardrop-shaped island off the southern coast of India, in 1943. There two Sinhalese women and one man were fired on and wounded by persons alleged to have been East African soldiers. This led to a fierce debate in the highest councils of Colombo. Said one Selenese, a Mr. A. Ratnayak, why on earth are there African forces in Ceylon? Why should there be an African force in Ceylon? Selenese are fighting in Africa, whilst Africans are brought to defend Ceylon. Can you imagine Chinese being sent to defend England? Apparently he had not realized that the empire was reluctant to place weapons in the hands of colonial subjects in their own nations. But Mr. Ratnayak was not the only Selenese incensed about Africans in his country. Mr. Abaywikrama said, One day I saw a procession of women going into the interior. I asked them where they were going and they told me that they were leaving their homes because they were informed that the Africans eat children, that their best food was the flesh of infants. He sought to rebut this colonial myth, I told them that these soldiers were not cannibals. But so useful had this myth been in subjugating Africans that it was hard to dispel, though now it had become utterly counterproductive. 
In any case, Mr. Abay Wikrama was not particularly enlightened, speaking sardonically of the broad-lipped Africans. They are a most ugly sight. It is awful to look at these fellows. I tried to convince them that these Africans were not cannibals but they refused to believe me. They say, these people are brought here to eat up the Japanese when they land in Ceylon. He was taking no chances, wherever the African soldiers are billeted, steps must be taken to see that the authorities have a barbed wire fence of five or six strands all round. People seem to believe that they are cannibals because they are so nasty. Nobody understands their language, they simply mutter something. Contradiction was piling on contradiction as the empire was forced to send Africans abroad to meet a Japanese challenge that frontally assaulted the soft underbelly of London's major weakness, race. How could subjugated Selenese reject the imprecations no matter how hateful of those apparently intelligent and powerful persons who had colonized them? But how could an effective defense be mounted against Tokyo in South Asia when the colonized were at each other's throats? 124. In neighboring India there were repeated references to murders and murderous assaults committed by Americans and American Negroes on Indians, including a forcible kidnapping of Indian girls in American jeeps. In 1943 and 1944 there were four cases of manslaughter. By members of American forces against civilians 125 these were only some of the problems raised by the presence of troops from a nation where white supremacy was virtually sacrosanct. Delhi maintained a large number of files concerning incidents in which Americans are involved, particularly misbehaved hour by American troops in Calcutta 126. Interestingly, only African Americans among the broad swathe of U.S. citizens were specifically identified by race 127. The empire was slipping slowly into a devolutionary spiral from which there would be no return. 128 adding fuel to the flames, the empire consciously set out to demonize the Africans apparently oblivious to the ramifications of such a maneuver. Colonel F. K. Theobald conceded that our propaganda people were supposed to have made a record of the sound of bones being crunched up which was supposed to be a record of our cannibals eating Jap prisoners. 129 meeting Tokyo's racial challenge with a wicked dose of racism did not comport with the Atlantic Charter and the other lofty documents that supposedly were driving the Allies' war effort. Often shoeless, despised at every turn, no more than cannon fodder for their alleged betters, African troops had reason to be in ill humor, if not mutinous. After 13,000 African troops were repatriated from France and were about to be demobilized in West Africa, trouble began. It was late 1944 and these men had been prisoners of war in France up to the time of liberation. Several French women were reportedly molested by them. Arms were smuggled ashore and they were in possession of large sums of money or at least large compared to the meager sums they usually had. They were in an uproar, they mutinied, and this was a serious matter. 130. Speaking of the French, despite their dismal colonial record, Colonel F. K. Theobald of the British military felt that even Paris did a better job than his own country. A number of the Togolese, he recalled, had been taught the language, that is, French, whereas those of the neighboring Gold Coast spoke a pidgin English that was hardly intelligible to most English speakers. 131 More than a half century after the war had ended, Bakery Dibba of the Gambia still recalled vividly the dearth of enthusiasm in his village. At one rally to drum up interest, there was no volunteer, so they started to use force. When they saw you, they would just grip you and take you. He was put aboard a ship bound for India but all was not lost for it was there that young men from different ethnic groups worked together for the first time for a common cause. This was a useful rehearsal for the anti-colonial struggle that was to follow after the war. But Mr. Dibba concluded by reflecting gravely on why he had fought. They're the same, he said, the British, the Japanese, they were fighting all for the same thing sovereignty. I don't regret fighting for the colonial masters but at the end of the day, they are all the same. There was no difference at least for Africans between fighting for the British Empire or the Japanese Empire, or so he said. 132. Meanwhile, Robert B. Hammond, a missionary born in Hong Kong, had endured a traumatizing captivity at the hands of the Japanese during the war, 
but managed an early departure in 1942. When he landed in freedom in East Africa, Mozambique, after a lengthy cruise from China, he was visibly moved. Such love, such wondrous love that God should love us and give his Son to die for us that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. This includes the Africans too, he added generously. 133 Perhaps the black pilot from the United States whose plane crashed as he was attacking Hong Kong in an attempt to free the likes of Hammond, then was dragged behind a lorry through Kowloon until he died, would have understood this comment all too well. 134. 10. Race world. Race made more convoluted and intricate the ability of allies on all sides of the war to come together. Even when seemingly absent, as in relations between Washington and London, the infamous color bar provided fertile soil for the growth of ethnic and other differences. Such differences also made it more difficult to confront Japan's particular challenge to white supremacy. The ever-present race factor made some Chinese hostile to the empire even as Tokyo rampaged through Asia, it allowed some Mexicans to look skeptically toward their colossal northern neighbor. It complicated relations thankfully between Tokyo and Berlin. It helped to propel the war, then prolonged it. A vigorous anti-British attitude characterized the great Chinese patriot, Sun Yat-sen, as late as the 1920s, not to mention many of his compatriots. To those of pure European descent, and to the denizens of the treaty ports he came to seem a virtual Bolshevik. In particular his new relations with Russia drew Western fire. At his last major address in Kobe in late 1924, he spoke of a subject dear to the hearts of his Japanese hosts, Pan-Asianism. Like Nehru and Dubois before him, he too pointed to Japan's defeat over Russia as a turning point in the devolution of white supremacy. We regarded that Russian defeat by Japan as the defeat of the West by the East, he proclaimed. This was a continuation of Sun's nationalism, as the first cause in which Sun Yat-sen and his Japanese friends collaborated was that of Philippine independence, a collaboration which had begun as early as 1898. Sun's position on the controversial race question was as blunt as that of his Japanese friends. As Marius B. Jansen put it, the idea of an Asiatic Union under Japanese leadership to combat Western imperialism was not merely the contrivance of Japanese imagination. For Sun and his friends, China and Japan had so much in common that there was no reason why they should not work together. As Sun once put it during one of his many visits to Japan, if there were Europeans here tonight, they would not be able to tell the Chinese from the Japanese. 1. In fact, in the first decade of the 20th century, tens of thousands of Chinese youth sought a modern education in Japan, at a time when they were few and far between in the United States and the United Kingdom. Two, in 1905, buoyed by Japanese success against Russia and angered by American mistreatment of Chinese immigrants, Chinese students, some just returned from study in Japan, organized an anti-American boycott, arguably the first sustained nationalist movement in Chinese history 3. At that conjuncture, in the aftermath of Japan's victory over Russia, Tokyo occupied in the regard of the Asiatic revolutionaries the place later held by Moscow for as a young traveler, Sun often masqueraded as Japanese to avoid harassment, for, as he put it, when the Japanese began to be treated with more respect, I had no trouble in passing. I owe a great deal to this circumstance, as otherwise I would not have escaped many dangerous situations. 5. When the Japanese authorities were tried as war criminals after 1945, they sought refuge in their relationships with the colored, particularly Sun. According to Yasubiro Shimonaka, Japan founded the Greater East Association which was based upon the following articles, blood is thicker than water, China and Japan are brother countries. All this was motivated, he argued, by Sun Yat-sen. Sun Yat-sen was the origin of this principle and Matsui was the Echo 6 Kumaichi Yamamoto, former Japanese ambassador to Thailand, argued that the concept of the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere, Pan-Asianism, and all the rest all came from Sunday 7 but these ideas were rejected. One Soviet writer also pointed to close ties between the Black Dragon and Sun Yat-sen. 
For many years he collaborated with the Black Dragon Society. Sun Yat-sen as well as the Black Dragon Society aimed at driving all Europeans and Americans out of Asia. In all biographies of Sun Yat-sen written for Europeans and Americans, this aim was usually discussed. To him, however, it was a guiding principle. Indeed, argues this analyst, by the time of his death Sun was not only allying with Tokyo but also with Moscow in common opposition to the British Empire and the United States. Point eight. Sun was not alone among the Chinese in being influenced by Tokyo, however. Rebecca E. Carl points out that early 20th century rhetoric in China on race could have been lifted wholly from then reigning discourses in Japan. In the numerous essays on events in the Philippines published in China between 1899 and 1903, the Filipinos were repeatedly referred to as Tongzhong pioneers of the yellow race in the global struggle against the white race 9 it was the empire's antipathy toward Chinese independence that drove Sun himself to Japan. Point 10 signaling the reality that there was a long-standing tie between race consciousness and the right wing in Tokyo is the fact that the leader of the chauvinistic Black Dragon Society, Toyoma Mitsuru, persuaded the foreign office to change its mind and allow Sun Yat-sen to land in Japan and sheltered him during his stay. He also sheltered Chiang Kai-shek. 11. Chinese nationalism like nationalism in the colored world generally was long attracted to Japan, as Sun's example exemplified. Another transnational trend was the fact that communists in this case, the Communist Party of China were profoundly immune to this attraction but it was precisely the communists who were the major target of persecution by London and Washington, and by removing the nationalists' natural predators, they coincidentally provided a healthy boost to Tokyo. When Tokyo's dreams were dashed in the ashes of Hiroshima Nagasaki, the communists naturally emerged as the logical inheritors of China. They continued to cite their role in the anti-Japan movement as a source of their legitimacy. But even some admirers of post-1949 Beijing have conceded the role of Japan. According to the leading Marxist intellectual, Hu Shen, Chinese students in Japan gave Sun a most enthusiastic welcome. 12 Owen Lattimore, a leading U.S. specialist on Asia, observed in 1945 that Americans usually overlook the important fact that Chinese who have studied in Japan are much more numerous than those who have studied in America are equally influential in politics, administration, and business and much more influential in the army. Chinese graduates of West Point and Virginia Military Institute have therefore rarely got anywhere in China, while Chinese officers who have studied in Japan form powerful cliques. In the politics of China 13 To be sure, this pro-Japan orientation declined after World War I when Tokyo moved aggressively to take over Chinese territory previously under German jurisdiction. Nevertheless, their shared anti-communism and antipathy to the empire served to bind certain Japanese and Chinese elites together. For just as many Chinese for a while looked to Tokyo, they looked askance at London, neither approach was helpful to the cause of the Allies when the Pacific War began. Li Uwa argues that London not Tokyo became the main target of Chinese nationalism after World War I. 14 White supremacy served as midwife to this incipient birth of Japanese-Chinese friendship, for at Versailles on only one issue debated. Were the Chinese and Japanese delegates of one mind, and that was the proposal to amend the League of Nations covenant so as to recognize racial equality. 15 Just as the construction of whiteness elided differences between and among the English, Irish, Scotch, and Welsh, Japan's racial appeal allowed tensions between and among them and other Asians, particularly the Chinese, to be minimized. Dialectically, whiteness and white supremacy fed into Japan's own effort at racial construction. The animus toward London was fueled in part by the way the Chinese were treated in the United Kingdom. They were barred from the Siemens Union, for example. Britons went so far as to treat black immigrants and sailors much better than they treated Asians generally. Point 16 Like other coloreds, these seamen did not regard the war as in any way theirs. In fact, one scholarly study has concluded that the body of evidence upon which the study is based offers little support for the theory of World War II as a people's war, indeed it points to the contrary conclusion 17 thus, 
it should have come as no surprise to the empire when those who saw themselves as heirs to Sun Chiang Kai-shek and the Kuomintang, KMT, in the pre-war period leaned toward Tokyo, even as it was nudging, then shoving, the empire. On the other hand, one must not underestimate the profound disappointment of those Chinese who looked admiringly toward Tokyo, when it became clear that Japanese imperialism was no savior. Point 18. On the whole, pro-Tokyo sentiment was driven not only by Chinese anti-communism which, after all, was shared by London but also by antipathy toward white supremacy. Cheng, who spoke Japanese and had undergone military training there as well, had also expressed an early interest in Germany, where he also considered doing some training, published articles on German military practice, and studied the German language. Thus, from 1928 to 1938 Chiang Kai-shek's Sikh government had closer relations with Germany than with any other foreign power. There were obvious contradictions in this alliance, Chiang objected to Germany's ban on mixed marriage which he deemed a betrayal 19. Chiang knew. Well the father of the head of the ultra-patriotic Black Dragon Society of Japan. They had become acquainted when he was a cadet in Japan. Moreover, he knew many officers who were members of the Black Dragon 20 inescapably, the KMT also had a fondness for Japan. As late as the 1930s, London was shocked when the KMT hinted that China might join Japan in a policy of exclusion of Great Britain from the Far East. This was significant, thought Sir John Simon, the Chancellor the Exchequer, since it would mean the yellow peril would become not a mere abstract conception but a harsh and pressing reality 21 when Britain finally assisted China in 1938, a key factor was reluctance to see China fall under the aegis of Japan just as its previous reluctance had been grounded in sympathy for the KMT's and Japan's hostility to the Communist Party of China. When in late 1940 Washington supplied the KMT with $100 million, this was not unprompted, the Japanese overtures to Chang. Throughout the autumn and the fear of his capitulation to these had goaded the United States into this expensive gesture. 22. Even some Chinese scholars rationalize the willingness of the nationalists to sympathize with Tokyo and to reject a complete alignment with the Allies. Li Uwa has written that in fact, the open door and the new order were more or less the same as China, as a sovereign state, had no place at all in both cases. Japanese colonialism and European domination were thus the same thing. 23. Moscow seemed to be the only outside power that could come to China's insistence. Its assistance to the Chinese communists is well known. O. Edmund Club has noted that while Britain and the United States were continuing their profitable trade with the Japanese, the Soviet aid to China was substantial and critical. Over 200 Soviet pilots were killed in action flying planes with Chinese insignia. 24. This created a dilemma for the empire. It had to choose between acquiescing to Japan to better combat communism, or accommodating the communists so as to better combat Japan. Ultimately, London acceded albeit minimally to the latter without enthusiasm. A British thinker commented that beginning in the 1930s Russia and Japan were working independently to reach the same goal the elimination of white influence in the East. This illustrated how some in the empire had conflated whiteness with militant defense of the status quo. The KMT too faced no easy answers, consorting with Japan and London's antagonist, Berlin was a kind of fool's gold, promising more than it delivered. But their alliance with the communists only pointed up the KMT's weaknesses, among which was corruption, and simply paved the way for its demise. As for the Chinese people themselves, their overall posture is described in the book of the same name, Passivity, Resistance, and Collaboration.25 and Collaboration was not limited to the leaders of the KMT alone.26. The leading Chinese nationalist, Wang Qingwei, headed a puppet regime in China established by Tokyo. He too had studied in Japan and, interestingly, was a leader of KMT leftists, just as Chang led the, the right wing. He was also a hero of the Republican movement and a close associate of Dr. Sunday 27 but he was a staunch opponent of the communists and was motivated in part by his hatred of white supremacy, which led to his pro-Tokyo posture. 
The British writer, Cedric Dover, deemed him a significant character, but he hated white men and the color bar. Japan, he thought, at least respects China as a nation. 2018 Wei Wu, though highly critical of Wang, averse that his case should not be written off lightly as the tale of a traitor to China 29. Thus, for various reasons the anti-communist forces led by Wang and Chang whose past or present was linked with Tokyo were not in an ideal position to lead the war effort. And they may not have been alone. When the Vietnamese communist leader, Le Duan, first visited China to gain better health in 1952, he was stunned. He was struck by the fact that the region he visited, probably Guangxi or Guangdong, had not waged any guerrilla struggle against Japan during the Japanese occupation despite its huge population. Le Duan claims that Ho Chi Minh confirmed this impression. 30 When the Hong Kong hero of the anti-Japan struggle, Sir Lindsay Ride, was on the mainland, he met a Japanese who had been an intelligence worker in Yenan during the war. He told the former professor that most of his intelligence during the war had been based on rumors, but he had had one really good source a commander of the KMT, 31. Throughout the war there were strong suspicions that Chang and Wang may not have been the bitter antagonists that they were presumed to be. Ko Hong Choi writes that a big reason why Japan was able to firmly establish herself in China was because Chang cared more about eliminating the communists than dealing with the Japanese, 32. During a good deal of the Pacific War 33 the fighting between the Chinese and the Japanese in parts of the interior was by now quite half-hearted. Leading KMT forces were using American resources to fight the Reds instead of the Japanese a move that Tokyo heartily supported while since early 1942 top KMT leaders had been in regular secret radio contact with Zhou Fahai, a Ki Wang supporter in Shanghai. After the war, Zhou was not tried as a traitor but instead became a key figure in the Chang regime. There was a widely rumored story that what Wang did was done with the tacit approval of Chang. All along. 34 Many senior British officials felt that there was a virtually undeclared peace between the Chinese government and the Japanese invaders. 35 The nationalists' attempt to drive a wedge between Britain and the U.S. also seemed to be designed to give Japan a boost. 36 Many Chinese generals, 42 in 1943 alone, went over to Japan taking hundreds of thousands of their troops with them. London had allied with Tokyo in the pre-war era, which facilitated Japan's appeal to Chinese elites. Thus, in the pre-war era the British press in Shanghai tended to be more pro-Tokyo than the US news media. In the pre-war era, Tokyo and London collaborated in repressing resistance activities by citizens of China 37. On this score, certain U.S. elites were in accord with the empire. In public, President Hoover denounced the Japanese takeover of China, but he supported it in private 38 as late as 1935, the publishing empire of Henry Luce implied that the KMT in alliance with Japan, might create a progressive new order in the Far East. Time magazine saw the Japanese army as a bulwark against Russia and communism. 39. As they examined their intelligence files during the war, the empire found confirmation for its suspicions that the KMT and other nationalists had decided not to sever relations with Japan. This was not altogether unexpected since nationalist Negroes, Maoris, Aborigines, Indians, and others had either an open or veiled affection for Tokyo so why not the nationalist Chinese? Farston T. Sung had served as the nationalist Chinese consul general in Melbourne, Sydney, Johannesburg, and Vienna, not to mention being advisor to the Chinese Ministry of Finance and general director of the Opium Control Authority. After the war it was found that he had carried letters and photographs from Mozambique to Lisbon for the Axis, successfully evading the British control at Freetown 40. Intelligence reports filed from Hong Kong in 1944 were deemed sufficiently sensitive to be considered secret. The chief of the Central Ward of Hong Kong, Sun Tuhok, and his predecessor Xi Anping Xi appear to have been key collaborators of the Japanese occupation forces. The former was KMT representative of Kwangtung province during the first all-China representatives meeting in 1924 and the latter during the third meeting. Both were active KMT members and are still remembered by many people in the KMT. 41. 
Sir Frederick Eggleston had reservations about the KMT, which he revealed in 1943 as the war dragged on. He wrote from Chungking that during the course of personal and confidential talks with the Dutch ambassador, he inquired about the rumor that Chiang Kai-shek has asked, by way of Nanking, for an assurance from Japan that if he went for the communists the Japanese would not take advantage of such a move. He said he had no doubt this was true and then proceeded to say that there was a considerable amount of liaison between Chungking Chang and Nanking Wang and with the Japanese authorities. Chungking did not intend to fight seriously as long as Japan did not make their position difficult while Japan did not want the burden of holding the whole of China and would not take hostile action unless she was harassed by China. Meanwhile the relations between the people and especially the merchant banking class were becoming freer. People passed between the occupied territory and free China very freely, banks had no difficulty in doing business in Shanghai and other towns held by the Japanese and there was a large amount of trade. 42. This was not the first time that probing questions had been raised about the relationship between Chinese nationalists and Tokyo. Another most secret communication in 1943 discussed the KMT cutting a separate deal with Tokyo. Tokyo had flown an emissary to Kuangchowen where a special plane was sent by Chang. To bring him from Kwantung. The United Nations was extremely disturbed at this development. 43 Again, it is not easy to distinguish anti-empire sentiment from pro-Tokyo collaboration. 44 When Singapore and Hong Kong were seized by Tokyo, for example, anti-empire feelings were a major reason. 45 Yet the empire had no reason to be confused, since it knew that white supremacist ideas along with years of patient tilling by Japan were responsible. Its own intelligence in 1944 revealed the signs. In quailing lyrics in a parody of a popular song went, once the East Asiatics extricate themselves from civil war, the death knell for the British and American devils will be sounded 46. The most consistent and organized opponent of such thinking was the Communist Party of China. But the Allies were strongly opposed to them, even when they had no choice but to join hands with them. Lindsay Ride fled from Hong Kong to the mainland, where he was pivotal in organizing resistance to Tokyo. He acknowledged that the most active, reliable, efficient, and anti-Japanese of all the Chinese organizations was the Communist Party and their control extended right through the Japanese-occupied areas, even through the new territories and into Kowloon. He emphasized, there was no overland route into or out of Hong Kong other than through Red Territory, and no one, be he Chinese or Westerner, could pass in or out without Red help or permission. Emphasis LR but as far as the central government was concerned, the Reds were public enemy number one, the Japanese came a poor second, any hostilities taken by the Chinese in this area were invariably against the Reds and not against the Japanese. Why were there not more escapes from Hong Kong? Quite simply, it was commonly believed that the Chinese had all turned pro-Japanese and escapees would be handed over to them. Point 47 The communists were not the only ones who felt that the nationalist resistance often was targeted conveniently at Tokyo's chief foe, themselves. In a most secret missive, the British-led resistance in China admitted that the communists can be regarded as an indigenous growth, not an offshoot of Russia which contradicted the reigning theory that communists from Moscow to Madras to Manhattan were one and the same. The report also noted that accommodation between Chungking nationalists and Japan was a very lively possibility. The empire was caught between communists they despised and nationalists they suspected of collaborating with their immediate foe. The bill for white supremacy was coming due, there is a latent anti-Western feeling which might in ordinary circumstances coalesce with the anti-Western drive by Japan, it warned. Point 48. The communists presented a grave obstacle for London. Point 49 Though cooperation with them seemed unavoidable as was cooperation with their supposed patrons in Moscow London realized that in the long run, the interests of Reds and the Empire clashed irreparably. Point 50 But even the Reds, supposed avatars of the class struggle, were making an argument similar to that of their arch enemy, Tokyo and pointing up once more the untenable position of London. The Chinese communist, Li Ta Chao, for one, explicitly argued that in global terms the class struggle had taken on the form of a racial conflict 51. 
whether it stressed class or race, the empire wanted to have nothing to do with the communists. Lindsay Wright early on had suggested to his superiors in Chongqing and New Delhi that in the short term at least it would be more profitable for the Allies to support the communists rather than the nationalists. 52 However, such advice risked inviting persecution after the war when the question was asked, who lost China? After witnessing the British debacle at Singapore and the loss of Hong Kong, many Chinese, on the other hand, believed that the Allies' cause was lost even setting aside any predisposition to sympathize with Japan. This was all the more reason to collaborate passionately with Tokyo. Antipathy toward the Empire's policy of white supremacy, together with the instinct to kick the mighty whitey now that it had fallen, created further animosity toward London. British prestige, such as it was, was at an all-time low, thought Rod. There was disgust and contempt for the decadent British, anti-British feeling was rife on all sides. Further, if the defeated British were considered to be a world power, why not the defeated Chinese, thought the nationalists. Point 53. This metastasizing disrespect was manifested in the sober case for the Royal Air Force, such as run away fast or run away first. This was an obvious legacy of the Burma campaign, thought Ride, who was disturbed by it all. He considered launching a pro-London propaganda campaign but doubted if the nationalists would buy it by itself. So he proposed CONJ joining it with a strong anti-Japanese and blatantly pro-Chinese campaign. This had the advantage of directing energy toward their presumed common opponent Tokyo and diverting attention from the empire's dismal performance in the war. But from London's point of view, it raised disturbing questions about why the Chinese should not be administering Hong Kong, particularly in light of the empire's demonstrated incompetence. Point 54. In September 1942, Ride, a former official at Hong Kong University, stated what had become painfully apparent to many, the non-communist Chinese were now openly organizing an anti-British unit called the Overseas Chinese Volunteer Unit. Their slogan, one st enemy the Japanese, second enemy the British. Many were from Hong Kong and exiled on the mainland and had representatives in Kukong, in Quilin, in Liuqiao and Kuang Chao Wan. Disappointingly, most of the members are Malaysian Chinese, British subjects. Most of the leaders have only recently come out from Hong Kong and many of them were living in the university community where the atmosphere was, if not pro-Japanese, Pro Wang Ching Wei 55. But surely Ride should not have been surprised by this development. He must have known that even anti Japanese Chinese often refuse to escape from occupied Hong Kong with their European counterparts on account of their lingering antipathy toward white supremacy. Their refusal had serious consequences for the Europeans since the Chinese often knew the terrain better, could more easily fit in and escape detection, and were more likely to receive assistance from mainlanders. Thus, when George Chow, a Chinese-Canadian, escaped from Hong Kong he did so alone, leaving his compatriots behind, while he escaped rather easily, they endured a tormenting experience. Point 56. It was evident that white supremacy of the old type had become thoroughly counterproductive. Concessions, when made, had a ring of insincerity, as if giving up white supremacy was more difficult than relinquishing life itself. In 1943 Japanese occupation forces moved to eliminate extraterritoriality in Shanghai. Two days later 57 London and Washington signed new treaties with nationalist China abrogating the hated extraterritoriality, and extending Chinese laws and jurisdiction to the city. But like the Emancipation Proclamation in the United States that freed enslaved Africans in regions that the federal government did not altogether control, the Anglo-American concession was half-hearted. General Lee Chai Sum was appreciative though pointed, noting that practices like extraterritoriality had provided fertile soil for the growth of such theories as pan-Asiaticism sick or white man's aggression 58. China's lack of sympathy for London complicated the war effort. In 1944 the British legation in Chongqing informed Anthony Eden that generally speaking, there has been a relative lack of Chinese interest in the British and American disclosures about Japanese atrocities. 
It is also possible that the Chinese appreciate and secretly sympathize with the fact that one Japanese aim in perpetrating these atrocities was the humiliation of the white man, as part of the plan for his expulsion from East Asia. 59. Similarly, London knew that Indians were better treated than Europeans during their internment in Hong Kong but was reluctant to broadcast the awkward fact. Point 60 The Empire's commander in chief in India was perplexed by this stance. Point 61 Unfortunately, because Japanese atrocities against Europeans were downplayed for fear it would delight Asians, great swathes of Asia such as India, the Malay Peninsula, and elsewhere today have difficulty accepting the enormity of Tokyo's crimes during the war. But what of atrocities against the Chinese? Here it was thought that London had gone overboard, as when it reported that the Japanese had placed some thousands of Chinese on six junks, towed them to sea, and abandoned them. One British official asked in awe, how could some thousands of Chinese be put on six junks and if the junks had sails, etc., why should they just be towed out to sea and then left? Atrocity stories of this sort don't seem to hold water. 62 others thought that atrocity stories, even when accurate, were designed to delay opening a second front in Europe. 63 Even a top news editor from the well respected British Broadcasting Corporation was a little concerned about the reporting of news of the fighting in China in our Japanese news bulletins. The news contained in these communiques is unreliable. I have been told that Chinese official communiques are written more as propaganda than as news and on various occasions heavy fighting has been reported in areas where there are known to be no Chinese troops. 64. The Empire was perplexed about how to report on Japanese outrages. There was propaganda value, it thought, in the Hong Kong atrocities but the value in Europe is today low. Why? Because reportage would create the impression that we have manufactured a lame story to cover up a poor show 65 How could the mighty empire credibly report that their alleged racial inferiors had soundly defeated them, and committed barbarities to boot? London's perplexity indicated the conundrum created when white supremacy went to war. In 1942 the embattled colonial government in India wrote, the point is to emphasize by every means Japanese barbarity towards other Asiatics, but not to bolster up Japanese self-proclaimed role as defender of Asiatics by putting out stories of their barbarous treatment of Europeans 66 Thus the policy of white supremacy had led to the downplaying of admitted atrocities against Europeans, which in turn encouraged Tokyo to commit even more crimes in the name of fighting white supremacy. The question of how to report on Japanese atrocities confounded the empire. The viceroy, writing to an official in India, reported with exasperation that Japanese propaganda is working hard to present the war in the Far East as a matter of Asiatics, yellow and brown, against Europeans. In order to ram home this theme, they regularly put out stories of, 1, insulting behavior of European and Dominion troops towards Indian troops, 2, neglect of safety and comfort of Indian troops by their white officers, 3, preferential treatment of Europeans in arrangements for evacuation, 4. Irreproachable behavior of Japanese toward Asiatic prisoners of war and inhabitants of occupied territory. In fact they are doing all they can to inflame the lowest passions, which racial and color prejudice can stir up as the empire knew only too well. 67. The suggested policy admitted atrocities against Europeans had to be downplayed while those against Asiatics had to be emphasized was, in a sense, surprising. Whereas it was once thought that the lives of the latter were worth less than those of the former, the compulsions of war meant the old notion had to be turned on its head, at least on paper. In any case, after the war ended it became impossible to return to white supremacy in the old way. As if the empire did not have its hands full fighting Tokyo not to mention dealing with Moscow it also had to come to grips with persistent probing from Washington. The problem for London was that it was heavily dependent on Indian troops, who were increasingly attracted to various anti-British groups. In the pre-war era India always paid the maintenance costs of about 20% of the British Army and 10-20% to of the RAF, indirectly subsidizing their net estimates to the same degree 68 London might be able to survive by keeping all its various foes off balance, turning one against another, while allying with yet another. 
but its rivals were not blind to the fact as the historian Christopher Thorne put it that as a world power, Britain herself had been in decline since the last third of the 19th century, to the point where her position had come to rest essentially on a series of bluffs. 69 As the crucial month of December 1941 approached, it was apparent that these brazen bluffs were being called by virtually all the parties, including a progressively stronger Washington. It was likewise clear that there was a palpable difference between the war in Europe and that in the Asia-Pacific region. For the most part, the former involved restoring the sovereignty of nations or resisting threats to sovereignty, while for the most part the latter involved or so thought certain European powers restoring colonial empires. These closed empires did not have the open door so necessary for the penetration of U.S. business. The United States had its own interests in Asia that did not necessarily include playing second fiddle to the empire indefinitely. Point seventy. Thus, it was no source of surprise that London and Washington would clash more severely in the Asia-Pacific theater than in Europe. Anglo-American naval cooperation flourished in the Atlantic but not in the Pacific, where Douglas MacArthur and Chester Nimitz maintained separate intelligence organizations from London, even though the Royal Navy had been largely absent from the region since its debacle in Singapore in 1942.71 and despite the unrivaled importance of the Middle Kingdom during this conflict, when it came to China London would not share their counterintelligence files freely with the Americans 72 overall. In the Asia-Pacific the United States practiced a kind of jackal imperialism, feeding hungrily and amply on London's possessions, while all the while presenting itself as a more reasonable alternative. Point 73. This had not escaped the attention of London, which knew that despite its state sanctioned white supremacy, Washington and other powers presented themselves as more progressive on the racial front in Asia. Thus, the British controlled Shanghai Club on the mainland excluded the Chinese, in contrast with the Circle Sportif Francais, to which access was much less restricted, the American Club. Chinese members from 1929, and the German Club Concordia, Chinese members from 1917.74. Differences between the British and the United States were also prevalent in Hong Kong. Point 75 There, the British resistance leader Lindsay Ride was candid about his dislike for the Yankees. I was violently anti the major American policy in China, which appeared to us to be China for the Americans and Wedemeyer and to hell with everyone else. Washington, the British thought, was not above currying favor with the Chinese at London's expense, presenting itself as the liberal alternative. Thus, there was a hostile belief among the Chinese leadership that the organized British resistance was being kept in South China by the British mainly for the purpose of keeping a foot in the Hong Kong door. This view received a good deal of support and encouragement from the sly and artful American 76 disingenuously, the British would argue, Many Americans were often moved to make a striking observation about the intensity of anti-British sentiment within the Chinese government. Rooted in the suspicion that the British wanted to keep China weak and divided in order to maintain their own imperial strength in Asia. 77. The status of Hong Kong was a sore point between the Empire and those in the United States who wished to inherit Britain's leading role. The State Department deemed it politically undesirable for U.S. troops to retake Hong Kong, then hand it back to London. Winston Churchill was determined, however, that never would we yield an inch of the territory that was under the British flag. This had occurred to President Roosevelt, who was threatening to go over Churchill's head in an appeal to the King and the Parliament. This only fueled suspicion in London. A poll revealed that more than half the U.S. population objected to the return of Hong Kong. Point 78. The popular image grew of the effete though sophisticated empire continually bilking the naive though increasingly powerful U.S. Point 79. The empire found this image quite distasteful. London realized that there was an American aversion to being actively associated with restoring colonial rule especially in areas where they believe that it has made us unpopular. Washington had a sincere if unfounded belief, it thought, that they are more popular than we in these areas, and that it is a positive military advantage if they are not closely associated with us. Eighty years later a British Foreign and Commonwealth Office official recalled that the problem was 
to get back into Hong Kong before the Americans and certainly before the Chinese nationalists. 81. In a most secret missive in early 1944 one bureaucrat was stupefied by the tenacity with which those who oppose us in America seek to eliminate us from the Far Eastern scene. The secret reply, penned by the key political advisor to Lord Mountbatten, charged hotly that London may have to conduct our war against Japan on much the same lines vis a vis the Americans as the Japanese and Germans now adopt in fighting us namely, a certain friendly interest and exchange of information and assistance but no common plan, collaboration, or sacrifice of interests 82. Just as white supremacy had benefited from the dexterous manipulation of ethnic differences between the Chinese and Malays and Indians in Singapore, for example, Japan was now trying to deepen the wedge between the British and Euro-Americans. Jan Henrik Marsman, who escaped from wartime Hong Kong, recalled that during his detention throughout the Jap Six showed they hated the English worse than any other nationality, and always they showed no love for the Americans but they always saved the dregs of their hatred for Englishmen. Englishmen were given the most brutal treatment of all. 83 According to the well-connected U.S. journalist Emily Hahn, who was not interned in wartime Hong Kong, the occupation forces had a feeling toward the British of ruthless, revengeful hate. They had a milder approach toward the United States, hoping to take advantage of Washington's well-known desire to supplant the empire by cutting a deal with the United States. 84 As usual, the Chinese nationalists pursued a parallel strategy, though for ostensibly different reasons. Jiang's policy was to drive a wedge between the British and Americans while obtaining benefits from each. 85 None of this had evaded the attention of London. 86 the United States had its own divide-and-conquer strategy, or so thought London. Britain realized that the Dominions principally New Zealand and Australia mistrusted Japan and feared that the United States wanted to persuade them to follow the US lead. As late as 1919, the War Office in London still saw the United States as a potential threat. Even then UK statesmen recognized that British and US interests clashed. While few politicians regarded Japan as a threat and wanted close ties with it. In the 1920s, Churchill thought there was not the slightest chance that Japan would attack Britain in our lifetimes, an argument which, however wrong, was shared by virtually every decision maker. 87 Just as the empire was trapped between the Chinese Communists and Tokyo, it was also trapped between Japan and the United States both of whom thought they knew the correct answer to a question that London would have preferred to ignore, who should be the logical inheritor of the empire. The British resistance in China was highly suspicious of China's so-called US allies, which was unhelpful in overcoming the common adversary. They believed that US intelligence the Office of Strategic Services, OSS, issued instructions to their secret agents to penetrate the resistance. They knew this because a UK agent, an American subject by birth but a resident in Hong Kong, had decided to become a double agent. According to this top-secret communique, this man had gathered that certain members of the resistance official staff were already in the pay of the OSS 88. The scholar Lee UWA has observed that after 1933, the devotees of rapprochement with Japan dominated the British government and this direction was supported by the Foreign Office and the Treasury 89 as late as 1937, US radicals were charging that London's desire to scotch the ambitions of Washington meant that the empire was willing to ally itself with Tokyo. According to the Daily Worker, the proposed Anglo-Japanese agreement to guarantee the integrity of China is actually designed to divide China up into British and Japanese colonies and strike a blow against American interests and the American open-door policy 90. Those who thought that the intensity of war would put an end to the animosity between Britain and the United States may have been surprised by the goings-on in Stanley Camp in Hong Kong. In the internment camps this divide-and-conquer strategy was deployed nimbly against those who had developed it into a fine art in Asia and Africa. Sir Franklin C. Gimson, who acted as a kind of proconsul of Stanley Camp in Hong Kong in that he had expressed an early interest in operating on behalf of Tokyo, was quite sensitive to the Yankees' tendency to disregard his authority. 91. John Straker, the administrative secretary of Stanley, noticed that neither the American nor Dutch representatives attended the British Communal Council meetings. In any case, 
it is doubtful whether they would have accepted even if they had been invited, which they decidedly were not. Point ninety two Gwen Priest would agreed. Bill Hunt, a leading American capitalist at Stanley had no affection for the empire, one way to make Bill fix anything, the gossip went, was to tell him the British had tried and failed. 93. Actually, the experience of internment brought both ethnic and class distinctions into sharp relief. As one writer put it, the Americans seemed the best organized entity with a commendable tendency to work together. The British, on the other hand, were divided by class, occupation, and prejudice. 94. Thus, the conflict between London and Washington provided Tokyo momentum and complicated the war effort. During the war David Bosanke escaped from Hong Kong to the mainland, whereupon he encountered an American. 95 Though the American was very derogatory about the Japanese, he took a British attitude toward the military, which he deemed beneath his dignity. Fighting was the task of the coolies of you greeted with contempt and incredulity by the author. Bosanke's travails did not cease there. On board ship from India to home in Britain, the American ignored Ed Bosanke entirely and turned to the steward and stammered with derision, God damn it, you've got a limey with you 96. This peevish attitude was rather mild compared to what other Britons encountered. In India on occasion during the war, an irate American officer might suggest, why don't we fight the British instead of the Japanese? That would be a popular war. This prompted a theme song. The Limeys make policy, Yanks fight the Japs 6 slash and one gets its empire, and one takes the rap. 97. Japan's assertion that it was aggressively moving to destroy white supremacy proved to be a powerful mobilizing tool in a world comprised overwhelmingly of Asians, Africans, and Latin Americans. But it was also a risky and hazardous maneuver. For all the major powers save one, Japan, and, possibly the Soviet Union headed by a Georgian could be loosely defined as white, and their socio-economic systems were geared to exploiting the very coloreds Japan was supposedly determined to liberate. Moreover, the primary white power Japan was allied with Germany represented the epitome of racial supremacy that supposedly Tokyo had decided to obliterate. This contradiction was profoundly consequential. It served to undermine Tokyo's appeal among U.S. Negroes who were within the orbit of the Communist Party and whose regular work side by side with Euro-Americans tended to disprove the idea that all whites were beyond the pale. Moreover, how could Tokyo be sure that its so-called comrade in arms, Germany, would not be driven by the logic of its racial dream to turn on Japan since, at the end of the day, if Tokyo's hopes were realized, Berlin was also a potential loser. In fact, had Japan won the war a hot war between Japan and Germany was more likely to follow than was a cold war between the United States and the USSR in the aftermath of an Allied victory. John Morris, who was employed by the Japanese Foreign Office before the war as a language advisor and who maintained good contacts there throughout, remarked that at the time he left Japan, people were saying openly that if the Allies lost the European war, Germany would be Japan's next objective 98. The notion of a German double cross had crossed the minds of Japanese elites as late as 1941. At one high level meeting in Tokyo weeks before the assault on Hong Kong, the question was posed starkly what we should always keep in mind here is what would happen to relations between Germany and Great Britain and the United States, all of them whose population belongs to the white race, if Japan should enter the war. Why should this be a concern? Because Hitler has said that the Japanese are a second-class race, and Germany has not declared war against the United States. Japan will take positive action against the United States. In that event, will the American people adopt the same attitude toward us psychologically that they do toward the Germans? Their indignation against the Japanese will be stronger than their hatred of Hitler. This comment was prescient. Hara Yoshimichi, president of the Privy Council, a group of distinguished leaders who advised the emperor. Often asked questions in the imperial conferences on behalf of the emperor. He was blunt, I fear, therefore, that if Japan begins a war against the United States, Germany and Great Britain and Germany and the United States will come to terms, leaving Japan to herself. That is, 
we must be prepared for the possibility that hatred of the yellow race might shift the hatred now being directed against Germany to Japan, thus resulting in the German-British wars being turned against Japan. We must give serious consideration to race relations, exercise constant care to avoid being surrounded by the entire Aryan race which should leave Japan isolated and take steps now to strengthen relations with Germany and Italy. But Japan too was enmeshed in contradictions all its own that allowed for no easy exit. The Japanese leader pleaded, don't let hatred of Japan become stronger than hatred of Hitler, so that everybody will in fact gang up on Japan. Tojo, who was to pay the ultimate price as a chief engineer of Japan's racial policies, added, the points are well taken. I intend to take measures to prevent a racial war once war is started. I should like to prevent Germany and Italy from making peace with Great Britain or with the United States. 99. While the Allies dealt with internal rifts not only between London and Washington but also between Moscow and its partners, the tensions between Tokyo and its allies were considerably more acute. A Soviet writer captured this reality in 1944. Unquestionably Hitler's Germany is not overpleased with her Far Eastern ally. Japan is pursuing her own aims and apparently has no intention of coordinating her East Asian affairs with Hitler's strategic plans. It is impossible to conceal Japanese-German difference in estimating the general military situation. 100. The BBC also knew about the deep divisions that often marked Tokyo-Berlin relations. It reported that the Japan-German pact did not appeal to the people of Japan. Both Italy and Germany supplied China with arms and supplies of every kind from 1937 onwards. The German military mission under Falkenhausen directed the operations around Shanghai in 1937, thus costing the Japanese thousands of lives. Although officially at war with Chongqing, the German government has always taken a very conciliatory attitude towards it in their pronouncements, while the German press delights in reporting on conditions in Nanking. China in such a way as to discredit the puppet government and indirectly the Japanese. 101. Part of the BBC's propaganda arsenal was an intercepted letter from a high-ranking German excoriating the Japanese, terming them yellow subhumans, little yellow animals in uniform, cleverer than world jewelry, and more scathing intended insults. 102 The BBC knew though it kept it confidential that the Japan translation of Main Camp omits as one would expect the whole of the famous passage in Chapter 11 where Hitler denies that Japan has any culture of her own. 103 It noted that in a well known Japanese journal in late 1942, a prestigious professor condemned the pitiless exploitation of Europe by the Germans. 104 Likewise, the scholar Louise Young has also suggested that Tokyo's fear of a white united front to squelch its plans for racial revolution were not far-fetched. She writes that long experience with racial discrimination by Europeans, Americans and British colonists in Canada, Australia and New Zealand led Japanese to interpret Western diplomatic opposition in racial terms. Thus, one Japanese writer complained not altogether inaccurately of the current control of the League of Nations by the white race. Hence, the specter of a solid phalanx of white powers united against Japan led to gloomy scenarios of economic blackmail and worse 105. Japan's rulers were also justifiably anxious about Berlin's ability to deflect wartime hatred toward the Pacific. Stephen Ambrose comments that there was not much room for racism in a war that pitted German soldiers who had American cousins against American soldiers who had German parents. Fully one-third of the U.S. Army was of German descent, not to mention the supreme commander in the European theater, whose name was Eisenhower, the commander of the air bombardment of Germany was named Spatz. The European front could hardly compare with that in Asia, which involved that most racist war of all 106. When the writer John Toland interviewed Oshima Hiroshi, Japan's ambassador to Germany, he sensed Hiroshi's anxiety about Japan's relationship with Germany. According to Toland, Hiroshi recalled that Hitler didn't know about Japan at first. In 1922 he wrote Mein Kampf in which he didn't speak particularly well of Japan. This was a gross understatement. Thus, during the war there was not much done in cooperation between the two powers, they exchanged information, but not much more. 
Later Hiroshi asserted that Goering complained to me saying that your general is helping Jews in North Manchuria. I had it investigated and found it was true. The Jews never did any harm to Japan, therefore, there was no reason for us to reject them. Not only that Rothschild and Schiff but also in Germany such Jews as Greenberg had furnished military funds for Japan. I further told Goering that Japan was using Jews who had escaped, from the Nazis, in such activities as collecting information on Russia, therefore they were useful, dot. 107. Hiroshi was not being misleading, Tokyo did diverge sharply from its alleged ally on the bedrock question of anti-Semitism. 108. Dr. Karl Kinderman was Jewish and lived in Japan throughout the war. While there he had been specially protected by Japanese friends who were high in the ranks of the ultra-patriotic Black Dragon Society. This was part of a larger Japanese plan not to participate in the incineration of Jews but to rescue them and deploy their resources and skills on behalf of Tokyo. 109 A striking number of besieged German Jews even anti-fascists looked not to Europe or North America for refuge but to Japanese-occupied Asia. 110 Japanese diplomats like the legendary Suji Harakayun saved thousands of Jews on the eve of the show by issuing visas from European posts such as Lithuania. 111 Solomon Bard interned in Hong Kong, detected no anti-Semitism among his captors. They made absolutely no effort to distinguish those in the camp who were Jews, he recalled later, Nazi doctrine in this respect did not reach as far as US-112. Catherine Davis was in Japan during the war. There was quite a large Jewish Orthodox colony from Syria, Egypt, Mesopotamia, who were in the cotton business, some were immensely wealthy and constantly threw huge parties among themselves, with every kind of luxury, while the rest of the population was practically starving. She was located in Kobe and added that the Chinese were also chiefs of the black market and we managed to get what we wanted from them. 113. The empire recognized in the fall of 1942 that relations between the Nazis and the Japanese appear to have been particularly strained at Shanghai but technicians with European training are badly needed, as Nazis are unwilling to cooperate except on terms of inequality or even superiority galling to the Japanese conqueror, thus the Jews have been called in. 114 In fact, according to the Canadian Jewish News, after Adolf Hitler's accession to power, Shanghai was the only place where a Jew persecuted by Nazism could emigrate without a visa or family sponsorship. 115 James Ross who studied the matter intensively, argues that the documents show that the Japanese distrusted the Gestapo. The Japanese occupiers in Shanghai could be cruel and certainly were familiar with anti-Semitism but they never succumbed to or even comprehended the anti-Jewish hatred that consumed their German allies. The Japanese did restrict the European Jewish refugees to a ghetto after May 1943 but not to placate the Gestapo. They were more concerned with security issues, such as reports of black market activity among the refugees. 116 Jakob Wilksek, now a doctor in Haifa agreed, adding, the Japanese occupying forces of Shanghai were neither racists nor Jew haters. On many occasions, he said of his experience under Japanese rule, the Japanese emphasized that they were not racist. 117 Perhaps this is why there was a long term collaboration between white Russian emigrants, including those who were Jewish, and the Japanese army in the Far East, notably in the area surrounding Harbin. The Japanese occupation of Harbin in February 1932, said one commentator, was joyously welcomed by the numerous Russian emigres. 118. At the same time, British propagandists acknowledged other differences between Tokyo and Berlin. 119 The BBC decided that on their broadcasts to Tokyo only non Japanese scholars of the language ought to speak in broadcasts in Japanese. Japan is a far more deeply nationalist country than Germany or Italy, and the hatred aroused among Japanese listeners for a traitor speaker would be likely to outweigh the effect of the broadcast. 120 This also suggests that there was more unity in Japan behind the war than in Germany. In short, Tokyo-Berlin relations were far from ideal. John Morris, a contract worker with the Japanese Foreign Office before the war, was allowed to write anti-Nazi articles with impunity, an act that led to his being reported by the German embassy. 
I was writing articles in denunciation of Japan's closest ally, he remarked. He agreed that the Japanese dislike of the Germans arose from the Nazis' extreme arrogance and the fact that they made no attempt to disguise their contempt for the Japanese 121 as he was leaving Tokyo, he noted that Japanese people were saying quite openly that if the Allies lost the European war Germany would be Japan's next objective. In fact, I once heard it said quite seriously that the Japanese army put the nations of the world into three classes, enemies, neutral enemies, and friendly enemies. Japan's Axis partners making up the last class. 122. His perceptions were confirmed in Shanghai. A 1942 police report noted that thought is gradually gaining ground among Germans and Italians. That all trade possibilities will disappear. The ever-increasing military and economic might of Japan is evidently beginning to worry her Axis partners who consider there may be no limit to Japan's expansion. According to a British intelligence report, the Japanese were treating all whites, whether enemies or friends, exactly alike. A repatriated American missionary recalled an incident when a German lady on horseback was stopped at the barrier where Great Western Road crosses the railroad to have her pass examined by the Jap 6th century. He made her dismount and kept her waiting for some time during which time her horse dropped a lot of dung. Returning, the sentry ordered her to clean up the place, refused to lend her a brush and dustpan, and made her remove the filth with her hands. 123 such antipathy was not just a product of Shanghai's peculiar environment. In the fall of 1944 Canberra reported that German nationals in Hong Kong are being carefully watched and it is rumored that they are liable to be interned at any time pending new developments 124. The wellspring of racial ideology was different in Tokyo, as opposed to Berlin or London and Washington, for that matter. In Japan these doctrines grew out of the anxiety and hysteria caused by the U.S. intervention there in the 1850s and by Britain's seizure of Chinese territory. One scholar has concluded that it is difficult in fact to find anything in 17th or 18th century Japan which resembles a coherent ideology of race. It was mostly post-Meiji, that is, part of the anxious rush to modernity in the 1860s. Moreover, German Nazi ideology failed to attract much of a following in Japan 125. The prickly and barbed differences between Tokyo and Berlin were manifested in ways large and small. The Japanese in general disliked the National Socialist members' arrogance and contempt for the Japanese and the authorities kept a permanent tail on the German ambassador to Japan, General Eugene Ott and the German military attaché 126 Gwen Terasaki, a Euro-American married to a Japanese diplomat, noticed this taut unease. After being interned with German officials in the United States after the assault on Pearl Harbor, she quickly noticed that the Axis powers were incomparable at several points. Again, after decamping in Mozambique she attended an Axis party that was not a success. This was the beginning of my conviction that the tripartite pact appealed to none of the people represented by the signatories. How unnatural and even hostile the Germans and the Japanese were to each other in all their relationships, she marveled. While residing in Japan she realized the hostility I was to experience toward myself throughout the war occurred almost without exception because I was mistaken for a German 127. Jan Henrik Marsman had a similar experience, as Japanese forces were conducting mopping up operations in December 1941 in Hong Kong. At the Peninsula Hotel one morning a very bulky and officious looking German with a big swastika on his armband strode toward the entrance, stopped, clicked his heels, gave the Nazi salute, and trumpeted, Heil Hitler. He apparently expected some sort of response. But the sons of Hirohito continued their pacing without any heiling or even momentary hesitation. The German moved forward to enter the hotel. Japanese bayonets blocked the way. Some guttural conversation followed, apparently the sentries wanted to see the Nazis pass. The German grew very angry and shouted, out of my way. Let me pass. Japanese steel didn't give an inch. More hard words followed, and two other Japanese soldiers came up. One grabbed the German by his neck and the other yanked him around by his midriff. Together they threw him into the street. 128. 
Akira Iri is correct in saying that although they shared their hostility toward the Anglo-American nations, too much separated Germany and Japan racially, culturally, and historically to turn the alliance into anything more than a marriage of convenience. Even after Pearl Harbor, Germany and Japan never organized a combined force or established combined chiefs of staff, unlike their enemies. 129. Germany knew and did not appreciate the fact that Japan never declared war on the nation they saw as the root of all evil, the Soviet Union. The latter reciprocated by not declaring war on Japan until August 1945. Iri has pointed to the conspicuous fact that many people in Japan, including some in the army, were envisioning a grand alliance with Moscow. 130 This is one of the many reasons why the thesis of a firmly conceived conspiracy between Berlin and Tokyo was not proven at the Tokyo War Crimes trial. Instead, it was concluded that Japan's association with the tripartite pact was for defensive purposes to protect their move south in the Pacific and to keep the U.S. out of the China War. Japan continued to act with independence, not in a global conspiracy with the Nazis. 131. Personal anecdotes confirmed this conclusion. Hans J. Masakoy was born in Germany of parents who were African and German and grew up there during the war years. One of his co-workers in the midst of this titanic conflict told him, don't think that they that is, Japan will be satisfied with being the rulers in Asia. As soon as this war is over, the Japanese will send a special hit squad to Berlin and assassinate Hitler. After that, they will take over the entire world. 132. One scholar has gone further, suggesting that the blanket term fascism does not describe the differences he has perceived between Tokyo and its wartime allies. A wide gap in fact existed between the doctrines and regimes of Imperial Japan and those of Italian fascism and German Nazism. The Italian-German influence on the Japanese regime was confined to economic and legal and economic management fascism. Japan's alliance with Italy and Germany was no more the effect of ideological proximity than was the alliance of the Western democracies with the Soviet Union. Political parties were suppressed in 1940 in Japan but their members continued to sit in the lower house, an unimaginable state of affairs in Italy or Germany at that time 133. Japan may not have acted in concert with Germany but it surely sought to enlist other nations particularly those today described as third world nations in their crusade. This was particularly the case for Mexico, which bore a long-term grievance against its northern neighbor not least because the latter had seized a good deal of its territory in the 19th century. The white supremacy involved in the relations between Mexico City and Washington added to Tokyo's desire to intervene in their strained bilateral relationship. If Japan could open up a front on the southern border of the United States, its dream of establishing a new racial order would be that much closer. This thought also had occurred to the press baron, William Randolph Hearst, who in 1917 produced a film which showed Japanese and Mexican troops looting, murdering, and raping as they invaded the United States 134 Although Japan's plan perished well before the onslaught in Hiroshima, it was not for lack of trying particularly in the pre-war years by Tokyo. A few years after its enormous victory over Russia in 1905, Complaints arose in southern Arizona on the Mexican border and in territory that only recently had belonged to Mexico that Japan was extending its reach across the Pacific. Vile Japanese, it was said, were halted at the border. With more than $20,000 in good hard cash in their possession and the allegation that they had $11,000 more in the bank in San Francisco. Inspector Jones has recently turned a number of various characters back, including a spy who was now under arrest 135. Washington had concluded early on that Tokyo had imperialistic designs in the Western Hemisphere. A great outcry greeted Japan's putative plan in 1912 to purchase an enormous tract of land in Lower California, Mexico. 136. At the same time the U.S. ambassador was arguing that recent anti-American disturbances were accompanied by very strong appeals made through a number of Mexican papers to the people of this country to cultivate the friendship of the Japanese, making very clear insinuations as the advisability of an alliance with them in case of trouble with the United States. This appeal was the subject of much comment among the members of the diplomatic corps here, 
as was the possibility of a secret understanding between the two countries 137 Theodore Roosevelt asserted that it seems incredible that Japanese should go to Mexico with any intention of organizing an armed force to attack us from the Mexican border in the event of war with Japan but others were not so sure perhaps not even TR himself. 138 for in a personal and private letter to President Taft. He worried justifiably that Japan or some other big power might back Mexico in case of war with the United States. 139. These matters were developing as Mexico was in the throes of the first and one of the most significant revolutions of the century. Soon Washington came to believe that Tokyo was fishing energetically in the troubled waters of its southern neighbor. In the midst of this conflict a well-informed U.S. commentator waxed insightfully on the Japanese problem. I will wager that within 25 years the United States of America and Japan will clinch in one of the bitterest wars in history. This was no small matter. The safety of our country and of the white race, he declared, depends on our protecting China against the scheming of policies of Japan. With foreboding, he added, the issue will not be a question of European backyards that will be involved, but it will be a question of which race shall inhabit the globe 140. Congressman William H. Murray of Oklahoma agreed. He linked Mexico to Japan and added that the right policy now might determine the future political map of the world, it may determine whether Republican government shall endure upon this continent. It may determine whether Mexico is to become a white man's country or to be under the control and domination of Asiatic races. It may ultimately determine not only the perpetuity of our own republic, but the civilization of the Aryan race. The pages of history are replete with the rise and fall not only of nations but of races. Is history to repeat itself and at the end of another hundred years to witness the dawn of the 21st century with the world's domination by Japanese and Chinese, both in point of number and empire? The Mexican problem, he added with a flourish, may answer this question. He also saw a distinction between German interventions in the hemisphere and that of Japan. To colonize America by European monarchies would be to destroy our republic, but would preserve white civilization. To colonize the American continent with the Asiatic races would destroy our civilization as well as the republic. There are worse things than war. To be dominated by an inferior race or to witness the destruction of the Christian civilization is a hundredfold worse than war. 141 these presentiments of doom arose in the midst of revelations about a shocking plan the plan of San Diego to liquidate all Euro-American males in the southwest, retaking land seized from Mexico decades earlier, and establishing independent Negro and Native American republics on the emptied land. This plan apparently involved not only Mexicans and Mexican-Americans but also the Japanese.142. Mexico's notable antipathy toward gringos was not matched by resentment toward the Japanese. They were decidedly not the targets of the anti-foreign hatred directed at most other nationalities as xenophobia took flight. By the fall of 1915 South Texas was on the verge of race war and fingers of accusations were being pointed in the direction of Tokyo.143 when word emerged from congressional hearings that Tokyo might be aiding Pancho Villa, whose forces had sacked Columbus, New Mexico, thunderous hysteria erupted in the United States. 144. This extreme agitation reached new heights when a Mexican mission was dispatched to Tokyo in 1918. U.S. intelligence remarked on the unusual attention that was shown the Mexicans by the Japanese. There were several conferences and banquets and the visitors were permitted to visit the government arsenals, military and naval academies and private factories capable of turning out military supplies and apparently every opportunity was given them to study the manufacture of munitions. The purpose of the visit could only be supply of war munitions, particularly machine guns and small arms since all the Mexicans connected with this mission have been openly hostile to the United States and have been insisting in their talk with the Japanese that the United States is a big tyrant and is consistently taking liberties with Mexico 145. As the revolution wound down by the 1920s and as left-wing forces relatively immune to Tokyo's racial appeals grew in strength U.S. concern about the Japan-Mexico relationship eased. But in 1932 U.S. intelligence fixated on an article by General Juan Marigo, who said that in case of war between the United States and Japan, 
Mexico would not necessarily align with the former, due to the hatred. In case of war, he said, Mexico would become the ally of Japan. That not only Mexico but Peru, Chile, Argentina, Honduras, Guatemala, Salvador, Costa Rica, Nicaragua, Colombia, and Venezuela countries which have reason to dislike the United States would also ally themselves with Japan. If a national plebiscite were taken the Mexican people would vote to go to war, but as allies of Japan. This officer was greatly loved by his men and was extremely well posted on military affairs, so his words had to be taken seriously. Marigo did not mention the thousands of Brazilians of Japanese descent, particularly in the key urban center of Sao Paulo. But Washington could not afford to ignore his words. 146 for the plan of San Diego alone showed that white supremacy was dragging down those who heretofore had accepted this doctrine as if it were gospel. Conclusion In the wake of white supremacy, the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki effectively ended the Pacific War and with it Tokyo's dream of a complete racial reversal. On the other hand, the changes that had been wrought in the theater of war had been so deep-seated and profound that it was no longer possible to return to the status quo. Anti point one Hong Kong witnessed the decline of racial segregation and the arrogance that accompanied it, along with the rise of a cotter of indigenous capitalists. Many had become wealthy by collaborating with the Japanese, which set them apart from the pre-war Chinese compradors allied to British business interests. Their rise also served to further discredit the notion of white supremacy. As a leading Hong Kong academic, Henry Lethbridge, put it controversially though not inaccurately the occupation worked ultimately to the benefit of the leaders of the Chinese community. The British Mandarinate collapsed in 1941, it has never been replaced. 2. When Eugene D. Williams of the United States arrived in Japan just after the war, he was staggered. No one who has seen it, he wrote, can visualize the damage done to the industrial portions of Japan by our Air Force. Officers who have just arrived here from Europe say that it looks a lot worse than it does there. He was impressed with the people, who seem to work all the time like ants. They appear to accept their subjugation and defeat with equanimity and to be very friendly to us. But he added, ominously, I do not believe that they actually are. My personal opinion is that they have a vast capacity for hypocrisy and underneath it all they hate our guts. Three but intense bombing of Japan culminating in Hiroshima was, in part, an expression of such intense animosity. Williams may have been mistaking simple adjustment to a new reality for something more sinister which, of course, was typical of dealings by Euro-Americans and Europeans with the Japanese over the decades. The Hong Kong solicitor, Ralph Malcolm MacDonald King, must have had a particularly nasty experience, for he concluded years after the war, I wouldn't trust a Japanese now as long as I saw him. Sooner or later they're going to come back they're going to be the scourge that they were before. I would never trust them. They are an untrustworthy race. 4. Some dissented. Norman Cliff, a son of missionaries in northern China who was interned in Japan, upon being freed remarked about his former captors, just as they had been enthusiastic conquerors, so they were now enthusiastic losers. What an amazing race the Japanese were. 5. John Straker of Stanley partially agreed. He recalled that as the war wound down, his captors became ingratiating. One would expect it of them and one must expect it in the future, for outwardly he is your most hospitable host, inwardly he is your dangerous competitor. 6. Sterling C. Grave thought he had uncovered a central reason for Japan's alleged dissimulation. If a robber steals $100 billion, he asked, and successfully hides the money before he is captured and jailed, and then is released after seven years for good behavior, did he fail or succeed, seven in other words, Japan was driven by the desire to mask its unjust enrichment. C. Graves' assessment was echoed by another analyst, who estimated that in Hong Kong alone, goods worth $10,000 million were taken off during Japan's 44-month stay 8. Much of this property had belonged to the British, which suggested the dimensions of London's loss and the point that Japan's desire for racial reversal was not thwarted even in defeat. The undoing of the British Empire, 
whose heart was in Asia, was largely attributable to Japan. Russell Clark, an Australian reporter, arrived in Hong Kong in August 1945 just after the Japanese surrender and was able to witness the surreal effects of Tokyo's invasion. Many of the cars and much of the city's physical plant had been shipped in previous years directly to Japan, giving the city a strangely empty feeling. The narrow serpentine streets of Hong Kong were littered with the detritus of war. The once proud Hong Kong University, which sat majestically on a hill, was a shrunken hull of its old self, with the library and laboratories alike thoroughly looted. Japanese propaganda had charged that HKU provided a damaging Occidental influence which in many cases had the effect of imparting to Asiatic students an inferiority complex but now it would have to be rebuilt a new point nine a good deal of the pre-war population had fled and those who remained appeared to be spiritless wraiths. As he surveyed the destitution and haggard appearance of the newly freed internees, he was moved to his racial core, I have never in my life before been so ashamed, he said of being white and British. I wanted to hide myself because I was the same color and belonged to the same race. What he saw were virtual human skeletons with rags for clothes, ravenously hungry, and scrounging for cigarette butts. The poor, unvarying diet had affected the eyesight of many of them in some cases to complete blindness. Their craving for food had affected their powers of concentration. Their minds wandered and refused to grasp and hold on to a fact or a line of thought or conversation. Often as you talked to them, you would see them shake their heads like a punch-drunk fighter. The dead were lucky. It was the living who suffered, he concluded. We are gentlemen, I use the racial we, but not the recently deposed rulers. His sympathy for the internees was matched by his abhorrence for their captors, we hate the Japanese and we shall not forget. Now, beaten, they were suddenly ridiculous little savages again who had tried to ape the white man the implication being that only the white man was allowed to rampage and engage in racial subjugation. He was clear in his mind about what was at stake, if the Japanese had won, we should have been slaves his slaves and in the very real sense of the word. It was very different from Europe's war. This was racial a war against savages. His attitude and that of others toward certain Chinese was similar. A new code of ethics and honor had developed, particularly toward any Chinese driving a car. He was fair game. He had either stolen it from the Japs sick or was working for them. In either case your right to it was greater than his. He and others like him had yet to jettison the pre-war notion that certain things, no matter how commonplace, such as driving a car, were reserved for those of pure European descent, and those who violated this dictum merited little more than a sound thrashing. It would take a while for him to discard this now antiquated idea, just as it would take him a while to understand that a cotter of affluent Chinese had arisen in the post-war dispensation. Clark and many others of pure European descent were possessed of unbridled racial fury in the immediate aftermath of the war a fury that at times made no distinction between the Japanese foe and the supposed Chinese ally. The white man is too good, he said. He doesn't teach the kind of lessons the yellow man is likely to remember. Instead, he treats the yellow as though he were white. And the yellow man leers and smiles to himself. My view is that they are savages, but savages on their way up. In another 500 years or perhaps a lot less they can become a frightening menace. But what was to be done? For the time being, Clark was wandering around the rubble-strewn streets of Hong Kong in search of like-minded people. He spoke to a European doctor who mentioned that he had lived in Japan for 25 years, including the war. I thought they loved, he said sadly. I know they loved me. Yet when the war started and they were told to hate all white men, they turned on me like wolves. Then they were told they weren't to hate the white man anymore. So they came back, and they were the old friends I used to know. He spoke to some Chinese who also had noticed reversals that seemed opportunistic. One in particular recalled that some British had become friendly for the first time. With rancor he noted when one used to say that although the Chinese can own a house on the peak, he cannot live in it that the peak is reserved only for whites. 
or if you marry a Chinese or Eurasian girl your public service career is finished and your social status wrecked. The British, he asserted distastefully, would not give the local Chinese a chance for advancement. Before the war no Chinese could ever get a really worthwhile job. With firm conviction he declared, it will be different when China take back Hong Kong. Said Clark warily, wherever you looked or listened on every hand, this was being said, in a hundred ways. When China takes back Hong Kong. 10. Unfortunately for the Chinese, London had no intention of returning Hong Kong though it recognized fully that it could not resume its old ways of ruling though this was not immediately apparent. Point 11 When Sir Cecil Harcourt met with his Japanese counterpart on August 31, 1945 on board the HMS Indomitable, he heard loud complaints that British sailors attacked the Japanese soldiers in Hong Kong, even after the surrender, though the Chinese populace as a whole has not committed acts against the Japanese. 12 But the Europeans, who had suffered terribly during the war and had been subjected to ample race-baiting themselves, were in no mood for rational discussion. That innocent Chinese might have been swept up in this revenge was not their primary concern. Point 13. Vice Admiral Sir Cecil Harcourt arrived in Hong Kong in 1945 just after the Japanese had been defeated, at the same time as Russell Clark was walking the rubbish-strewn streets. Now chastened after the brutality of war, he was dismissive of his fellow Europeans returning to Hong Kong. Who did not realize that they had to have a 1946 outlook, that outlook is imbued with a spirit of national pride in China and the national sovereignty of China. The 1941 outlook is absolutely taboo. There seemed to be some who were either unwilling or unable to understand this, but if they continue in ignorance of the change they will be heading for trouble. Sir Cecil wanted to overturn decades of racial segregation and put Chinese in positions of responsibility in the government and attack the color bar problem. The prohibition against Chinese living in the peak must be replaced with a system whereby everywhere a man is judged by his merits and character and not by the color of his skin. Thus, prior to the war, the majority of policing in Hong Kong was done by Indians. In this new Chinese national spirit they will not be policed by foreign races. 14. Alexander Grantham concurred. He returned as governor in 1947, having first arrived in Hong Kong in the 1920s. A marked decline in social snobbishness was one of the first things I noticed after my return, he said. The Taipan and the senior government official were no longer regarded, nor did they so regard themselves, as demigods. I observed, too, a greater mixing of the races. Grantham was contrite in the wake of the Japanese occupation. It is the mental arrogance on the part of some Europeans towards Asians that has created as much, if not more resentment than the physical aggressions like the establishment of colonies and territoriality, he exclaimed. The basis of the arrogance is the assumption that the European is inherently superior to the Asian, taking such forms as the exclusion of Asians from clubs, downright rudeness, or a patronizing manner. That era was over, the age of the blimps is over, though a few of them still remain, even in Hong Kong. The insularity and provincial-mindedness of some of the leading businessmen also struck me. Such a narrow outlook seemed strange in one of the great commercial centers of the world. 15. Perhaps. But this great commercial center had just undergone an occupation that had left those like Grantham and Sir Cecil eager for change, while other blimps were not so sure. Fortunately for the former, many of the latter had departed for greener pastures. Hong Kong's pre-war population of 2 million was down to about 600,000. According to the historian G. B. Endicott, a conspicuous factor in the ability of the new colonial officials to implement their more capacious vision was that so few of the old colonials returned and so many new Europeans came to take their places. With their departure an old form of racism also exited. Moreover, political uncertainty and British impoverishment through the sacrifices of the war discouraged the inflow of British capital into the colony and the Chinese increasingly expanded small businesses. The war inevitably temporarily undermined Britain's economic strength and impaired her influence in the world while Asians developed greater national self-consciousness. This, 
along with an increasing number of Chinese who entered the professions created a refurbished economic system that simultaneously allowed for less space for the old type of racism. Point 16. However, in the immediate post-war era, as the internees many of them no more than bags of bones emerged stumbling from the camps, some of them hungered for a revival of antebellum white supremacy. The recently released internee, William Sewell, thought that many from Stanley were endeavoring to re-establish the status quo, not realizing that a new order was struggling to birth in Asia. They did not recognize that life could never be the same in the Far East. Asia for the Asiatics had struck responsive chords in the hearts of youth and any shreds of false superiority had gone from the British and Americans. Perhaps naively, he thought that now that the war had ended, won't we all find it easier to identify with those who suffer? 17. This hope reflected the chastened mood of the colonial authorities and the British generally in Hong Kong. A few days after the respected South China Morning Post resumed publication in 1945 after the end of the occupation, a front-page item complained about the vertical race relations that had prevailed. Now a horizontal, more non-racial approach was desired, not least because verticality had provoked much resentment of which the Japanese later took full advantage. But people like Russell Clark who rousted Chinese from automobiles suggested that change would be resisted, so did the seeming neglect of the Chinese population for the first fortnight of our freedom. This sparked bitterness, though the blimps were happy to report that we are getting back to the old Hong Kong all right. It was true, old conservatism dies hard 18. But die it must. For not only had the British been humiliated at the hands of those not of pure European descent, they had suffered tremendous losses during the war. White supremacy had been born on a wave of wealth and had difficulty sustaining itself in the face of the gargantuan financial setback sustained during the war. The formerly eminent Sir C. Granville Alabaster claimed that as a result of the war he had lost furniture, household goods, silver, cutlery, glass, carpets, pictures, clothes, bedding, jewelry, motor car, wireless set, Masonic regalia, etc. All looted by the Japanese 19 the managing director of the Hong Kong and Shanghai Hotel said that he was requested by the commissioner of police to destroy all spiritous liquor as the invasion unfolded, this was worth about $275,000 including about $75,000 worth transferred from the Peninsula Hotel 20 The Jesuits suffered heavy material losses. The entire contents of Loyola and Wayan College, Kowloon, were gone. Ricci Hall was badly damaged. 21 claims like this proliferated. Some were compensated and some were not. And, of course, some claims may have been inflated. Then there was the flight of local residents. The British often had a strong desire to depart Hong Kong after Japan's defeat. This was particularly true of senior civil servants. Junior officers, who might stay, did not have the clout of their elders in the new environment. Point 22 Furthermore, many police records were destroyed during the Japanese occupation, which made it difficult to substantiate claims about lost property or to know who needed to be monitored in a city that had quickly become a sunny site for shady figures. Point 23 Many of the old European police officers had either been interned or fled 24 which created more jobs for the Chinese and put more money in their hands. This abrupt and radical change from Chinese penury and British snobbery to the British fleeing in rags while some Chinese gained financially led to considerable social unrest. Virtually on the day of the Japanese surrender, Sir Franklin Gimson told the colonial office of his concern. In the first place, that the local leaders of the Chinese are accused, perhaps on very inadequate grounds, of cooperating with the Japanese. And have lost the confidence of the local Chinese community. That was just one of his concerns, my own views are that in the previous constitution the Chinese were not adequately represented on the councils and I am strongly in favor of the introduction, not necessarily in the central government but in the local government, of a more democratic constitution based on a wide franchise 25. In late August 1946 the Kowloon riots erupted, realizing Sir Franklin's worst fears. 
Europeans and non-Chinese were once again the center for the crowd's attention and stones were hurled at all vehicles driven by or carrying Europeans as passengers. Some of the mob stopped buses and inspected passengers for Europeans or non-Chinese. An Indian pedestrian was said to have been mobbed and his turban torn off his head. The Royal Air Force headquarters at Kato Ori Avenue was stoned. What was the immediate cause for this conflagration? As in similar cases in the United States, it was sparked by police brutality involving a Portuguese officer and a Chinese hawker, who was kicked to death. Point 26. Europeans, even those who were not blimps, were becoming increasingly uncomfortable in Hong Kong. One European advocated a let's get the hell out of China movement, his letter had to be reprinted. Because of the heavy demand. Hundreds of clippings of the letter are believed to have been sent home. This anti-China screed denounced a civilization that matured 2,000 years ago and has not progressed one iota since. The writer maintained that during the war, the Chinese were surrendering every major city and were avoiding all combat. Sure, he remarked with disdain, the Chinese were higher on the evolutional sick ladder than the animals they maltreat so viciously at every opportunity. He was infuriated about the loss of extraterritoriality and suggested that retaliation include pass laws in our countries forcing all Chinese to get residence certificates, while compelling them to relinquish control of any business they might have in favor of our nationals 27. This writer's anti-Chinese polemic reflected the fact that the Chinese in Hong Kong were making steady economic progress in the post-war era. The seeds of this phenomenon had been sown before the war. Cyril Luckin, who arrived in Hong Kong in 1934, recalled that there were a number of quite good building contractors, mainly Chinese, although I think there was a great deal of Japanese money behind them as well. The one and only cement works in the area was owned by a Japanese company, for example. He noted that the Japanese were quite prominent in the business community and sometimes had Chinese partners. 28. But the major expansion in Chinese capitalism in Hong Kong was a direct outgrowth of the wartime environment when, for example, Chinese insurance companies were operating, while all British and allied firms were taken over or liquidated. Their offices were either commandeered or lay abandoned. By May 1942 Japanese firms were encouraged to start up, and so were Chinese firms provided they handled essential products such as food or textiles 29 Alan Dudley Coppin, interned at Sham Shui Po, found that a lot of Chinese shopkeepers were quite practical in doing business with the Japanese, especially along the road around the Sham Shui Po camp. They managed to make peace with the Japanese army there and made good profits. 30. According to W.K. Tang of Hong Kong, the post-war progress by the Chinese would have been even more significant but for white supremacy. If Britain desires her Chinese employees to cooperate heartily with her, he said, she must do away with racial discrimination. You must realize the fact that in all government departments and British-owned firms, Europeans rank the first, local-born Europeans the second, non-Chinese and Indians the third and Chinese the last and the least paid. 31 Yam Xing agreed. In European-owned firms a foreigner holding a junior position was collecting salary and allowance double or more than that of a Chinese holding a senior job. Many foreign girl typists earned much more than that of the Chinese chief clerk. Thus, candidates for jobs are not chosen on grounds of abilities and qualifications. With exasperation he concluded, there is no justice at all 32. A number of Europeans disagreed. One argued that the Chinese should not be treated equally or even well for this only made them hate Europeans. Allegedly a Chinese had told him, the kinder you are to us, the more we hate you. This perverse philosophy conveniently justified the most egregious forms of white supremacy. Chinese do not appreciate kindness, it was said. Why do they lack senior posts? When a Chinese is given a position of responsibility the first thing he thinks of is how to get tea money in the easiest and safest manner 33 as the Chinese pushed vigorously for equity and against white supremacy, they were told that it was the British who had liberated Hong Kong and deserved the spoils, and if the Chinese did not like it, they should go west to the mainland. But tensions were rising on the mainland too. 
In late 1946 almost 15,000 marched in protest in Peking after U.S. soldiers were charged with raping a Chinese woman. One banner read provocatively, We doubt that the Americans are any better for China than the Japanese invaders 34. Many Europeans and Euro-Americans were outraged by what they considered the effrontery and short-sightedness of Asians. Where were the mass atrocities of Chinese perpetrated by Europeans and Euro-Americans? They asked. However, they failed to see that their reluctance to retreat from the more egregious aspects of white supremacy had allowed for the rise of Tokyo in the first place, and that the continuation of racial inequality only jeopardized the hard-earned peace. Thus, as late as the summer of 1947 those of pure European descent were still debating whether they should segregate the Chinese racially on the many ferries that plied the waters of Hong Kong. Supporters of the measure claimed that the alleged Chinese tendency to expect orate unduly would stir up racial prejudice if the ferries were not segregated. 35. Many Chinese were outraged by such claims, particularly the suggestion that the European should take the law into his own hand by thumping the next Chinese offender as hard as possible regardless of consequences. One Chinese responded, one might as well suggest that we have segregation between the Chinese and non-Chinese because the non-Chinese suffer more from bio. Body odor as many who have discovered who sit behind foreigners on hot days in summer. 36. Just as buses became the flashpoint for confrontations over racial segregation in the United States, in Hong Kong the ferries did so. European women were charged with being the key transmitters of bigoted ideas. Britain's worst ambassadors are the women, said one man bluntly. On the Star Ferry, he saw two British women sitting next to a Chinese man in European dress. They exclaimed in high dudgeon, is this a British ferry or not? Then they walked off. Didn't they realize, he asked, in a reference to Tokyo, that the racial discrimination of former years paid sorry dividends in the long run? The British need to take stock of new conditions in this old world of ours. A white skin, he concluded in words that many found hard to accept, does not mean superiority 37. Leslie Wade, a Eurasian formerly with the RAF, had just returned to Hong Kong after an absence of nine years. He was amazed to find no change whatsoever in the general attitude in the colony. The snobbery, the smugness, the lack of tolerance. He wondered whether being mixed blood hasn't something to do with the often chilly reception he received from the colonizers. Barriers as far as joining clubs remained. I am beginning to realize, he said, why so many Eurasians prefer to be known as Chinese 38 Wade had hit on something, said one interlocutor. The memories of Stanley, Sham Shuapo and other camps are gradually fading away and the old superiority complex is asserting itself. Sadly, he observed that it is a strange but true thing that wives of Europeans arriving in Hong Kong for the first time are naturally friendly and willing to make friends with anyone no matter what their race or color but when they have been here for some months, one can see the gradual and subtle change taking place. They distance themselves from anything that is not pure Nordic or Celtic is Asiatic or Eurasian. 39 Eurasians in Singapore were organized, but not those in Shanghai or Hong Kong. Why? Here there seems to be a fear or a heavy complex wherefore the mixed of blood seek absorption in one side or the other. Things were so bad for those with even a hint of Asiatic blood, that he suggested that the United Nations might be asked to establish somewhere in the world a common nation where all the products of mixed marriages would be welcomed 40. It was not simply a problem of techy, unreconstructed white supremacists versus benign Chinese. As noted, a number of Chinese elites had been collaborators, particularly those tied to the KMT. After the war, for example, some of the leading members of the notorious Japanese military police, the Kempitai, went to work for the KMT.41 The armed strength of the pro-Tokyo Wang Jingwei regime from its regular army down to its peace preservation and police units was absorbed into the Chinese Nationalist Forces 42 but however odious their political connections, their maliciously anti-British approach was grounded in justifiable opposition to continued British rule in Hong Kong. 43. 
Britain's dilemma was that the alternative to the KMT the Communists was firmly opposed to colonialism in Hong Kong and, in any event, the post-war climate made a U.K. Communist alliance impossible. Thus, London could not deploy the age-old tactic of leaning toward the left, that is, the Communists, in order to keep the right, that is, the KMT, off balance. In 1948 the leadership of Hong Kong University warned in a confidential message against over-exhorting the British way of life among students. Why? We may provoke the wrong reactions among Chinese, who are fairly evenly divided between the fascist Chiang Kai-shek and the communists. Then there was the ubiquitous America, ready to pounce whenever the empire seemed to be floundering. Point 44. In fact, the British sought to impose a check on loose publications of a political nature hostile to the recognized government of China, meaning the KMT.45 in return, the KMT in a confidential message requested an outright ban on the circulation of CP booklets in Hong Kong. This would receive a favorable hearing.46 yet London was faced with an insoluble problem in that leading elements in the KMT wanted a speedy end to British colonialism in Hong Kong. Only weeks after the Japanese surrender the British conducted a raid on KMT headquarters in Hong Kong 47 an indication of the increasingly touchy relations between the KMT and London. Point 48 the raid was followed by a decision to bar the nationalists from engaging in military recruiting, though their struggle against the communists was becoming increasingly desperate. This action by the British was seen as strange in leading capitals where the anti-communist struggle enjoyed strong support. Point 49 but London persisted in its policy. London had a further problem. Numerous Japanese soldiers had stayed on in China after the war and their role in that nation's affairs was of considerable importance. After the surrender, Japanese officers in and around Nanking were treated like honored guests instead of defeated enemies. For at least a year before Japan's surrender, throughout China rumors circulated to the effect that Jiang's regime had entered into a secret agreement with the Japanese. According to these reports, in return for Japanese help in fighting the communists, both before and after the end of the war, the nationalists would undertake, following Japan's surrender, to protect the Japanese in China and their property as well. As late as January 1947 there were 80,000 Japanese troops in Manchuria under the command of Chang. The Americans became increasingly willing to wink at Jiang's use of the Japanese against the communists. Many Japanese in China agreed to serve the nationalists, a process facilitated by the pre-existing relationships forged by many high-level KMT men trained in Japan. The Japanese continued pushing even as the war ended their alleged mutual racial interests with China and an Asiatic combination against the West. Of course, the communists deployed Japanese troops of their own who leaned left, but they were vastly outnumbered by their counterparts. Point 50 This alliance between the KMT and Japanese military may shed light on why the British were suspicious of various nationalist activities in Hong Kong. Point 51 The British also believed that the KMT was involved in drug dealing. Point 52 In 1946 the British were able to capture a letter from Ogata Shunsuku, a leading Japanese figure in Macau. We should thank especially the Chinese authorities in Canton, he said for their treatment of the Japanese forces and civilians. He was appointed as advisor to the Canton headquarters of the chairman of the military commission. In order to take part in the great reconstruction of China in the future. He added, it is a great error to think that Japan has been defeated, 53 not least since leading KMT figures like General Wu Te Chen had studied in Japan 54. In addition to the relationship between the KMT and Japan, the British also kept track of other currents. The British Embassy in Chongqing informed the Foreign Office in early 1946 about an anonymous article in the Yunnan Daily News which demands with extreme asperity that Siam treat Chinese residents properly now that China is a great power. The Embassy considered this outrageous, next, it was thought, the British would be asked to treat Chinese properly. Likewise, much was made of a translated article from the Shanghai newspaper, Takong Pao, about the supposedly unsettled legal status of Kowloon an essential component of colonial Hong Kong. Point 55. Some British advised a more conciliatory approach in this increasingly complicated situation. 
an editorial in the Post regretted use of the terms European and Chinese. No, it said, the emphasis should be on British. Obviously if we expect the locally born to be militantly pro-British, it is necessary to convince them that they are British. 56 The traditional reluctance to confer full British rights upon the Hong Kong born must be rejected, it said. But the British were trapped once again. Those who wished to return to old-style white supremacy were haunted by the specter of communism gaining ground, particularly among the working class, while many of the Chinese who had collaborated with Japan were profiting handsomely from their wartime activities. Which segment of the population should the colonizers seek to collaborate with? This was one of many aspects of Hong Kong's growing and well-deserved reputation as the paradise of collaborators. This reputation derived in part from the British attempt to besmirch those not of pure European descent who had escaped poverty during the war. Tanya Lee, for example, dates the rise of Chinese affluence in Hong Kong to 1939 not December 1941 when many British departed, this opened up the way at long last for many Eurasians and others of half-caste blood to fill the gaps left and thereby be recognized for their skills. More and more Chinese also were taking their rightful place in positions previously reserved exclusively for Europeans brought out on contract. 57. Nevertheless, after the war, many Hong Kong residents were dismayed and disgusted at the number of Chinese collaborators and outright traders who are now resident in, and enjoying the amenities of this colony, particularly alleged traders from Shanghai. Prominent among the traders now enjoying sanctuary, one resident claimed, are the principal shareholder in a gambling house, Shanghai, the funds from the licensing of which were used by the Japanese gendarmerie. This man was a close associate of the notorious Wu Espao, leader of the Gestapo. A man who was formerly a coolie employed by a tobacco factory and who, through the influence of Japanese gendarmerie, amassed such a fortune that he was able in the spring of 1943 to purchase an aeroplane which was presented to the Japanese forces. The writer, who described himself as an ex internee had personally encountered these men but the list is very long. Why were they allowed to live in safety and luxury, occupying the best houses and, in many cases, well established in business financed with the proceeds of their collaboration, 58 another resident, who described himself as a Chinese refugee, wrote that the leading collaborators, friends of Isagai, Tojo, Noma, and Tanaka are still important and great men of the Kuomintang 59. There were curious connections between some of the Chinese and Japanese. A Japanese man known as Hiroka had been in Hong Kong for some years previous to the Pacific War and was the owner of properties in Causeway Bay and Kowloon, among others. These were found upon inspection in 1946 to be partly occupied by employees of the Wing Fat Printing Co., which was also partly owned by Hiroka. Now he was interned in Kowloon and this company was being run by some Chinese, who were apparently his business partners. Point 60 This was not an isolated example. A secret report detailed that the Ying King restaurant in Wan Chai, Hong Kong was being run on the basis of 50-50 partnership with Japanese capital, and local Chinese, the former included some other Japanese naval people who were in Hong Kong during the war. The manager was Mr. Chang 61 intriguingly, later the police reported on an August 1948 meeting of five hours duration at this restaurant with 120 people present, representing 74 guilds of the General Labor Union 62. Chen Yuhao and Dennis Victor vainly sought to bring the subject of collaboration to the attention of Governor Mark Young. Those who made good as the Mikado supporters, they asserted, accumulated ill-gotten fortunes. The collaborators were now safe, while internees, ex-political prisoners and other loyal subjects were suffering. They demanded that the collaborators should be stripped of their wealth. There were many purchases of houses. In anticipation of an Axis victory. Many buyers of land in the occupation days are trying to influence the former sellers to sign the deeds a second time, alleging that Hong Kong's authorities shall defend enemy rights if the sellers or vendors refuse to adhere to the Mikado's adherence demand. They demanded a confiscatory 90% tax on occupation land deals which would also solve the problem of the budget deficit. 
they also wanted thorough investigations into the sources of income of those who bought land under the enemy occupation. 63 Separately, Victor complained of collaborators who purchased homes, concubines, and automobiles with ill-gotten gains of the occupation days 64 Although the Attorney General was understanding, he averred that it was impracticable here as elsewhere to attain the ideal of redistribution and removal of inequity wouldn't that be akin to the new enemy, communism. That remedy would merely create a problem within a problem 65. However, some people were not satisfied. T.K. Cheng objected strenuously to the fact that 5,000 buyers of land under the occupation had their purchases legalized after the war. Although those who professed loyalty to the crown could not engage in commerce, the actions of collaborators were ratified to their benefit. Was this just? He asked. Point 66 A self-professed lawman raised pointed questions about those Chinese who have had accumulated a worldly treasure in free China during Japanese occupation by way of smuggling, speculation and hoarding. Shouldn't they be pursued by prosecutors? 67. H.C. Wu had been an educationist in Hong Kong. During the Japanese occupation, he told the authorities, a great number of citizens cooperated with the enemy. Worse, during the occupation, many collaborationists who voluntarily worked for the enemy, seized the opportunity of Japanese influence and through their reckless enterprises have amassed great wealth. 68 He demanded that this property be seized and auctioned. Mr. Wu was to be disappointed. For not only would redistributing wealth raise ticklish questions about how British wealth in Asia had been accumulated in the first place, but the empire needed those who had collaborated to join them in the new battle against the Chinese Communist Party the leading voice raised against collaborators and for redistribution. How could London back the same cause as its leading opponent? Perhaps this is why the suspicious activities of CLHSU were met with a halting collective action. The Japanese occupiers would routinely loot from the British, then use this booty to enter into barter contracts with Chinese businessmen. Thus, the authorities in Hong Kong had received private information in November 1945 that Mr. HSU collaborated with the Japanese army authorities, that he could get for his iron works whatever raw materials he wanted. On our investigations Mr. CLHSU brought in a contract made with the Japanese Army authorities for Y4,880,000.00 worth of Army mess cans. Mr. HSU maintains that there was a balance of my military yen 976,000 due him at the time of the Japanese surrender, and that instead of accepting the yen he requested and obtained a certain amount of merchandise, the cost of merchandise is very much in excess of the amount due, that is, considering the black market value of the yen. It is our contention that the seizure of goods from the godowns by the Japanese was illegal, and that, as they had no title, they could not give these away in settlement of a debt. The merchandise in question has been taken into custody. 69 Mr. HSU of the Dia Ward Steel Works in Hong Kong begged to differ, of course. Point 70. London was finding that it had to contend with a newly enriched Chinese elite in claiming property that had belonged recently to the Japanese occupiers. In September 1945, days after the formal Japanese surrender on the battleship Missouri, Brigadier D. M. McDougall, newly ensconced in the Peninsula Hotel in Kowloon, had to deal with the entreaties of General Nang Bunyu of the Chinese nationalists. The latter had spent two days at the Kowloon docks where he went to inspect all Japanese articles and materials. And which they inform me are to be handed over to the Chinese national government. With customary British reticence, the brigadier noted that this was a very complicated matter. We had ourselves a very large stock of materials at the time of the Japanese occupation, much of this stock has been used by the Japanese for manufactures. Thus the mission and ourselves will have claim and counterclaim in respect of such materials. Materials which are in dispute. 71 The newly assertive Chinese wanted not only to control Hong Kong itself but they also wanted the spoils of war. This could only serve to make London's post-war role in Asia very complicated. In October 1945 the Japanese Navy turned over large quantities of weapons, military supplies and food stored on Sancho Island, 
Wanchan Island and La Tsi Wei to the Nationalists with a view to selling them in order to obtain cash 72 that same month the Nationalists seized 10 ships of the Japanese in Hainan Island, and those ships were used for transporting coal from Formosa 73. For reasons of their own 74 the defeated Japanese were keen to make sure that the Nationalists' needs were attended to. Point 75 Britain was not opposed to having Tokyo serve as its primary interlocutor in post-war Hong Kong, since neither Chiang Kai-shek nor Chinese residents in Hong Kong were about to applaud the British Liberators 76 likewise, London had no alternative but to accept the rise of the once derided Chinese on the economic ladder. With the fleeing and looting of the British, some Chinese were well placed to take advantage of the situation. When one Chinese businessman in Wan Chai Hong Kong heard that some old machinery from Japan would be coming from Tokyo as part of the reparations, he made it clear that if there is any confectionery or biscuit machinery, we should like to get it. 77 On the other hand, Chan San Ken, manager of Po Sing Shu Company, had a different complaint. He claimed that he had refused to collaborate with the occupiers and their machinery wound up in Canton after the liberation, where it was taken over by the Chinese military administration. Fundamentally, after the surrender many businesses sent a wish list of what they wanted from property that had once belonged to the Japanese. This allowed considerable room for corruption and shady practices, but it also provided a substantial bounty to certain Chinese businessmen. 78 Around the same time a large number of refinery electric motors were shipped to Canton as part of Japanese materials taken from the colony, then returned. Further, a large number of tanks were sent to an alcohol factory near Tsingtao 79. Truth be told, some British were competing with the Chinese for the booty left behind by the Japanese. Thus, in mid-1946 the colonial secretary in Hong Kong was informed that one of his colleagues was seeking information about enemy assets which may be being held by Chinese 81 LT. Donald spoke in a mysterious manner about buried Japanese gold and other assets hidden away in the colony. He was trying to squeeze money out of Japanese in Macau by underhand methods on behalf of the British government and openly boasts of this. He is probably adopting the same methods in Hong Kong, it was said.81. The point was that with Europeans fleeing Hong Kong and Massé, Chinese businessmen were uniquely situated to take advantage of the situation. The British had not faced such a disadvantage since their original invasion in the 19th century. Even simple hawkers the quintessential small business person proliferated in the post-war environment, often peddling goods that formerly had belonged to Europeans. Yoshimitsu Abe, chief of staff of the Japanese 38th Division during the Hong Kong invasion, commented that after the occupation, Chinese refugees opened markets in Kowloon and Hong Kong but the majority of their transactions consisted of stolen goods. 82 The courts in Hong Kong felt compelled to validate this pilferage in a September 1946 ruling. Dr. Harry Talbot demanded the return of five pieces of furniture from Mrs. Lam, but his claim failed since she had purchased these items looted by the Japanese during the war, then obtained by her in September 1945 in good faith. 83 a British woman faced a similar though bigger obstacle. She had been the registered owner of a property that had been taken over by the Japanese authorities during the war and the structure was demolished. She never received any compensation and by 1948 it was being utilized by the government as part of the existing aerodrome at Kai Tak. Her chances of being compensated were quite slim. This was how some Chinese had escaped from dire poverty while some Europeans were expropriated. 84. Likewise, the Japanese were able by such means to make a quick comeback in Hong Kong, as the British turned their attention decisively on the communists. Less than two years after their surrender, the Post editorialized about Japan's revival, and the recrudescence of her old tricks of subsidies, patent stealing, deliberate imitation and ruthless undercutting. There were justifiable British objections to Japan's industrial revival, because she was such an unprincipled and dangerous competitor. 85 Thus, Japan has remained since the early post-war years the principal source of Hong Kong's imports, 
as capital has continued to flow to Tokyo in a steady stream. 86 Though Japan lost the war, white supremacy, and the constructed preference for British products that accompanied it suffered an irreversible setback. Though World War II is the blanket term used to refer to the conflagration that ended in 1945, it consisted of various conflicts throughout the planet. Germany primarily was dislodging or seeking to dislodge sovereign states. Japan was ousting for the most part or seeking to oust a semi-colonized regime in China and corrupt colonial empires. This difference, though it could not be grasped as the war raged, ironically became clear when the war ended. The leading historian of Hong Kong, G. B. Endicott, has written that this partly explains why no individual or group was prepared openly to confront the Japanese during the occupation as some French patriots did against the Germans. In Hong Kong, 31 persons appeared before the military courts up to April 30, 1946. One was sentenced to death and hanged. After the restoration of civil rule on May 1, 1946 a total of 29 suspected collaborators, including one woman, appeared before the magistrates. After May 1, 28 were found guilty, including 6 Indians, 7 Europeans, or Eurasians, and 15 Chinese, he said. 87 Meanwhile, the scholar Henry Lethbridge has observed that in France, some 30 to 40,000 collaborators were executed, often summarily at the hands of the mob. In Hong Kong a few Japanese and some Chinese underlings, informers, and torturers were lynched or manhandled, but after a few weeks things simmered down. 88. Actually, the war crimes court in Hong Kong ceased to function on March 31, 1948.89 According to the South China Morning Post, a record of 20 were sentenced to death and 90 were sentenced to prison terms. 90 In late February 1948, Hong Kong's Commissioner of Prisoners asserted that there are today 99 Japanese in custody at Stanley Prison. Five have been convicted and sentenced to death. 66 have been convicted and sentenced to imprisonment. 91 Even these numbers, paltry as they are, are useful. They can be compared with the declaration of a journalist weeks after the war, who said, I think at least 75 percent of the population of Hong Kong and the occupied zones of China should be considered as war criminals. 92 A convicted collaborator went a step further, charging that more than 95 percent of the people in Hong Kong during the occupation had to work for the Japanese for a living and I can see no reason why only 10 odd of us are to face such trials. 93 Another observer took a more qualified approach. There were many forms of collaboration, he said, those who betrayed loyalists to torture and death, those who did it for profit, and those who forced many a starving person to work for the Japanese. It was officially decided that only those in the first category should be tried. Thereby many who are still at heart pro-Japanese have escaped, to flaunt their wealth in our faces. 94 Moreover, the British had to rely on the Japanese more than they initially desired since neither Chiang Kai-shek nor Chinese residents in Hong Kong were about to applaud the liberators. As a result the British were unenthusiastic about which hunts targeting Japanese or their Chinese collaborators. 95 Consequently, some collaborators, claimed another commentator with regret, are becoming wealthy. 96. This pattern was not unique to British colonialism, nor to Hong Kong. A major collaborator in the Philippines, Claro M. Recto, was a noted nationalist and opponent of Washington after the war. 97 In fact, a mere 0.6% of the wartime leadership in the Philippines was convicted for collaboration, while 74% was never in court. There was no bloodbath in which the mob ruled at the end of the war, and there was no purge either internal or external. As in Hong Kong, a quarantine of silence has been placed around the collaboration question in the Philippines. There were immense horrors there, though according to the historian David Steinberg, many of the atrocities of the death march and the humiliations of the prison camps were perpetrated to demean Americans before Filipinos 98 Even the detentions and trials of suspected collaborators were suspicious, as they were often used as a means to settle scores and exact private revenge, as was the case at times in Macau. 99 something similar was occurring in Hong Kong. 100 this was not unusual. 101. 
Moreover, those fleeing to Hong Kong from the mainland seem to be victims of score settling by their envious opponents. 102. The Hong Kong Chinese had the added burden of being represented by a government that remained highly suspicious of them. Furthermore, the procedure they had to endure to obtain redress from the government was quite discouraging. Ronald Hall, the Consul General of the United Kingdom in Canton, explicitly observed that it has been the policy of Hong government for a number of years not to afford protection in China to persons of Chinese race even when they possess British nationality, unless they have obtained, or at least applied for and failed to obtain through no fault of their own, certificates divesting them of their Chinese nationality 103 thus, Hong Kong Chinese who fled to the mainland and who often had more substantial assets than many of their new compatriots, were subjected to extortion and revenge-seeking with little hope of aid from their government. London's dilemma in dealing with collaborators was revealed further in the spring of 1945. The acting Attorney General of Hong Kong, George Strickland, was compelled to state in the spring of 1946 that we should not accede to requests for seizure of property belonging to collaborators wanted by the Chinese authorities. A fortiori, it is unlikely that it is intended that property of Hong Kong collaborators within our jurisdiction should be confiscated. 104 However nobly motivated, this measure also had the added impact of protecting collaborators from the full reach of the law. Of course, not all actual or suspected collaborators were able to escape justice or vengeance. In February 1946 the colony's first treason trial took place and the court was filled with a large crowd of spectators, some of whom were related to the defendant. Espionage and torture were among the numerous charges against George Wong, a Chinese man who spoke fluent English. 105 His lawyer, Hinching Lo, declared that Wong was not a British subject, though he was of Chinese nationality, and cited Captain Elliot's proclamation of 1841 that in Hong Kong all British subjects will enjoy British law while natives of the island of Hong Kong shall be governed according to the laws, customs and usages of China. Japanese rule, in any event, terminated the sovereignty of the king and allegiance to him. 106 Further, argued the council, the duty of allegiance is reciprocal to the duty of protection. When therefore a state is unable to protect a portion of its territory from the superior force of an enemy, it loses for the time, its claim to the allegiance of those whom it failed to protect. 107. Wang, 40 at the time of trial, was a native of Hoiping, Kwangtung, and lived for a while in North America, where he honed his English. He came to Hong Kong in 1939 and soon was operating an auto repair shop on Nathan Road. As early as December 12, 1941 a few days after the invasion he was reputedly spotted working with the Japanese. He was alleged to have said, I knew Japanese military officers six months before the attack on Hong Kong 108. The trial was a ping-pong match of charge and counter-charge. The defendant was asked pointedly, did you not say to Tony Ivanovich that this is a war between the yellow and white races? Wang replied, I can't remember. If I did, it was part of a story from the newspapers. Why did you tell a lie about your American papers and say you hated the Americans? Wong proclaimed, I told them I had returned from America, which I did not like, and to which I did not want to return. 109 The much despised Anu Yukaneo otherwise known as Slap Happy because of his penchant for punching internees also came to testify. You said, I hate you whites because in Canada I was called a yellow-bellied, Slit-eyed bastard. I never said that, Wang declared hotly. 110. Wang's lawyer moved to quash the indictment against him. Not being a British subject, the Treason Act of 1351 sick did not apply to him. And he was acting as some sort of Chinese agent. Wang acknowledged that my counsel submitted that during occupation Chinese inhabitants owed no allegiance to the British, but that is not my view. During occupation, my view was that Chinese should be loyal to the Chinese government. I owe loyalty to China as a Chinese. I had been in China military service. What I did? I did for China and her allies. But other witnesses disagreed that Wang was a simple Chinese patriot. No, said one witness, 
he always boasted about Jap Sik invincibility. Another testified that Wang said Jap Sik wanted a group of Australian born Chinese or people who know Australia well to go there with Jap Sik invaders. Grace Lau testified that Wang came to her house for interrogation accompanied by a Eurasian. Wang, she said, explained that his scheme was to get a group to guide the Japanese to invade Australia, adding that the best qualification was to be Australian born. Wang was disbelieved. He was convicted, received a sentence of death, and was executed. Soon his tearful spouse, Yok Shim, was reduced to inquire whether you could allow me to bury my husband's dead body myself. 111 This was the first time in the history of a colony that a traitor has been hung here, reported the Post. That he was Chinese and something of a second-class subject was not lost on many. 112 Sui Kwok-ching met a similar fate. Prior to the war he was a clerk at Taiku Sugar Refinery and a sergeant in the police reserve. He was not a British subject but had been resident in the colony 22 years. He was said to have been involved in torture, M. A. Da Silva accused him of having burned him with a hot poker 113 So Lung, a former member of the police force in Hong Kong, was accused of torture as well. He too was not a British subject but had lived in the colony since he was 16 years old. This traffic constable was said to have used a bamboo whip against De Silva and to have applied the gruesome flying aeroplane torture. A number of Chinese petitioned the government stating that he had no real intention to assist the Japanese. He rendered invaluable assistance by protecting both our property and ourselves from the Japanese. So Lung said that he was told by the British authorities to continue working under Japanese rule and he simply followed their instructions, he claimed to have aided the Allies by aiding the Chinese guerrillas. No matter. He was tried and convicted of high treason and was executed. 114 He was hung at Stanley. 115. Some of the most despised and reviled collaborators were those of Asian descent like George Wong who had spent time in North America. In Uyukaneo 116 the infamous Slap Happy or Kamloops Kid, born in 1916 in Western Canada, exemplified this pattern. Of Japanese origin, he was sent back to his ancestral homeland in 1926. Then he returned to Canada, then came back to Japan in a round-robin trans-Pacific journey. He was conscripted for service in Manchuria in 1936, never having denounced Japanese citizenship and having retained his Japanese passport. 117. Kamloops, British Columbia, was not exactly a comfortable sanctuary for those of Japanese origin, which may explain his frequent jaunts across the Pacific. There was an active anti-Mongolian association there that tried to bar Asian and Japanese immigrants. Normally government refused to employ Asians. When exceptions arose, Local observers quickly protested and the Asians lost their jobs. 118 Japanese immigrants lost the franchise in 1895 in British Columbia and after Tokyo's epical victory over Moscow in 1905, there were brutal anti-Japanese riots and widespread panic. 119. Inu argued vehemently that because he was, at all material times, a Japanese subject and had not renounced such nationality, he could not credibly be tried for high treason toward a government to which he had not pledged allegiance. Furthermore, the policies of pure European descent meant that the government had not pledged its allegiance to him. The fact remained, the government said in reply, that he, at all material times, was also a British subject. The Chief Justice of Hong Kong declared that the fact that he might be a Japanese citizen was immaterial. He came to Hong Kong as civilian and voluntarily joined the Tokyo branch of the Japanese gendarmerie and committed atrocities. He was charged with 28 overt acts of treason, mostly involving interrogations. A number of internees suggested that he punctuated his English translations with frequent beatings. 120. No, said Inuyu, whose grammar and handwriting were superior to that of many of those who were prosecuting him, I was a civilian interpreter. He confirmed that he was in the anti-espionage branch of the Japanese military, but denied that this had a nefarious significance. Moreover, he added, I was not treated as though I was in all respects a Canadian. I was not allowed to vote in BC or become a doctor or hold a government job. 
there was also racial prejudice. I was very embittered against the Canadian people. He contrasted this maltreatment with what he encountered in Japan, if Nisei have Canadian or American citizenship they are regarded with suspicion when they return to Japan but not after they register in Japan. Thus, he said, when I returned to Japan I was treated as if I had lived in Japan all my life. Still, in the murky madness that often characterized Japan, Inuyur called, I was put under water torture in Japan by the gendarmerie because I had Nisei friends who went back to America and enlisted 121. Inuyu, who earlier on admitted that he spoke English better than Japanese, had a grandfather who was a big shot in Japan. Inuyu Chotokara was a railway magnate, president of the Keio Electric Tramways of Tokyo, inventor of the Fuji spun silk, a member of parliament and a member of the House of Peers. He had an uncle, Inuyu Matsumtu, who also had a large business in Tokyo and another uncle, Kimura Tokitaro, was one of the leading lawyers in Japan. His English language fluency helped to provide him with the nickname Yankee and allowed him in the pre-war era to get a job as an interpreter in Hong Kong, followed by Singapore and Osaka, where he was discharged owing to bad health. He got a job in an import and export firm in Kobe, but later returned to Hong Kong to join his Chinese wife. He claimed that this was where he was conscripted in 1942, this statement was viewed as contradicting his earlier assertion that he was conscripted in Manchuria in 1936. 122. Slap Happy found it difficult to refute the harsh recollections of him by internees. He was a bastard, said Kenneth Baxter, a Scottish internee. 123. Lucy and Brunette of Quebec recalled sadly the time when Captain Norris of the Winnipeg Grenadiers argued with the Kamloops kid and he hit Norris in the face and punch at him in the chin. Later on, Atkinson tried to intervene and tried to stop it. Kamloops kid turned at to him and hit Atkinson on the legs. Inuyu, he concluded, was an awful chapter 124. Such contradictions were a part of the uphill climb he had in exonerating himself. Inuyu had received bad advice from counsel, which initially claimed on his behalf that he was a Canadian citizen. His effort to deny this predicate placed him in jeopardy for violating anti-treason laws, and was rejected. He pressed on, questioning the validity of a war crimes court trying a British subject. 125 But his occasional shout of long live the emperor could not have helped his cause in Hong Kong. 126. There were several problems with his prosecution. In summing up, the judge in the Supreme Court of Hong Kong noted that several members of the jury are Chinese and although you may still speak English, still it is not always easy to follow a legal argument in a language other than your own. 127 Though dismissively tossed aside, the authorities took seriously his claim that he could not be tried for treason because he was not a British citizen. As early as October 1945 a secret priority message to London inquired, can administration prosecute residents who are not British subjects but who by virtue of residence in Hong Kong prior to December 1941 enjoyed His Majesty's protection and committed serious offences, 128 This profound due process consideration was cast aside and he was convicted and sentenced into execution on August 26, 1947 by causing him to to be hanged by the neck until he is dead. 129 Such war criminals, said one. Judge belonged to a black or evil race 130. Inuyu was not the only one to be cast into this racial purgatory, nor was he the only man of Asian descent with roots in North America to be accused of collaboration. In the autumn of 1946 William L. Bryce, an army veteran from Los Angeles a survivor of the death marches of Bataan and Corregidor was stunned into disbelief while strolling down the aisle of a local Sears outlet. 131 he saw a man, Tanoya Kawakita, who thanks to Bryce's alertness, was tried for treason in 1947 in the Southern District Court of California. Kawakita was born in Calexico, California, in 1921 to Japanese parents. In 1939 he obtained a U.S. passport for a trip to Japan where he was to be educated at Meiji University. By 1943 he was employed by a Japanese firm as an interpreter and after the war he returned to the United States. He was indicted and found guilty, 
and in 1952 the U.S. Supreme Court affirmed his death sentence and a $10,000 fine. However, as Tokyo-Washington relations improved in the face of their joint struggle against Moscow, President Dwight D. Eisenhower commuted his sentence to life and, finally, in 1963 President John F. Kennedy allowed him to be deported back to Japan. Few in dusty, hot Calexico could foresee that Kawakata's life would take such twists and turns. He recalled, I engaged in football and basketball and I was assistant manager of the athletic activities during my senior year. He insisted that he was a Japanese citizen during the time in question, when he was supposedly engaging in treasonous acts, and therefore could no more be accused of being guilty of treason to the United States than he could be accused of committing treason against the Soviet Union. Yes, while in Japan he had lived with Takeo Miki, a very important person and member of parliament. But he was also a boy scout, hardly training ground for a traitor, he thought. He was so sure that he had done nothing wrong during the war that he returned to the United States. If he had done all he had been accused of doing, why would he return to Los Angeles and enroll at the University of Southern California, as he did? Would a guilty man have done this? Sure, he may have slapped a few British and Canadians, but was this treason? His lawyer, Morris Lavine, who was a tiger in the courtroom, was more direct, Your Honor, he said, all I intend to ask is whether there were Japanese Americans on the grand jury itself. If not, a case could be made for illegal bias and a tainted indictment that must be tossed out. The judge ruled that that would be immaterial and tossed out Lavigne's allegation instead. Lavigne would not yield, disclaiming immateriality, I don't think so, not from my view of it. He insisted, were there any Japanese Americans on any grand jury during a period of seven years? The judge responded that during the past seven years no person of Japanese ancestry has actually been drawn or has sat on any grand jury in this court, but he refused to rule the indictment invalid. Once again, white supremacy in this case, exclusionary policies targeting Japanese Americans was providing succor to those presumed to be pro-Tokyo. During his trial, Kawakita was also accused of being slap-happy during the war. The grand jury indictment said that he imposed de-punishment on one Thomas J. O'Connor. Assaulting, striking and beating him. Repeatedly knocking him into the drain or cesspool. He was involved in striking and beating. Alexander Hollick with a wooden sword or club to compel him to work faster. He struck Marcus A. Rail because... He had become ill with a fever and was then and there unable to continue the work to which he had been assigned. His cruel, inhuman, and degrading punishment of Woodrow T. Schaefer included forcing him to kneel for several hours on a platform with a stick of bamboo placed on the inner side of the joints of his knees and to hold at arm's length above his head a bucket of water. Mizuato Nasato, a U.S. sergeant, born in Italy in 1904, came to the United States in 1926. He was on the Bataan Death March, then was transferred to Camp Iama. Kawakita was not a gentle soul, he thought. He picked on me more than anyone I was able to see. He would bait me and tell me how Japan is going to win the war and was very, very rough in his language. But he denied that Kawakita had mistreated him or others unduly. Marcus A. Rail disagreed sharply. He didn't know that Kawakita could speak Spanish. He discovered this the hard way after he said in Spanish in his presence, Aqui viene este cuatro ojo son of a bitch sick or here comes the four-eyed son of a bitch. I called him. Well, he slapped me in my face. Later, said Rail, he hit me over the head with a stick. Mori Rich, another pal, also had unkind things to say about Kawakata's performance. Once he told the internees that San Francisco was being bombed, and then told them we will kill all you prisoners right here anyway, whether you win the war or lose it. At his initiative prisoners were forced to punch each other as hard as they could for punishment and if some of them didn't punch so hard, why, the defendant and some of the others would go up and down the line and knock him down to the ground in the snow and beat them up. That went on for about an hour. James T. Phillips, another internee, 
recalled Kawakita saying that Japan would win the war if it took a hundred years. The defendant also contended that the Japanese were far superior to the American people and if the American army had Japanese officers, why, they could whip the world. Once Kawakita was said to have seen David Huddle chewing gum, the internee testified that he grabbed me by the shirt collar and told me to open my mouth. Well, I didn't have a chance to swallow the gum and I tried to conceal it under my tongue. And when I opened my mouth he saw the gum. He says, you lie, and he drew back he held me with his left hand by the shirt collar, and he drew back with his right and he hit me three times in the nose and just broke my nose. Johnny E. Carter alleged that on one particular night he was sitting there, and he asked me, he says, why do the Americans hate to die and the Japanese like to die? Carter offered a tepid reply and he answered me by hitting me over the head and across the back. Woodrow T. Schaefer was mortified when Kawakitan knocked a prisoner into the cesspool, then told the unfortunate soul to submerge until his head just showed, at which point the Japanese American struck the man with sticks when he refused to submerge further. The bespectacled Kawakita, who was about 5'4 and 145 pounds, sat impassively in suit and tie at the defendant's table as these damning charges were made against him. His high cheekbones and broad shoulders and slightly hunched back sat still as his fate was being decided. Interestingly, when talking to his Japanese colleagues during the war, all he ever talked about was his high school days, the pretty scenery and things like that. Miji Fujisawa had known Kawakita in California and, like him, had moved to Japan where his helpful comrade got him a job as an interpreter. But Fujisawa was no help at the trial and one can imagine Kawakita sinking deeper into his chair as his fellow interpreter said, I heard from other Japanese employees that Kawakita was mistreating prisoners of war. Kawakita may have slumped even further when Fujisawa said that he saw his erstwhile colleague carrying a wooden sword. About two and a half feet a visible symbol of Imperial Japan around the camp. Yes, agreed Merle Chandler it was built like a Japanese officer's sword. Kawakita was doomed. The judge was harsh, noting the zeal with which the defendant practiced his treachery in many ways, but perhaps most eloquently by his nicknames efficiency expert and empire builder given him by the American prisoners of war. He fervently wished Japan would win the war, hoped and believed she would win, but feared she would not. If Japan won, he planned to return to the United States and as he boasted to American prisoners of war be a big shot because of his knowledge of the language and the people. His brutal slave driving tactics were also denounced. 132 Kawakita was duly convicted and some of the denizens of Los Angeles drew the inappropriate lesson that they were justified in interning Japanese Americans, while others drew the appropriate conclusion that perhaps the kind of white supremacy that had driven an outwardly normal North American into the arms of a U.S. foe should be reconsidered. The problem was that Kawakita was not the sole Japanese American to cross the line or, at least, to be accused of crossing the line. Eva Toguri was born on the 4th of July in 1916 in Watts, Los Angeles, and graduated from UCLA. She voted for the Republican Wendell Wilkie in 1940, then found herself trapped in wartime Tokyo shortly thereafter. Matters were complicated by the fact that she was not fluent in Japanese. Yet on skimpy evidence she was accused of being the notorious Tokyo Rose, whose seductively appealing radio broadcasts from Japan were intended to demoralize the U.S. populace, including soldiers. Although there were no fewer than 27 Japanese-American radio girls, she was unlucky enough to have her fate sealed by an all-white jury. 133. Then there was Isamu Ishira, a 36-year-old interpreter for Japan, toiling at a POW camp of 1200 in China. Educated in Hawaii, he was charged with administering the water and electric treatment torture. Beatings. Underfeeding prisoners and stealing their food and cigarettes. 134 He did not escape condemnation. Nor did yet another interpreter, identified simply as Takemoto. A resident of Hong Kong before the war, he had served as the proprietor of the curio shop, Neko and Co., in the Hong Kong Hotel 135. Nimurai Genikairo, 53, was also a civilian interpreter. 
he was on the ill-fated Lisbon Maru the only Japanese on board who could speak English and was said to have ordered sentries to fire into the holds of the ship, killing Allied soldiers. He had become a Christian at Cornell College in Mount Vernon, Iowa, and had spent various periods in New York, Connecticut and Iowa. He spent 18 years in Dayton, Ohio, where he first worked in an amusement park, learned the trade and later became manager. He denied using the term bastard as was charged to describe internees, no, he used the less elegant son of a bitch, a distinction which failed to impress those who were trying him. 136. Given the magnetic appeal of Subhas Chandra Bose and the Indian National Army, Indians in Hong Kong came under heavy scrutiny after the war and were thought to be prime candidates for treason trials. Although not as many were placed in the dock as first suspected. One defendant ensnared was Wadmul Shatilani. He arrived in Hong Kong on November 27, 1941 on a business trip from Kobe, Japan. He said, I am an importer and exporter and provision dealer in Kobe since 1925, who had got caught in the war and was unable to return to Japan. Being Indian, he said, I stayed in the Sikh temple and started a business in Hong Kong and was forced to work on behalf of the occupiers as an interpreter and translator, allegedly under dire duress. He continued to carry a British passport and was charged with aiding the enemy. 137. The 61 year old Shatilani, a native of Hyderabad and Sindh in the Indian subcontinent, spoke fluent Japanese. One witness testified that Shatilani said he was neither British nor Indian but held Japanese paper. He told me he had a Japanese wife and showed me a picture of his daughter dressed in a kimono. 138 His fate was sealed, as was that of his countryman, Fakir Mohammed Arkali, who too was charged with aiding the enemy. He too was multilingual, speaking Japanese, English, and Chinese not to mention several Indian languages. 139 This 41-year-old journalist received a three-year sentence. 140 Others were punished as well. Mohammed Yusuf Shah, for example, had been with the Hong Kong police since 1935 but was arrested in September 1945 for high treason, for which he received seven years of hard labor. 141 the Hong Kong police force had incorporated numerous Indians on the well-worn colonial principle that indigenous people should not be employed in such sensitive positions. But this principle proved faulty when the enchanting allure of the Indian National Army captivated so many Indians, which led to a belated post-war purge and the hiring of more Chinese. 142 But Indian cops from Hong Kong were not the only ones drawn to the INA. A number of Indian merchants were arrested in Hong Kong by Allied occupation forces. At least five were arrested for collaboration, one of them a special political detective for the Japanese Gendarmerie 143 but the numbers detained and those actually imprisoned were comparatively small, not least because India itself was undergoing a difficult independence struggle and London was reluctant to alienate this large nation further. Those seen as traitors in Manchester for example, the Aina were viewed as heroes in Calcutta. Thus, though many of them were purged from the police, the authorities proceeded cautiously in reigning in a community widely thought to have engaged in mass sedition. As the first anniversary of the surrender approached, the Indian community was asked to register, but as far as the colony solicitor could ascertain this rule applied to no other section of the colony an indicator of the suspicion with which they were viewed. Though acknowledging that race, religion, and caste, here as in India draw out hard and violent feelings, what was causing the solicitor great anxiety was something else. Indians who had collaborated with the Japanese were given contracts or employment with the government or free passages out of the colony while a very large body of Indians, and Malays who have always been regarded for practical purposes as members of the Indian community through intermarriage, social intercourse, etc., who had remained loyal and more than loyal during the period have been usually overlooked on the question of obtaining fitting employment 144. An exception to the simple story of white supremacy was the obvious pro-Tokyo tilt of the white or anti-communist Russians. Throughout Japanese-occupied Asia they earned a well-merited reputation for their slavish adherence to Japanese dictates. Hong Kong was no exception. On the other hand, 
their treatment in post-war Hong Kong underscored the continued viability of the doctrine of white supremacy in that although they drove cars and exhibited other signs of affluence, they did not attract British scrutiny unlike Chinese collaborators, for example. Some complained about how these Russians made various degrees of fortunes in gold bars, Duras notes, etc. during the war and were now living in ease in Hong Kong. But such complaints were infrequent. 145. There were also some Irish collaborators, many of whom had legitimate grievances about British rule in their homeland and others who felt they were not receiving their full due from white supremacy. Among this group was Frank Henry Johnston. He was a radio broadcaster for Tokyo Occupation Forces in China. His life had been one mishap after another prior to that time. He was convicted of stealing while living in Florida and later stole jewelry from the actress, Dolores Del Rio. He was deported to Ireland but somehow slipped back into the country. Convicted again of robbery, this time he shipped out as a seaman to Asia. 146 He was sentenced to 10 years imprisonment in 1947 for aiding the enemy. Born in Shanghai in 1905, his odyssey also suggested that, even after the war, white supremacy had not been extirpated altogether. When he asked to be repatriated to the United Kingdom from Shanghai, the Chinese authorities stated that the Chinese prison was unsuitable for the housing of Europeans and that the diet was strictly Chinese and likewise unsuitable for him. 147 Of course, Chinese prisoners were not so blessed. There was also W.J. Carroll, a British subject of Irish parentage, who was placed on trial in part according to a secret message in view of public reaction if prosecution for treason continues only of Chinese and Indians and none of non-Asiatic British subjects, though it was unclear whether he was of pure European descent 148 Carroll was hard to ignore. He had acted as a broker for the Japanese, buying chemicals and metals, and later was in charge of the Kowloon branch of a Japanese firm which acted as buying agents for the Japanese Navy. He was educated at St. Joseph's College between 1927 and 1930 in Hong Kong. 149 The much despised Carroll was accused of being part Japanese, which he denied hotly. It was an allegation which I very much resent. I have documentary proof of my parentage. My mother was born in Santiago, Cuba. 150 Despite his prominent role during the occupation, he also received a relatively minor sentence upon conviction a six-month prison term. But his lawyer argued that this former president of a sharebrokers association was finished so far as Hong Kong, so far as the Far East is concerned. His case is different from that of the average lower-class Chinese or Indian who may have been convicted because of collaboration because, in either of these cases, the man may lose his identity and successfully conceal his record in the teeming millions of China or India. According to the lawyer, collaboration was not the mortal sin for Chinese or Indians that it was for one of European heritage. 151. The much censured Major Cecil Boon was also a collaborator. This former POW in Hong Kong quickly made a separate peace with his captors and soon adopted the Japanese custom of wearing his hair cut short and he also wore his shirt outside his trousers in the Japanese style. He also forced his group commander to speak to him in Japanese 152 speculation about racial discrimination in the prosecutions of collaborators grew when he was found not guilty on all charges. 153. C.M. Fower editor of the pro-Tokyo Hong Kong News during the war, was said to be cut from the same cloth as Boone. A former Royal Navy commander, he had commanded a gunboat in Canton in 1930. When Chinese mobs attacked a European settlement, he opened up on the crowds, an act for which he was dismissed. He became violently anti-establishment as a result, though not necessarily anti-British. He was something of an outcast from conventional society and had few friends. Back in Hong Kong he went native, residing in a low-class Chinese slum. He was also thought to have moved to the left politically, which makes his alliance with the racial appeals of Japan all the more striking. A former internee noted that most could not forgive his rabid communism or that militancy with which he had advised the Chinese trade guilds before the war. He was regarded as a traitor to his class, if not to this country and his race. Perhaps he thought that given white supremacy, 
it was inevitable that Tokyo would prevail. Point 154 John David Provo of the United States was an American who was also said to be Japanese hearted. He spoke Japanese fluently and taught the language in Japan before the war. He too came under legal fire. Point 155. Then there were the much despised Eurasians, who contributed their share to Tokyo's war effort and were punished afterward. D.W. Luke, a Eurasian clerk was said to be the first government servant to offer his services to the Japanese. One of these people of mixed race was said to be William Chang, alias Khan Mohammed, a half-bred Chinese Negro who claims himself to be an Indian. And Frank Lee, alias Lesson, who was employed by the Texaco Oil Co. before the war was said to be a Negro 156. Another in the list was a traditionally defined Eurasian, Joseph James Richards, who was tried for high treason. Before the war he worked for the Japanese consulate as an informer, then for the Hong Kong News the pro-Tokyo sheet during the occupation. Apparently his mother was Japanese, for his father was a British consul. In spite of that fact he received very little consideration, whereas on the other hand the Jap sick appreciated his services 157. Days after the surrender, the authorities put forward a secret and unanimous recommendation that Sir Robert Kotewal be detained and brought to trial this being the only way in which to convict or clear him satisfactorily in the eyes of the world 158 however, his activities and connections past and present were far too significant for such a powerful personage to be derailed easily. During the famous 1925 strike in Hong Kong he was employing bands of men recruited from the underworld to beat strikers. After a time this new force got out of hand and went over to the Triad Society. Apparently Sir Robert also had connections to a 1937 Japanese venture which involved sending an agent Lam Kin Yan, a Formosan, to organize from the Triad Society a fifth column cell which distinguished itself after the Japanese declared war by its overt help to the enemy 159 but Sir Robert was a fish too big and dangerous to land and the immediate post-war surge against the communists ruled out the possibility that he would be successfully prosecuted. The major war crimes trials were not held in Hong Kong but in Tokyo and they were very different from their counterparts in Europe. For as Yukiko Koshiro has put it, the Tokyo war crimes trial was marked by Eurocentrism in its legal ideas, its personnel, its historical thinking and, as some observers have commented, by its racism 160 the statement, particularly the reference to racism, is not as provocative as it may initially seem. B.V.A. Rowling of the Netherlands was one of the 11 judges at this important trial. He has declared that while racial discrimination may have been one of the roots of the Pacific War, this could hardly be said about German and Italian aggression in Europe. The Holocaust notwithstanding, Tokyo had more judges than Nuremberg 11 instead of 4, and we had 28 defendants, 5 more than at Nuremberg. This was not the only major distinction he drew between the two post-war trials. Nobody wanted to defend Hitler. That was impossible. You can't defend the man who was behind the genocide of the Jews and Gypsies. It was quite different in Japan. The Japanese defended the action of Japan in this Asian land and in the world, to liberate Asia and to change the world. And they had a case, in this respect. The Tokyo trial was far more difficult and complicated than the Nuremberg one. Nuremberg was a clear case of aggression to dominate the European continent. Judge Rowling viewed a number of Japanese leaders, including the foreign minister, in a surprisingly sympathetic light, arguing that less than a quarter of a century later, the UN was doing precisely that which had earned Hirota the death sentence, that is, aggressively confronting colonialism. Washington, he thought, took Tokyo more seriously than Nuremberg. Secretary of War Henry Stimson was afraid that the verdicts of the former would be applicable to the mistreatment of blacks in the United States. I do not entirely agree with Judge Rawlings' biting opinions. But it is striking that his ideas were shared, to a degree, by those of the sole Indian judge who, said Judge Rawling, really resented colonial relations. He had a strong feeling about what Europe did in Asia, conquering it a couple of hundred years ago. This war of Japan to liberate Asia from the Europeans, the slogan, Asia for the Asians, really struck a chord with him. 
he had even been involved with the Indian army that fought with the Japanese against the British. Whenever this Indian judge, Rathbanod Pal, appeared in court, he unfailingly bowed to the defendants, whom he regarded as men who had initiated the liberation of Asia, although reportedly upward of 20 million Asians perished in this brutal conflict. 161. What is so dastardly about white supremacy is that it has caused some to overlook Tokyo's depredations and prompted certain Japanese to justify their war making. Reportedly, after the war Emperor Hirohito called attention to racial tensions in the background to the Pacific War. He began by noting that the great powers had rejected Japan's call for racial equality, advocated by our representatives at the peace conference following World War I everywhere in the world discrimination between yellow and white remained, as in the rejection of immigration to California and the whites-only policy in Australia. These were sufficient grounds for the indignation of the Japanese people. 162. Even before the war ended, the colonial authorities were moving to eliminate the more egregious aspects of white supremacy in Hong Kong. Indeed, during the war a secret draft, prepared in the colonial office, stated that there should be no discrimination, statutory or otherwise, on racial grounds in post-war Hong Kong, every public servant should be required to qualify in Cantonese. By November 1945 Chinese were occupying judicial and executive posts with responsibilities unknown before the War 163 after the chastening experience of Japanese occupation, a new sense of egalitarianism was in the air. In London, the Secretary of State for the Colonies announced that the age of racial discrimination was over. In Hong Kong, the governor, proclaiming an end to inequality, repealed laws such as the one forbidding Chinese to live on the peak. 164. It would be naive, however, to think that this racial reversal came easily or without contradiction. In Singapore, which was not atypical within the empire, discrimination in employment in the colonial and civil service continued as standard after the war, the only difference being that color was no longer specified in the rules, it was just noted at the interview. After the war, colonialism was no longer justified on the basis of race. Instead, paternalism became the rationale, that is, the supposed economic and practical dependence of the colonies. 165 Despite such subtle shifts, important economic consequences followed from the changes that occurred in Hong Kong. 166 These seismic changes were part of a larger development in the Pacific Basin in fact, globally. In Canada, the home of the much-scorned Kamloops kid, things began to change at the end of the Second World War. Anti-Chinese discrimination receded perceptibly. 167 The same happened in the United States. There, World War II brought about the first cracks in the wall of Asian exclusion. Japan had been successfully exploiting Asian exclusion in its wartime propaganda, and Congress felt compelled to respond to the charges that it was discriminating against the citizens of an ally. Congress responded. For the first time it allowed Chinese to naturalize and become American citizens, it also struck from the books most of the Chinese exclusion laws. In the summer of 1946 Congress also extended naturalization rights to Filipinos and Indians 168 Chinese who had been derided as Jap sick earlier in the century, were now being courted, almost desperately. A retired Navy officer told a congressional committee that the Chinese exclusion law was worth 20 divisions to the Japanese army during the war. A congressman declared that the Chinese exclusion law had to be repealed for the salvation of the white race. If this did not occur, he said, then all of Asia is apt to go with Japan. Then you will have a race struggle in which we are hopelessly outnumbered that will last, not for L year or five years, but throughout generations to come. 169. That was not the only retreat 170 by the major powers. 171 On November 10, 1943, the empire began to retreat from its noxious policy of the opium trade. 172 Of course, the British did not execute a complete 180 degree reversal. 
when the ship Windrush arrived in the United Kingdom in June 1948 bearing 492 Jamaicans the first in a major post-war influx they were not welcomed as representatives of a colony that had stood by the empire during its most trying moments. Even the Labour Party correspondent saw in this influx the hidden hand of Uncle Joe Stalin. Do you think, he confided. This sudden influx of 400 West Indians is a subtle move of Russia to create for us in another 20 years time a color question here. 173 This was consistent with pre-war policy when a Tory MP for Tottenham suggested that German Jews were better off in concentration camps than they were in Britain. In the 1930s immigration officers were sending Jews back to Germany 174. Australia was little better. Jean Gittens, a Eurasian from Hong Kong, who migrated to Australia after the war, quickly observed a phobia toward the Chinese. This was reflected in the notorious witticism that two Wangs do not make a white. She was asked by an immigration officer if she were Chinese. 50% was her reply. He responded, can you make it a little less? She refused and complications ensued. It seemed that a person's looks were all that mattered, she sighed. 175. These were simple signs of what was to come in the tottering, though still viable empire. In July 1945, even before the war had concluded, Lindsay Wright of the Hong Kong resistance told the colonial office in a personal and confidential message that he had copies of an application for a soon-to-be-opened post-war position, but I note, he admonished, there is a clause about European parentage. The increasingly sensitive Wright inquired gently, is this meant to debar Chinese? We have one or two excellent Chinese officers whom I think you should take. Especially. Francis Lee. He was my secretary in HKU. 176. Other reforms were easier to accept in that they did not necessarily challenge the preeminence of those of pure European descent. Thus, in 1946 a colonial bureaucrat advocated more radio broadcasts to the Chinese in Hong and more libraries too, since it cannot be said that the Chinese are not fond of reading. It is necessary, he said to establish at least one good library in Hong Kong and one in Kowloon with a traveling library book service to all districts of the new territories. Drawing on his previous colonial experience elsewhere, he added that such a system has been carried out with great success in northern Nigeria, Trinidad, Jamaica, and elsewhere 177. Setting up more libraries in Hong Kong was actually part of a self-described process of dissemination of propaganda that it was very largely a continuation of the psychological warfare unit shows how the war continued to resonate even after the cannons were stilled. There were to be British Council releases in the newspapers and Chinese magazines. The intention was not to indulge in a storybook secret service but having somebody who is able to walk around talking to the Chinese, listening to them and generally speaking, to ascertain their point of view on current matters. This was viewed as critical when the concept of colonialism itself was under siege. Staff salaries should be drastically revised and increased, especially for the all-important translators, without which the colonists would be deaf and dumb. Perhaps not surprisingly, the European papers welcomed the new initiative while the Chinese press was slightly suspicious 178. Chinese skepticism about British intentions was foremost in the minds of those seeking to reconstitute the defense forces of Hong Kong after the war. The question of who should be allowed into this force was a leading agenda item in a late December 1946 meeting. It was agreed that five main communities had to be taken into consideration. British, excluding Scottish. Scottish. Portuguese. Eurasians. Chinese. There were two diametrically opposed viewpoints on this subject, some members of the committee holding that the core should be entirely mixed without regard to race and others being of the opinion that it would be preferable to maintain the racial units as in the old core. Such meetings were held throughout the empire. The choice was simple, should the policies of pure European descent and segregation that had led to the occupation prevail, or should another course be pursued? It was decided to do some of both. 
the committee finally agreed that the most satisfactory solution would be to have all the technical personnel, headquarter staff, and armored car squadrons completely mixed without regard to race. The two rifle companies would, however, be divided into British, Scottish, Portuguese, Eurasian, and Chinese platoons. This arrangement would eliminate any criticism on the score of racial discrimination and at the same time satisfy the undoubted demand for some continuation of the tradition of the racial units of the old corps, though on a considerably diminished role. Naturally, there were no Chinese who formed a mere 95% or more of the population at this meeting. Point 179. These tentative steps toward equality, halting in nature, were not welcomed warmly by many Europeans. By early 1948 the Council of European Civil Servants expressed a vague resentment that lower paid, especially Chinese, workers have received proportionately higher gains in salary. 180 European officers were also concerned about more mundane matters, such as the desegregation of toilets. Formerly the lavatory accommodation for European officers. Consisted of accommodation at the north end of the ground floor. Since the reoccupation the former place has been used by Chinese staff. Although the entrance door is clearly marked for officers only, complaints have been received from European officers that they cannot always gain access to this accommodation as Chinese staff. Including AMA's maids, always seem to be using the place. The director of public works instructed his subordinates to instruct non-European staff that they are required to refrain from using this lavatory 181 in other words, segregation that before the war would have been justified on racial grounds was now rationalized on class grounds, that is, by job category. Race had been near the center of the construction of the empire, for reasons major and minor, and its surgical removal was not easy. Creech Jones writing from Downing Street in London in early 1947, noted that the United Nations was taking up the race question. But this external pressure could only accomplish so much and no more. I am far from suggesting, he said, that all discriminatory legislation can be immediately swept away in colonial territories. Some may be required in the interests of the local or non-European races. Some may be incapable on broad political grounds of any immediate change. 182. Nine years later, the matter was still being debated. In Hong Kong there was still some racial differentiation in the prison. Apparently the Matilda Hospital, or a part of it, was reserved for Europeans. 183 Dr. Clifford Matthews, a Eurasian who fought to defend Hong Kong in the face of the Japanese invasion and was interned for his troubles, continued to be turned away from Matilda Hospital. As we are Eurasian. They told us, at the time, that was only for the British. I found it humiliated me. You could not go into the Hong Kong Cricket Club for a while too after the war, though that did change. 184 in 1956, Dan Waters found that even today mixed marriages can raise eyebrows in Hong Kong. His Chinese wife, as a young girl on leaving college in 1956 was unable to join the Hong Kong Bank as a secretary, because it only employed Chinese as janitors 185. However, Hong Kong was more progressive than other parts of the empire. In Africa, of course, racial discrimination was a given and was a cause for war in Kenya. In non-African colonial territories, the situation was little better. The Native Administration Ordinance of North Borneo gave power to impose collective punishment on the inhabitants of native villages which harbor criminals. In the Gilbert and Ellis Islands regulations make it an offense in an ocean island for a non-European employee to be absent from his quarters at night or to be found in a European settlement or a native village at night without a permit. Laws dealing with trade unions were completely free from any kind of racial differentiation with the possible exception of Singapore and the Federation of Malaysia 186 The Pacific War had weakened white supremacy within the empire, now evolving into a commonwealth, but it had not eliminated it. Epilogue Hong Kong, with a phenomenally high level of concentrated wealth, remained a colony until 1997. This was partly the result of circumstances, the nationalists, mired in corruption and infighting, could not mount an effective challenge to London, while the communists, 
intermittently viewed as a prime foe by Washington, could not do so either. Point one. But more than a half century after the conclusion of the Pacific War, Hong Kong continues to wrestle not always successfully with the empire's legacy, white supremacy. This was not the only form of bias that had to be confronted. In mid-1946 the Chinese Civil Servants Club filed a petition for back pay, which the British viewed with disfavor. The civil servants argued that those who escaped to free China fared even worse than those who had stayed in Hong Kong, not least because people in the interior of China had a prejudice against Hong Kong refugees, especially Hong Kong civil servants. Optimistically they concluded prematurely, as it turns out that racial discrimination having happily been part of and parcel of the past, they were certain that London would comply with their modest request. This petition foreshadowed an ongoing rift between Hong Kong and mainland China that continued after the city's reversion to Beijing. The mainland Chinese may have been suspicious about civil servants precisely because they had worked on behalf of the colonial regime. Point two. Ironically, the courts the presumed bellwether of justice were among the worst transgressors of the norms of equality. The Chinese have been systematically and pervasively discriminated against during the post-war era. While their British peers were hired on expatriate terms and given generous allowances for housing and plane fares for home leave, Chinese jurists were treated to far less desirable terms and conditions. Point three. This may explain why Edward Lau has found that more non-Chinese offenders were escaping punishment by the criminal justice system. Asked one commentator cautiously, would it not be because some of the non-Chinese offenders, in particular the whites, were more powerful and influential than most Chinese offenders? Lau's study grew out of the persisting suspicion about the strange makeup of Hong Kong's judiciary a one-sided domination of non-Chinese judges over a Chinese society for strange indeed. Barristers qualified from England, Northern Ireland, and Scotland gain admission as a barrister in Hong Kong more easily than barristers from other Commonwealth jurisdictions. But the government consistently has taken the view that racial discrimination is not a significant issue in Hong Kong 5. This mantra was repeated over the years, as if repetition would make it true. Thus, in mid-1998, Peter Lo Yat FAI, acting secretary for Home Affairs, asserted that Hong Kong does not have the historical background for laws against racial discrimination. This was after an investigation by the South China Morning Post revealed that many nightclubs operate a color code, charging Indians and Chinese customers for admissions while allowing white people to enter free of charge 6. Early in 2000, Deputy Secretary for Home Affairs Leo Kwan Wingwa concurred with the viewpoint that such corrosive prejudices did not merit government action, legislation is not the cure for everything, he claimed. Punishment may polarize the society. Yet, according to Anna Wu Hongyuk of the Equal Opportunities Commission, EOC, compared with legislation on discrimination on grounds of gender, family status, and disability, there is no well-defined mechanism according to which a victim of racial discrimination can complain. 7. That is, in Hong Kong it is illegal to discriminate on the basis of gender or disability but the territory has no laws against discrimination on the basis of race. 8. Meanwhile, English language teachers who are not White are routinely discriminated against when they apply for jobs. The government has consistently refused to legislate against racial discrimination in the workplace and commercial establishments, which puts it in breach of a United Nations Convention 9. As of early 2000 the EOC had received 64 complaints alleging racial discrimination over the past three years, but it was powerless to act because of the absence of a law. Anna Wu Hongyuk thought this was just the tip of the iceberg. 10. Even after 1997, the Hong Kong government saw no particular problem with this. The leading global weekly of the city, the Far Eastern Economic Review, complimented the city's leader, Tung Chi Wat, for his rare display of prudence when he admitted that he was reluctant to seek a law to specifically ban racial discrimination. Laws, thought the U.S. owned publication, aren't meant to shape how people think an idea with Orwellian overtones and uncomfortable reminders of 1930s Germany. Indeed, such laws may lead to the erosion of liberty 11 popular columnist Bernard Fung agreed, but on different grounds. 
he wondered why the cry for such laws had only arisen after the main perpetrator, the colonial administration, has bolted. Filipino maids and white professionals may seek the commission's redress for grievances, real or imagined, against the Chinese, who never had such recourse when they were victims. Not once, he fumed, have the paid consciences of humanity championed the cause of the truly persecuted, and even wrongly persecuted the mainlanders. But since the intellectuals, with whom the equal opportunists are allied, wish at heart to hang the lot of them and smite their government up north, the commission keeps mum on their profound prejudice. To them, the only good Chinese is a dissident. Twelve the Citizens' Party disagreed, insisting that an anti-race bias law was needed now thirteen. However, the points raised by Fung were difficult to refute and suggested that white supremacy had mutated and taken on a new form. Those of pure European descent or Westerners as they were almost universally called, though many of them hailed from Australia and New Zealand which are east of Hong Kong disagreed sharply. Many of them were furious when the accredited advertising agents of Hong Kong, a heavily Chinese organization, in the midst of an award ceremony urged the Chinese to exorcise foreigners from the city. They mailed a kit containing a picture of a white man with a bruised face wearing a t-shirt. The obvious implication is that the Guilo has been beaten up by the Chinese 14. This symbolic annihilation was followed by a version closer to reality. In August 2001 a bouncer told a court that the Wan Chai bar he worked for charged Pakistani, Filipino and Nepali men up to $300 for entry while letting white men in for free. The testimony came after the bouncer was accused of assaulting a European man who had been allowed into the club for free while his Filipino-American friend was asked to pay. This was company policy. The defendant the bouncer said the policy of racial difference in admissions was based on the premise that white people are easier to control in these situations they listened to us and thus did not have to pay a fee, unlike Asians who presumably did not listen and caused trouble. Point 15. Finally, in November 2001 it seemed that a consensus was growing that laws against racial prejudice in Hong Kong might not be such a bad idea after all. All of the foreign chambers of commerce surveyed strongly backed a law against racial discrimination, citing it as essential for Hong Kong to achieve the government's plan of becoming Asia's world city. Adding their collective voice to this call were the Chamber of Property Consultants, the Association of Restricted License Banks and Deposit-Taking Companies, the Hong Kong Hotels Association and the Society of Hong Kong Real Estate Agents. However, the Chinese Chamber of Commerce perhaps wondering why such laws were not imposed when the British had ruled said the law was unnecessary and the Hong Kong employers of overseas domestic helpers, who were sensitive to their perceived discrimination against Filipinas, said race discrimination was not a problem in Hong Kong 16 this was no minor matter. Peter Wu, chairman of the Hong Kong Trade Development Council, announced portentously that by 2005 this former British colony will be one of the world's two most important centers for business alongside the United States 17 yet the United States had moved aggressively after the war to pass laws formally repealing white supremacist statutes and had sought tentatively to build a reality that matched its rhetoric of being a melting pot and gorgeous mosaic of various races and ethnicities. Some suspected that competing with the United States might drag Hong Kong magnetically in the same direction. This, perhaps, was the final irony, the nation that had pioneered the construction of white supremacy might now influence one of its victims to move against racial discrimination. Though Japan had been expelled from Hong Kong and the occupied territories and was said to be held in utter contempt by Asians because of its wartime role, as a new century dawned, it was found that things Japanese have become immensely popular across East Asia, especially among young people, many of whom adore Japanese music, movies, television, animation, fashion, and food. In South Korea, where anti-Tokyo sentiment was very real, Japanese culture cafes and tea houses are quickly replacing American fast food restaurants and European style coffee houses as the preferred meeting places for college students. Japanese rock and jazz bands are more popular than their Korean counterparts, and many soap operas, game shows, and television dramas are direct copies of Japanese programs. In Hong Kong, 
newsstands cannot stock enough copies of Japanese comic books and fashion magazines. Japanese TV dramas have huge followings. The number of Asians studying Japanese has increased 29% in the past five years. 18 A lineal descendant of the KMT, former Taiwanese President Li Tenghui who attended college in Japan and spoke fluent Japanese. Once shocked people by saying he felt more Japanese than Chinese while growing up. 19. As tensions between Beijing and Washington rose in 2000 to 2001, like Japanese Americans a half century earlier Chinese Americans found themselves in the bullseye. Hong Kong columnist Frank Ching took note of the case of Wen Ho Li, the Taiwanese American scientist falsely accused of passing atomic secrets to China, as evidence of a growing hysteria that was only surpassed when New York City was subjected to a terrorist bombing in September 2001. This downturn in U.S. China relations was bad news for Chinese Americans, as most Americans don't distinguish between Chinese and Americans of Chinese descent. 20 caricatures formerly reserved for wartime Japanese Americans were dusted off and smoothly and seamlessly transferred to Chinese Americans, who were portrayed as having thick glasses, buck teeth, and heavy Asian accents. 21. Questionable stereotypes were not the sole province of the United States, however. In the spring of 2001 Yoshinori Kobayashi hailed the Japanese army which the artist says, sent a shock to the eyes of white people from racist western powers who only regarded colored people as monkeys. His drawing showed Japanese soldiers thrusting their bayonets forward, next to huge guns of battleships and fighter jets, as pale men with British and US flags look on wild-eyed and frightened with perspiration flowing down their cheeks. Point 22 This cartoon was a simple reflection of the resurgence of pre-war style nationalism in today's Japan. This echo of a war that had long since passed into the pages of history was not unique. Less bellicose aspects of the impact of the Pacific War were evident in the person of Adrian Poy Clarkson, Governor General of Canada. In 1942, when she was three years old, she was in Hong Kong waiting to board a ship for evacuation to Canada, a country then legally closed to Chinese immigration. A colonial inspector skeptically eyed the family, including the future political leader, then announced loudly that they did not look like Canadians to him. 23. African Americans' infatuation with all things Japanese faded rapidly after the war. Even the Nation of Islam in its later incarnations hardly bothered to claim its Japanese connections, though it stood by its original notion of the Asiatic black man. Leonard Robert Jordan, the so-called Harlem Mikado who had stirred up such controversy with his pro-Tokyo rhetoric in the pre-war era, was released from prison in 1949, and disappeared into obscurity. 24 When the shooting stopped, few paid attention to the story of Earl Whaley, a popular orchestra leader who left Los Angeles in 1935 for Shanghai then found himself in a Japanese prison camp. This Negro musician's knowledge of Japanese and familiarity with seven Chinese dialects won him a position of interpreter 25. Yet his fascination with things Japanese survived in the person of one of the most prominent and influential black musicians of subsequent generations, John Coltrane. In fact, he was a living reminder of the Japan-India nexus that had been so central to the Pacific War. His wife recalls that he listened constantly to Japanese music. The shakuhachi and koto and some of their beautiful instruments. 26 Much of his music was based on the principles of the Indian raga, just as he was fascinated by the Indian water drum. At his home in New York, there were few records in his library, but what he had was almost all folk music from India. 27 After his premature death, the banner of Asia was waved by the rappers, the Wu-Tang Clan, whose imagery harked back to a strain of the old nation of Islam, combined with Chinese martial arts. Point 28. Of course, the impact of Asia on African Americans was not limited to those in the music business. Perhaps the most powerful African American in the corporate sector, Richard Parsons president of AOL Time Warner studied at the University of Hawaii, the region of the United States with the highest percentage of Asian Americans. There he learned a lesson that illuminates the entire epoch spanning the pro-Tokyo period among Negroes to the disappearance of this sentiment in succeeding years. 
you were sort of adopted by all the other people of color as being aligned with them in a kind of global warfare with whites, he recalled later, and you were adopted by all the whites because you were aligned with them for being from the mainland 29. Others had a different perspective. A Eurasian, Clifford Matthews, who fought in Hong Kong, later confessed that he did not feel bitterness at all toward Japan. I feel more angry against Germany for all their acts toward the Russians and Jews, he confided. I never felt bitterly towards the Japanese at all because I knew there was a real racism too among British towards them and towards Chinese. 30 John Straker, a leader at Stanley Camp and no doubt many others vehemently disagreed. Japan, he thought, had learned to run before it could walk. Undoubtedly unaware of the condescension of his words, he found a nasty and vicious period of infancy in this advanced nation, in which the spoiled child was never smacked by its western godparents, though it may yet be not too late to re-educate this erring race. In the same vein he asked, will the beaten nation grow to a vicious, incorrigible delinquent, hating always the great powers sent to chastise her, or will she, like a beaten dog, nuzzle the hand which administered the beating, 31. Such provocative comments should be read in light of the curious fact that many of those interned in Hong Kong embarked for a kind of freedom in racially divided societies in Africa or Malaya, which launched a bitter struggle against the main anti-Tokyo force, the Communists. John Fleming, a Scot and former partner in a major Hong Kong firm, had been interned at Stanley but after the war he left for South Africa where he set up a cattle ranch near East London 32 Ben Wiley, once interned in Stanley, left for Durban.33 William Anurin Jones and his spouse, Evelyn known to friends as Johnny were interned at Stanley and both died in apartheid South Africa in 1972.34 Penny Feather Evans also apparently found the charged racial dynamics of South Africa congenial, as he left internment in Hong Kong and his previous post as chief of police for this politically divided land. Major George Gray of Hong Kong retired to Kenya where, as a district commander of the police reserve, he saw action against the Mau Maus. Then it was off to South Africa for him to.35 Lance Searle, upon being freed from internment, immediately transferred to the Malayan police where he became well known for his special branch work against the communist terrorists during the emergency there 36. Those of African descent had reason to think that the rise of Japan and the Pacific War was of some consequence to them. The popular Harlem journalist R.O.I. Otley observed in 1952 that the European colonial powers inspire little hope in the hearts of black Africans, for losses in the Far East cause Europe to hold all the more tenaciously to Africa and to deal all the more arbitrarily and repressively with aspirations of blacks. 37 Hayao Murakami, a Japanese historian who fought in the Pacific War, concurred. Japan was defeated in World War II, he said, yet as a result of that war countries of Asia achieved independence, to be followed in turn by those of Africa. To say that Japan liberated those countries would be going too far, Yet without that great conflict that extended from Southeast Asia throughout the Pacific and that brought Japan down in ruin, those countries would almost certainly not have achieved independence so swiftly. The same goddess history that punished Japan and the Japanese for their presumption also commanded that the West should stop seeing itself as the sole standard bearer and arbiter of civilization. 38 Fujiwara Iwaichi, a major in Japanese intelligence during the war, added that after the war, the white man's control over Asia lasting several hundred years has collapsed and has come to an end. An unprecedented historical achievement has been realized and its impact has been spreading to the Middle East, Africa and Latin America like prairie fire. 39. The eminent British military historian, Basil Liddell Hart, did not disagree. The Pacific War notably the fall of Singapore meant that the white man had lost his ascendancy with D.I.S. proof of his magic. The realization of his vulnerability fostered and encouraged the post-war spread of Asiatic revolt against European domination or intrusion. 40 Chu Xuan Chu, the son of a planter born in Malaya in 1921, blamed London for the bias he observed. He was struck by the unfairness given to the communists during the victory parade after the surrender. They were not given enough recognition for their services during the war, he thought. 
it's always the rich people who stand to win all these wars. The winners are always the rich people. It's the middle class and the lower class who suffered the most. 41. Needless to say, many in Asia not to mention elsewhere did not recall Japan's occupation so positively, no matter what the alleged long-term beneficial consequences. After the war, the racial underpinnings of the war were downplayed and newer myths more congenial to white supremacy arose. Thus, in the prize-winning Hollywood cinematic extravaganza, Bridge on the River Kwai, Japanese officers exploded in rage because they supposedly did not have the technical knowledge to build a bridge. They were saved from their predicament by British officers who designed and built one for them, using it as training for their men to keep up their morale. But the actual railway was designed by the Japanese and built with forced indigenous and POW labor. Obviously, the Japanese were perfectly capable of building the bridges they needed. That is, Contrary to the cinematic myth designed to reinforce white supremacy, they were not technologically inferior to the British at all. This was a myth in which some Europeans and Euro-Americans no doubt found comfort after their forced retreat from white supremacy. Point 42. Like a beard that continues to grow on the face of a corpse, the defense of white supremacy continued even after it had been discredited officially. The highly popular writer Gore Vidal would probably have disagreed with declarations of white supremacy's retreat. Some years ago, he caused a stir by urging the white race to put up a sterner resistance to more than one billion grimly efficient Asiatics, that is, a defensive alliance of the white race and northern confederacy. Of Europe, Russia, Canada, the United States. 43 Personally, Instead of appeals to color I would prefer to see class-based alliances against common oppression. But the collapse of the Soviet Union seems to have almost fatally damaged this idea. Coincidentally, this has had the unintended consequence of bringing the construction of white supremacy back to the forefront, away from the shadows, as Vital's comment suggests. Much has been made of Shoiki Yakoi, the former Japanese army sergeant, who after the United States reclaimed Guam in 1944 refused to surrender and hid out in the jungle, living alone in a hole in the ground, until 1972.44 but paradoxically, it is white supremacy that continues to refuse to surrender unconditionally, although it did so formally during and after the war, and remains salient even today. As the 20th century dawned, W.E.B. Dubois stated famously that the problem of the epoch was the color line. This remains true even though a new century has arrived a century in which the utterly dangerous and poisonous prospect of race war will continue to haunt humanity as long as Dubois' ominous words ring true.